All right, folks, it's good to see everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. My name is Stephen Moss. I'm a senior program officer at the Board on Life Sciences at the National Academies. Uh, and I just wanna welcome you to the workshop that, we're, have, that we have here today. Uh, as you're aware, this is a part of a larger study related to RNA modifications. And we're really excited to get the opportunity to learn a lot more about this area building on some of the important work that's been happening uh, through the NIH, NSF, and other organizations. Um, so I'm gonna start with some introductory remarks and then I'll pretty immediately pass it off to Brenda uh, Bass, who's one of the co-chairs of the study committee who will give us some further opening remarks. Okay. There we go. Yes, housekeeping background. So to start, uh, we have a land acknowledgement related to the National Academies. We do acknowledge that the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nacotchuk, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and the nations in this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. So I wanna talk a little bit about the National Academies to start. Um, as we kind of mentioned, we have two, uh, we have, this is part of a larger activity. We do several types of activities. One is consensus studies, which is what this larger activity is a part of. Um, this is gathering groups, groups of experts to put together reports. And then we also do a lot of workshops, forums, roundtables, other types of convening activities. So today we're having a workshop to help learn, help uh, the community get together and learn more about this area, inform some of the parts of the consensus study. And so at this particular juncture, the two activities are connected. Sometimes they are separate. It all depends on um, kind of how we're operating, but uh, we're excited to kind of move forward in this area. As I've said about five times already, <laughs> we, are, uh, we are part of a larger consensus study. Um, this is just a clip from the website itself. Um, we wanna thank the Warren Alpert Foundation and the National Institutes of Health who are our sponsors of the study itself and the workshop today. We have a lot of background uh, and previous reports and workshops that have similar topic areas and have helped to feed into the study that we're doing here today. Um, the first that's uh, a, a good mention, a good thing to mention is that the National Academies came out with a report about mapping and sequencing the human genome before the Human Genome Project started. Um, and then there has of course been a ton of work uh, that's in subsequent to that. And I'm highlighting only four other, four reports here toward precision medicine, which was a big effort related to omics and understanding uh, the basic science needed to move into a realm of precision medicine. And then we had uh, a precision medicine roundtable that was formed that did a lot of workshops and other areas of uh, other areas of interest. Um, and then more, more recently, back in 2020, actually in this room, right before the pandemic started, there was a workshop on uh, next steps for functional genomics. Uh, where we talked a lot about multiomics and um, different areas that were emerging uh, funded by NSF. So I want to quickly acknowledge the study committee that is uh, putting together the consensus report, and it was also responsible for plan helping to plan this workshop, uh, chaired by Brenda Bass and Takjip or TJ Ha. Uh, we're really glad to have these folks helping us out. Um, and then I also want to thank and acknowledge the staff, the National Academy staff, who has been helping out with this project. Um, most of them are here today, and they're, uh, they've been really instrumental in making sure that everything runs smoothly as this project goes along. A couple housekeeping items. Um, we encourage you to be an active participant in today's discussion. Uh, you know, take advantage of your breaks, take advantage of question and answer. Um, we really encourage that. There's an opportunity. There's two ways to ask questions. Um, in person, there is a microphone. So uh, please, if you are interested in doing that, we encourage it. There's also Slido, which you can use on any of your devices. 
Um, this is for virtual and in-person folks. Um, the way Slido will work is that once you are logged on and you type in your question, folks will have the opportunity, folks who are moderating the Q&A panel will have the opportunity to see all the questions. If you're actively on Slido, you can actually up and down, not downvote, you can upvote questions so that popular questions come to the top and are easier to ask. Um, so I'm going to stay here for one more second while I see people using their phones <laughs> uh, to get the QR code. If you need this information, it's also in the agenda. Um, the QR code isn't in the agenda, but you should pretty easily be able to access the Slido by just going to the website and then typing in the code that's uh, available. So again, if you miss this and you want to go back to it, it's on the top of your agenda. And I'm going to go forward now. All right, more housekeeping items, technical issues. Um, my colleague Nam, who's up at the front helping with technical issues as we speak, uh, it will be uh, available. And also for those who are online, um, please email or message them. There's also other folks who can help you online. Uh, some other housekeeping comments and ideas made during the workshop should be attributed to individual speakers and not their organizations, unless otherwise stated. Uh, this includes uh, the National Academies. So um, thoughts shared during the course of the workshop should not be interpreted as the opinion of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. And I'll specify, or the committee who's putting together this study. Got to put that in there. Uh, the workshop will be recorded um, and will be posted after the workshop is complete. Um, and there will be a summary available. Oh, sorry, I forgot to take that part out, but there will be a summary available. There is no graphic recording for this workshop. I forgot to edit that. Um, harassment and bullying will not be tolerated. Please be respectful of all panelists, speakers, and fellow participants. And with that, I will pass it over to Brenda. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, Stephen and all the staff here are just wonderful and have been very helpful to us. And I, um, I'm really excited to see all of you in this room and. Uh, the people on that are attending virtually. I, I know many of you, and I know that uh, you have a lot of expertise that are going is going to be helpful to us. So uh, please uh, don't hold back. Uh, tell us what you're thinking and your opinions. So let's see. Can I? Do I have control over this somehow? Yes. Okay. I'm going to stand over here. So I'm height challenged and. Uh, like you see this what was that oh i have oh but then i might need my glasses um so uh i so i actually changed a few words in this uh first sentence on this slide and uh our uh, the committee is charged with trying to map and sequence modifications but I think that that is sort of only part of it and that the ultimate task is to develop ways to and evaluate whether this should be done to start at one end of an RNA, a single transcript, sequence the whole thing and get all of the modifications in that single transcript. We know now that we can map and sequence short regions. We can find in an ensemble of RNA where the modifications are, but that doesn't tell you who the partners are in one single transcript. So that uh, is the ultimate goal. And we need to understand, is there a scientific need for this? Uh, where are we right now? What are the current methods? What are their limitations? What are the state of the current RNA databases? Where are we going to store all this, all of this information? Information. Uh, what are the challenges related to using the outcome of such a study for scientific, clinical, and public health needs? What are the computational needs? Uh, what are the data ecosystems that we need to consider? 
What about policy related to this task? How will it affect workforce? How in the world would you set up the infrastructure to do such a huge project? And you probably, you saw on that last slide that, that some people uh, make an analogy to this project, to the Human Genome Project. And where when they first started the Human Genome Project, it uh, they had none of the techniques that now allow us to sit down at our desk and actually pull up our favorite gene and know its sequence. So someday, should we have this for RNA and its modifications? And of course, we, we envisioned that such a task would involve new technologies. So in, so this, I am not going to go through this because I have essentially said all this. So today, what you're going to, uh, uh, here, uh, we're going to start off with a talk just to set the stage. What are modifications? Where do we find them? What are some of the techniques? What are their functions? An overview talk. Um, and then we're uh, going to have during the day a panel on direct sequencing technologies, which we can there every now and then. Um, and then this development of oligonucleotide standards is, is a really, really important thing to consider. Uh, what we're talking about here are modified nucleotides in the context of a certain sequence and maybe a repository that you might put these standards so everybody can use these standards so they understand what the signal would be for example, in a direct sequencing experiment. So standards we're gonna learn about today. I, uh, we're, we're also gonna hear a little bit from people who have um, been involved in such large scale collaborations. And there's a lot of challenges uh, to getting something like this and organizing how it's gonna be done. And we're gonna try to uh, learn from some of these uh, people who have done this already. Uh, what are the what should be what what should we be really concerned about? Uh, again, should we do this? What are going to be the pitfalls if it's decide, decided to uh, if we embark on this project? So um, tomorrow we're going to have we're going to continue with some talks on uh, different RNA applications and. Uh, their impacts related to biotechnology and disease. Um, and we're, we're going to have uh, some sessions that are talking about methodologies that at currently are really not applied to finding and sequencing RNA and its modifications, but maybe they, they should be used. So we'll consider that. And I think now I turn it over to my wonderful co-chair, TJ Ha. No. Say that again. Lydia. Oh, okay. We're uh Lydia, please come up. It uh we, did we switch because that's okay. It's good to tell me these things. Is Lydia uh oh Lydia's virtual. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Brenda. And good morning, everyone. So I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Lydia Contreras. I'm a professor here at the University of Texas in Austin in chemical engineering. And uh, my lab works on regulatory RNAs, particularly in stress responses. We have been really interested in mechanisms of RNA oxidation, as well as in understanding RNA protein recognition of modified RNAs. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for our workshop, Dr. Fred Tyson. Um, so Dr. Fred Tyson has really been a true champ for this um, area in general. He is currently a program director in genes, um, the Genes Environment and Health Branch at NIH, as particularly at the Environmental Health Science Institute. His portfolio includes research, on how the environment impacts the epigenome and most recently, of course, the epitranscriptome, 
lung cancer, tobacco exposures, and electronic nicotine delivery systems. Dr. Um, Tyson leads the NIEHS target epigenomics and frame epitranscriptomics programs, and it is the POC for the diversity supplement program. He has worked on several trans NIH initiatives, including the Centers for Population Health and Health Disparities, the Road Epigenome Mapping Consortium, and currently serves on four NIH Common Fund working groups. Um, back in May of 20, uh, May 24th, end of May of last year, um, Dr. Tyson and an executive committee, along with several lead faculty in this area, put together a workshop that was entitled um, Capturing RNA Sequence and Transcript Diversity from Technology Innovation to Clinical Application. This was mostly led by the Human Genome Research Institute and, of course, the Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Um, I was fortunate to be part of this workshop, and it covered a number of topics that we have heard, some of which, which um, Brenda already alluded to. But I remember there was a lot of discussion about even defining aronomics and what does the term mean. There was a lot of discussions of applications, direct sequencing technologies, limitations, what is needed to move forward, and major themes that stick uh, still to my head were themes around the lack of standards, data management and sharing in the field, and the biological impact of RNA modifications. So even if we get to the point where we can sequence and map them, what does it mean for signal, for trafficking, for intermolecular interactions, particularly associated with proteins, et cetera? So again, welcome, uh, Dr. Tyson. Uh, thank you for being here and for all that you are already contributing to supporting research in this area. We look forward to your talk. Okay, hey, thank you for that introduction, Lydia. Um, let's see if I can move this one, put mine here. Okay, good morning, y'all, and thank you for the opportunity to give an overview of the workshop uh, preceding this one that was convened by the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National Institute on Environmental Health Sciences in May of 2022. Uh, I know that some of you that are on this committee uh, participated in that workshop, and uh, we had representation from, from leading uh, RNA uh, scientists coming from multiple sectors, including academia, government, and uh, industry that actively participated. Uh, can I get that next slide, please? Okay. So the um, workshop really had uh, four primary objectives. And that were to they they were to identify technologies that we need uh, to characterize RNAs, determine infrastructural needs, and what steps are going to be needed to uh, facilitate the rapid adoption of these technologies once they come online by the scientific community. Uh, and then we also wanted to identify how we might best um, uh, incorporate a public outreach uh, component uh, as well as workforce development in this area. Next, please. So several program and review staff members from both uh, NHGRI and NIEHS um, participated in uh, uh, multiple aspects that uh, uh, related to convening this three-day workshop, and uh, we were led by an executive committee, uh, and I want to point out that the, uh, these, the members of the executive committee were uh, Blanton Talbot, uh, Pete Dedon, Brent Gravely, and I want to especially acknowledge Vivian Chung, who is really been a mover and uh, kind of a force of nature behind and in front of the scenes and, and trying to get this, this effort uh, moving forward uh, here and in other venues. Um, let's see. So these uh, committee members uh, certainly have made uh, many uh, important contributions and continue to make important contributions to both RNA biology and, and chemistry. So I'd like to put into context why the leadership of both NHGRI and NIEHS uh, supported our workshop as well as this, this one in the uh, larger consensus report uh, uh, that was mentioned earlier. 
The NHGRI director, Dr. Eric Green, addressed aspects of the NHGRI 2020 strategic vision and how they've gone beyond these uh, those broad brushstrokes and, and have begun laying out goals for, for genome structure and function science in the following areas. First, we want to talk about uh, uh, direct sequencing. He identified a need and opportunity uh, for direct sequencing technologies as an area the NHGRI has uh, actively encouraged for almost a decade through their uh, longstanding nucleic acid sequencing technology development efforts. He also pointed out that we currently lack methods to routinely detect or, or quantify the vast majority of modifications in sequence context, or to simply determine each modification uh, while directly sequencing. Moreover, we simply uh, uh, have an incomplete understanding of the diversity of RNA. Technology, innovation, and development are needed to uh, enable full characterization and quantification of all RNAs transcribed from the genome. Now, genomics research uh, really requires physical standards, including synthetic RNA with base modifications. NHGRI has been and will continue to encourage research efforts and development of resources in this area of strong need. Now, this was the first mention of a theme that uh, uh, was continuously mentioned uh, and uh, throughout our workshop, and that was standards. So going forward, RNA analysis will uh, uh, be a component of the, of the NHGRI's multi-omic approaches to disease and risk. And at the cellular and molecular level, there's an enormous opportunity to study aspects of functional genomics. That is how elements of the genome contribute to biological processes. The NHGRI vision uh, fully embraces the importance of developing technologies and applying uh, them to comprehensive RNA sequencing and characterization. As part of what's needed to uh, uh, build a robust foundation for genomics, and in short, it would be uh, it should be routine that we consider on a genome-wide scale the diversity, fate, and function of RNA molecules, uh, including splice and transcription variants and modified bases. Now, Rick Wojcik, the uh, NIEHS director, followed up with uh, describing why the capacity to directly sequence RNA with a base modification context is critical to the field of environmental health sciences. Environmental health science investigators uh, that are supported by NIEHS are increasingly appreciating the potential impact of environmental toxicants uh, and exposures uh, that can compromise the deposition uh, recognition and removal of RNA modifications and how this may be mechanistically associated with adverse health outcomes. Uh, as a result, there's a growing number of, uh, of grants in our portfolio that we're supporting that uh, look at the impact of toxicants on epitranscriptomic processes. Back in 2018, five years ago, we were not supporting any grants in the area of epitranscriptomics. But currently, we're almost up to 35 active grants in this area. Uh, we're supporting uh, uh, R01s, R21s, R03s, and F31, as well as R35s that are looking at environmental impacts on epitranscriptomics. The NIEHS portfolio is uh, uh, looking at modifications, readers, writers, and erasers of uh, uh, epitranscriptomic marks. We're using a diversity of exposures and employing state of the art technologies to address questions about where toxicants, the epitranscriptome, and human health intersect. Being able to sequence RNA with a, a modified base context will certainly significantly advance the field. Now, I'd like to spend the, the rest of the time talking about the workshop itself. The workshop, as Lydia told us, was entitled Capturing RNA Sequence and Transcript Diversity from Technology Innovation uh, to Clinical Application. Uh, we had 298 attendees over a three-day period, and it featured uh, six scientific sessions. Uh, the keynote presentation came from uh, Anna Pyle, uh, and that really laid the foundation for the meeting in terms of uh, delivering a state of the science address. She stressed, uh, or yeah, she stressed the importance of studying the diversity of RNA sequences and modifications uh, to advance the understanding of the role of RNA in health and disease. She provided an overview uh, of the biological and technical challenges in the field, new strategies being developed, uh, important unmet needs and potential future directions that we might go in. This was then followed by five uh, 
uh, scientific sessions uh, with plenary talks, each followed by three concurrently held breakout sessions. And I'll spend the rest of the time summarizing the highlights of these sessions. I want to point out that Yen Sun Nam uh, talked about structure and biological implications. Jeannie Lee talked about uh, um, RNOmics and uh, applications with small molecules uh, as therapeutics. Manny Wanunu talked about technologies for direct sequencing. Chris Burge uh, addressed in plenary talk uh, infrastructural needs. And Brent Gravely talked about how we might um, get the community to embrace the technologies once they're online and uh, get uh, uh, more, more of them disseminated. Okay, if I can have the next slide, please. Okay. So technology development uh, really underlies many biomedical discoveries and applications and advances in RNA science will require technological innovation, development and uh, standardization. New methods and technologies are needed to for full length and direct RNA analysis to comprehensively characterize the diversity of, of transcripts. And we need to look at isoforms uh, as well as modifications in the sequence context. So how can this be accomplished? Well, we talked about investment in uh, uh, mass spectrometry uh, capabilities through modifications of uh, existing instrumentation, as well as the development of new devices that are really based on R RNA. And this is really identified as a real critical opportunity. We also discussed focused enzymatic research efforts to develop useful molecular tools that overcome rate limiting uh, analytical barriers to molecular analysis in RNA biology uh, and would be helpful with sequencing approaches. Additionally, the group uh, suggested that technology innovation and development efforts uh, uh, need to be enabled to generate long synthetic RNAs with specific modifications which would allow multiple advances in the field. Uh, this is another uh, uh, discussion of standards. Uh, and we uh, also need high throughput uh, um, uh, and subcellular methods for detecting, localizing, and analyzing interactions between RNAs, DNAs, and RNA binding proteins, as well as small molecules. We also made efforts to identify what optimal, optimal biological standards and controlled uh, centralized resources are, are most needed to advance the field. And certainly a, a gold standard of reference uh, um, Synthetic as well as cellular RNA spanning the range of known modifications will enable large scale efforts to develop and advance technologies. This would include co common sources of well characterized RNAs, both synthetic and cellular, with specific exon chains and modifications for technology development, and spike in controls that would uh, enable comparisons across approaches. The field will also benefit from a centralized resource with bank tissues, cell lines, and an exemplar virus sample for testing of new uh, modifications and methods. Participants also encourage the use of a consortium or a coordination center approach to stimulate collaborations for both wet and dry lab advances in direct RNA analysis. As we're talking about a uh, wish list or what we really need, a centralized uh, mass spec facility resource for uh, RNA sequencing and modifications uh, to assemble and calibrate work on a pilot project using direct RNA sequencing methods would also benefit the field. Okay, for opportunities and computational uh, uh, resources indicate that we need the development of a comprehensive, centralized, interoperable, standardized, and searchable RNA database that includes different RNA types uh, and both uh, for both typical and uh, disease tissue, and that would really again, uh, help significant, support significant advances. There were calls for nomenclature, file formats, pipelines, and software to be standardized, updated, and developed. The field would benefit from more efficient data processing and development of machine learning or AI-based tools, as well as uh, streamlined workflows to enable uh, RNA analysis efforts. It was also determined that the field would benefit uh, from the creation of publicly available and appropriate uh, training sets, including large data sets and those generated from in vivo uh, transcribed RNA. 
And very importantly, we talked about uh, uh, developing RNA secondary structure prediction algorithms that consider chemical modifications. There were also robust discussions uh, regarding how sequencing uh, with a modification context can advance our understanding of how uh, environmental stresses or exposures can compromise functional modified transcripts. The participants thought it important uh, in the context of identification of specific enzymes, uh, reagents or tools that can uh, induce, or excuse me, insert uh, stress-induced modifications to understand the biological impact of distinct environmental exposures. They also thought it important to develop tools uh, to study specific RNA modifications in a variety of different cell types to connect the, these uh, changes to environmentally uh, induced or associated pathologies. Development of the capacity to map temporal and spatial dynamics of RNA modifications inside a cell and tissue in relation to functional responses uh, to stress or physiological conditions would also advance this field. And uh, finally, we also talked about the development of uh, methods to interrogate the impact of stress on uh, RNA functions uh, like uh, signaling, RNA protein interactions, and trafficking. Now, outreach to the public is, is, is uh, we think, a, a needed component to in, increase our understanding of, of the importance and impact of RNA research on public health and, and medicine. And I think the uh, pandemic we're coming out of that is, is a clear illustration of uh, how uh, the public outreach uh, could inform folks better to know what we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> and outreach components uh, should be required of any um, large NIH-funded consortium and center projects addressing this. Additional funding for diversity career awards and administrative supplements uh, was uh, recommended, uh, as well as support of undergraduate and graduate level training, particularly at minority serving institutions to improve the diversity of the workforce in the next generation of scientists who will be uh, tackling these issues. The training must be interdisciplinary and uh, incorporate both virtual and hands-on instruction uh, in both wet and dry lab methods. Training uh, opportunities should be easily accessible high quality, uh, low or, or no cost, uh, with online training videos uh, on the use of technology as well as data analysis. And these would be considerable drivers in getting the community to uh, 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 adopt or embrace these technologies. Now we know that such a resource would require a home as well as a long time commitment uh, and probably resources uh, to uh, maintain and keep the uh, training modules going. But the training really should be available uh, to all professional levels. May I have the next slide, please? Okay. There are several challenges and opportunities that, that, that exist when discussing how direct sequencing can uh, uh, be directly tied to clinical applications. Many RNAs fold into structures that can be uh, uh, effectively targeted with small molecules and strategies are needed to identify them. Uh, validate and optimize small molecules that target functional structural units within the transcriptome. RNA sequence can uh, uh, predict small molecule binding sites that will allow lag inviting to the functional structural units. Existing RNA uh, targeted small molecules currently use a range of different mechanisms uh, uh, to exert their effects, and these include direct splicing with cellular proteins, inhibition uh, of translation of undruggable proteins and the deactivation of uh, functional structures in the and non-coding RNAs. Uh, so I think I'm kind of running out of time. So what I'm going to do is uh, just then go to this, this last slide, which really kind of highlights that we identified several different opportunities uh, within that workshop that can be addressed uh, as we move forward with this field. Um, if you want to see a full report, there's a website that has the full uh, meeting report. It's got a, an executive summary. There's a, there's a full agenda. There's speaker bios. Many other things uh, are, are on that report, and I encourage you to go visit that. And again, I'm, I realize I've gone over my time. I apologize for that, and thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Tyson. So I'm wondering if there are questions in the room. Hi, hey, Lydia, no questions in the room as of yet, but I'm monitoring that. But how, um, much, how much more time do we have for questions? About 10 minutes. Okay. So maybe I can ask um, someone to get us uh, something to get us started, Dr. Tyson. So when we had this workshop, um, I remember a big topic of conversation was this idea of standard. So should we be sort of consolidating the number of systems, the cell types, the types of mods? Should we be sort of constraining this problem a little bit so that we can be comparing results across labs and across different efforts? So we just wonder, I wonder if you can recap some of that and maybe some of your own thoughts there. Well, I thought that one of the things that we talked about really was if, if we are still going to support large scale efforts that we want to have some centralized types of uh, resources. I think one of the things that we know certainly from, from doing the epigenome work is uh, when you get different labs doing different things and people are using different protocols, you come up with a lot of variability that uh, hopefully if we had some centralized resources to kind of pilot some of these activities, that would reduce that type of variability. I think we need to have standardized nomenclatures uh, as well as pipelines, again, to reduce variability. And those types of things, again, are, are going to require a kind of a coordinated approach. So when you talk about standards, there, there are a number of different types of standards. We talked about standards for both you know, the uh, 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 transcripts, both long and short ones that have modifications on them. Um, standardized technologies for doing things. And I think to, to kind of be able to reduce variability and, and, and interpret results consistently, there's going to be a, a lot of calls for standardizations. I think we're going to need to kind of just define, uh, you know, what is the low hanging fruit? Where, where, where are the standards that we can more immediately uh, kind of implement over the next few years? Lydia, we have a question in the room um, from Kate Meyer. Hey, Fred. Um, I think this meeting did a great job of identifying, you know, some of the major needs in terms of standards and bioinformatics resources, training, other infrastructure needs. I wonder if you can comment a little bit on some of the new initiatives that have maybe resulted from this meeting to help support some of those goals. That's uh, could I comment on them? Uh, I can say something, but an actual comment for a record, no. Um, but there are some uh, preliminary efforts to try to see if we might be able to develop something, but we can't really, if we were actually working on an initiative, I couldn't tell you that. Um, but uh, I can tell you we are in discussions and that will have to suffice for now. Can we maybe turn off the Zoom and all the recording and then you can have- No, 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 no. <laughs> I love how, Kate, you tried. I do too, but you know. <laughs> Other questions in the room? There is one here. Uh, can you hear me, Lydia? Yes. Okay, uh, so I guess I'm uh, trying to envision, you know, if something like this project goes forward, uh, do you think about, you know, NIH's contribution, but how it might intersect with contributions from private organizations? My thoughts are how this can proceed at the um, level we've been discussing almost clearly mandates a private public partnership. I don't see how we could do it. I mean, I don't think we have the resources at NIH to uh, solely, uh, you know, support this. Um, uh, I know Vivian and I have had some conversations about what we think uh, the figure would be to actually support this as fully as we'd like to see it supported. And I can't even make my mouth form <laughs> yeah, those numbers. Good, good answer. <laughs> and then and then if you were going to think about private contributions, are there things that you think NIH would be much more suited for and that other things uh, would rely on private uh, contributions? Um, yes, I do think there are things that NIH can actually really uh, foster and 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 do, but there there are some things 
that uh, are going to require um, some resources that we're not going to have access to. As we talked about standards, for instance, when you think about um, uh, doing these standards with these modified chemical bases, there are very few places in the world that can do this. In fact, I think I can think of two, and they're not here. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to need to, to really kind of cast a broad net, net and um, identify what are the things that NIH can support, what are the things that uh, private entities can support, and, and we can't be restricted to just doing this work here in the U.S. because, again, as I was saying, in terms of these types of uh, um, standards on these uh, nucleoside bases, they just, you know, with modifications on the nucleoside bases, we don't have that capability right here, right now, but there are people that do. Thank you. So there are a number of questions also from um, in the chat, um, Fred. I'm going to read a couple of them to see um, what your thoughts are. So one that I'm really curious about is, in reflecting about the workshop, did you think it achieved what you hoped for? And if not, how else would you have restructured? What else would you have liked to learn? I think the workshop really achieved what we wanted to do. We wanted to bring together uh, uh, a, a good representation of, of uh, some of the thought leaders in RNA biology and chemistry together. We certainly didn't get everybody, but we got a lot of folks in there in the room. Uh, I think we uh, were able to identify the priorities. Um, from the slides that uh, 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 Dr. Bass put up earlier, uh, I think we covered many of those topics, um, but certainly they could be covered more exhaustively. I think maybe one of the things that we didn't do is really probably identify the low hanging fruit in terms of what can we do in the next five years. Um, you know, there are certainly, again, I think we have some direction on some things as uh, uh, Kate asked, uh, are we thinking about things? Yes, we are thinking about things. So we're, we've kind of identified some areas that we think we can begin to approach right now, but I don't think, I think, I think we did a good job of identifying priorities. I think we could do better in terms of narrowing those down in terms of what we can attack right now. Um, Fred, there's another question here that I'm also really curious about. So based on the workshop, do you envision NIH as the lead in an RNA modifications effort? If not, who should? Or if so, who can you work with? Who are the lead partners that you envision in this effort? Um, I speak without authority, um, but... I believe NIH should lead this. NIH cannot do it alone, but I believe NIH uh, should do it. Uh, I believe that, uh, and and uh, I, I, I see um, members from uh, NHGRI, so I'm not going to, well, I am going to, but I'm not going to kind of put anybody on the spot, but certainly uh, they represent a natural uh, leading place to, to get some of this started, but they can't do this alone either. And, uh, as I indicated earlier, these um, these type this type of work has great um, importance to environmental health sciences as well. So I think that uh, NIEHS is uh, also should be a lead on here. But I think all of NIH. I think you know I don't see people here from NAIAD that I if they're here I don't know them. But anyhow, uh, I think this would be something that would be of great importance to that institute as well. I think. Most NIH institutes, if not all, really should be um, uh, interested in this work because, uh, again, it, it, it will impact, I think, so much of human disease and health that uh, um, all of the NIH institutes should be partnered in this to do this. In terms of whom else, um, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to identify other partners in the private sector that probably could be engaged in this, but uh, they know who they are, and 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 I suspect many of you all know who who these folks should be, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to kind of say, well, these folks should tackle this, these folks should tackle that. Other other people probably should should uh, identify those components. So a related question, Fred: If NIH is the lead, then should RNA be incorporated into NHGRI, or should a new institute be created for these efforts? That's a great question, Lydia. Um, but um, if we look at the reality of where we are right now, uh, I don't think I don't think the, uh, a separate RNA institute would be feasible right now. Uh, certainly, I think NHGRI and 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 you can uh, 
uh, Jennifer, you can you could certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they've already integrated this into their um, uh, program, and uh, it, it has been, I think, for the last 10 years or so, if not longer. So, um, um, again, is it being done exhaustively? No, no, but again, nobody can do it exhaustively, and I think that's why it really kind of requires a, a, a trans NIH effort to do this. I would think a common fund would be a great place to do this. Uh, unfortunately, this year, the common fund didn't agree with us, um, but that doesn't mean that that's dead in the water. There are actually other places uh, uh, Vivian could address, but I don't know if it's appropriate for me to do that, but there are some other places um, that um, may be engaged in this as well. Do you wanna say anything about that Vivian or no? Okay, we won't say anything about that. But there are other agencies that um, could take a leading uh, um, uh, role in, in this activity as well. We have, Lydia, we have one more question in the room and then we should maybe keep going. But uh, Sarath. So do you foresee this and other initiatives uh, like the studies uh, could or should go beyond mapping of the modifications to something more like a structures, RNA structures, which would uh, have more therapeutic value? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand. So do you foresee these initiatives uh, could or should go beyond mapping modifications to, say, uh, solving the RNA structures? Oh, absolutely. That, I think, is a, is a major component because certainly uh, the RNA structures uh, dictate a lot of the function as well as identify the binding sites that uh, you may be able to get uh, uh, your, your small molecules to target uh, that can be used for therapeutics or, or diagnostics. I certainly think that that the structure is is a huge because uh, that again uh, may identify therapeutic targets. Um, so absolutely yes. I mean I, I think any initiatives that will come out will certainly address structural elements. Thank you. And maybe I have one last question so that we can end on this one, Fred. So since the last workshop, has there been any new developments in technology that show promise as disruptive towards sequencing? Um, I know that actually Chuan Ha had uh, developed some things or, or had published something that came out right a long time at the same time as the workshop where there, uh, I, I'm not sure how many he's able to get, but he, he has some new technologies uh, that are uh, available. Um, Jennifer uh, Strasberger could probably address that better than I can because they have within the program at NHGRI um, different uh, uh, funding initiatives and grants that are supporting this as well as some work that they're doing with the NSF um, that may uh, be able to uh, talk about some new newly developed technologies that are becoming available. I would refer you to uh, Dr. Chow Pan here who works at Chuan, who would probably best be able to address what they've published so far. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yes, I imagine in the interest of time, we should probably move, but but Patel is here and he could certainly uh, address these things. Again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred, for starting us off and uh, Dr. Contreras for asking very good questions. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kristen Kutmu. Please come come forward, Kristen. And um, we decided that uh, Kristen should give a talk pretty early on in uh, um, our workshop because uh, she works on modifications, she thinks about their functions, and she also thinks about techniques to uh, characterize and map these. Uh, modifications. So Kristen is uh, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, and she is the uh, Sehan Ege, oh wow, I said it right, assistant professor, so she has a chair. So um, Kristen, please come forward. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Brenda, for the lovely introduction, and I uh, and for everyone to introducing this topic um, going forward, let me set 
my timer so I don't ramble on too long. Oh, what's going on? Okay. Yeah, th this screen is flashing. I thought that screen was. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to really help kick off this workshop on RNA modifications, one of my favorite topics. Cells face the daunting task of having to maintain the right number of proteins in the right place at the right time. One general strategy they use to do this is to modify all three major classes of biomolecules in the central dogma in order to control their structure, function, and stability. Um, beyond people in this room, uh, Scientists as a whole tend to think and talk a lot about the sorts of modifications that get put onto DNA or onto proteins, things like methylations and phosphorylations. However, it turns out that that central molecule in the central dogma, RNA, can also be highly modified. And there are over 150 different varieties of modifications that can be put on to these molecules. Indeed, we've known about the existence of modifications in RNA really since the dawn of RNA research in the 1950s, when some of the most abundant modifications in RNAs were first discovered. And for a very long time, we've thought that these modifications were primarily the purview of non-coding RNAs. And just as a reminder, a non-coding RNA is a catch-all for 98 to 99% of the RNAs that exist in a cell. And these RNAs are simply RNAs that do not act as templates for protein synthesis. In contrast, it's long been thought that protein coding mRNAs contain many fewer modifications with the only one that we really knew where existed commonly being the M7 methyl G cap found on the five prime end of eukaryotic mRNAs. However, the last 15 years or so have really flipped this long-standing dogma on its head with the advent of deep sequencing technologies, allowing scientists to develop techniques to pick their favorite of those 150 modifications and go in and develop tools in order to directly sequence and identify, map where that modification can sit at all sites across the transcriptome. These deep sequencing studies have given us maps of roughly 15 different types of RNA modifications and indicated that there are over 10,000 sites of RNA modifications in both non-coding RNAs and protein coding mRNAs. These modifications have really ignited the imagination of scientists worldwide because they have the potential to impact every step in the life cycle of an RNA after it's been made. They can change RNA structure and dynamics, um, splicing and maturation, RNA stability, RNA protein interactions, and even how the RNA itself functions. Consistent with this, um, perturbations in non-coding RNAs and redistrib redistribution of mRNA modifications are linked to a wide variety of diseases and negative outcomes for human health including neurological diseases, cancers, mitochondrial disorders, and vascular diseases. This shouldn't be surprising uh, given that these modifications are linked to really core biological processes, including development, circadian rhythm maintenance, protein homeostasis, immune response, and so on. Together, 50 years of enzyme knockout work, coupled with genetics, coupled with recent mRNA modification uh, maps, suggest that RNA modifications are important in some way for biology. And this work has given us a really beautiful bird's eye view of the RNA modification landscapes, where we know modifications exist, and we know that they can redistribute in response to cellular distress, um, cellular stress, or other things that perturb cellular biology. However, we don't really know what these individual modified sites do. In terms of thinking about uh, mRNA, this has led to two sort of hypotheses in the RNA biology field about what mRNA modifications in particular might be doing. And I'm showing these hypotheses in their, their extreme here in order to make a point. Um, the first hypothesis is that this newfound class of modifications in mRNAs don't do much, and that they're just biological noise resulting from the off-target 
action of non-coding RNA molecules, and there's not a whole lot of consequence to them. The second hypothesis is that they do everything and that they are a major regulatory mechanism um, for pretty much all genes and are at the center of gene control. In reality, um, I think that the real answer is going to end up being somewhere in between. And a part of what I would like to um, put forward for us to discuss in this workshop is how we're going to get uh, between these two different models in order to figure out which of those many sites are actually really contributing to biology. And I like to think of this as um, sort of akin as to protein post-translational modifications, which we know are everywhere and are very important for controlling the action of some proteins, but also don't always matter. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't look into them and wonder what it is they might be doing. So in order to do this, we need to move down from our bird's eye view to what I like to refer to as the Google Street View of RNA modifications, where we zoom in on one modification at a time and ask what's there, how much is there, how did it get there, and what is it actually doing in order to perhaps change interactions between a given RNA molecule and components of the cellular machinery. And I think that this really leaves us with four grand challenges for the RNA modification field. Our first challenge is to establish the chemical diversity of modifications in both non-coding and protein coding mRNAs. Our second challenge is to figure out where those modifications reside and how they're added enzymatically. Also, how those enzymes are regulated and controlled. We also need to not only know what's there and where it is, but how much of it is there. Because when you're trying to weed through 10,000 plus sites of RNA modification to figure out which ones are biologically doing something, it's really useful to know if that modification is incorporated 2% of the time or 90% of the time. This is really a key piece of information. And this is a key piece of information, not only for mRNA modifications, but also for non-coding uh, modifications. And I'd just like to give a small shout out to tRNAs, which we thought for decades were stoichiometrically modified, um, but clearly are not. And so this is something that we need to be looking at in general across RNA species. Lastly, and most near and dear to my heart, is that we need to figure out what the function of individual sites actually are. Because to my mind, um, mapping is a wonderful, beautiful thing, but it is not a be all end all purpose. The ultimate purpose of these mapping studies needs to be figuring out what the actual function of individual sites are so that we can know how RNA modifications contribute to biology. This is going to take, as has been uh, discussed pretty pretty extensively already, um, some large scale collaborations between scientists from different fields um, in biology, chemists and engineers, collaborating heavily with both academic, um, industrial partners and government agencies in order to achieve these really sort of lofty goals that I've set forward. This workshop on modifications is gonna um, address each one of these points. Brenda laid this out nicely, so I won't belabor it, but there will be sessions today where we are gonna learn more about quantitatively mapping modifications and also about um, how those modifications might be impacting biology, as well as um, how to collaborate effectively. Okay, so I'm now gonna switch from generally introducing the idea of RNA modifications to talking a little bit about the research in, in my lab. I, I'm using this just as an example of the sorts of things um, that I think are going on in the RNA community. It is certainly not everything that is happening out there, but I just wanted to give you some perspective as to the sorts of things that we're thinking about. The research in my lab is really set up in order to try and come up with a bio with a uh, with a biochemical framework for quantitatively understanding the biological role of RNA modifications on the molecular level. In order to do this, we have four areas of interest. Our first area of interest is to develop and implement mass spectrometry tools in order to identify, quantify, and map modifications. 
Secondly, we're interested in how those modifications get put in by RNA modifying enzymes. Many of the enzymes that modify non-coding RNAs uh, are now being revealed to also have mRNA targets. And I think that although these enzymes have been studied for decades, it's important to sort of revisit what it is we think we know about the enzymes because they're clearly targeting a much larger set of substrates that are much more diverse than the substrates that were initially identified. I'm also interested in trying to understand the consequences of both tRNA and rRNA modifications on protein synthesis. And lastly, um, RNA viruses is something that hasn't come up yet today, but RNA viruses, just like all of the other RNAs in the cells, contain lots of RNA modifications. And my lab is interested in trying to um, look into what the molecular level consequences of those modifications are on viral gene expression and evolution. Uh, today, I'm going to really just touch on these three main areas of interest, starting off with mass spec. The reason I chose to start off with mass spectrometry is we're going to talk a lot today about direct sequencing uh, by nanopore, but I noticed that mass spec was underrepresented a little bit, so I thought I would highlight some of the aspects of my program that focus on using this and developing this sort of technology. The work conducted in the studies I'm gonna be talking about today has really been the, the brainchild of a, a single student in my lab, Joshua Jones, who's absolutely excellent. Um, and we're working together with my analytical chemistry collaborator, Dr. Bob, Bob Kennedy, because I'm a mechanistic enzymologist by training who um, just had some crazy ideas about things I wanted to do with mass spec and Josh was brave enough to make them happen. So before I go into what my lab has done, I just wanna generally frame for the audience what mass spec is capable of doing. So mass spectrometry can tell us a lot about RNA uh, sequence and RNA modifications. And there it can do so really in two different levels. At the first level, you can chop down RNAs in a sample and analyze the nucleosides that are present. This sort of approach has been used widely for a very long time in order to discover RNA modifications, um, in order to identify which modifications are in a particular sample. And this really is the gold standard way of quantifying RNA modifications. However, mass spectrometry can also be used to directly sequence RNAs, which is actually a much more difficult thing to do. Right now, sort of the state of the art in the field is that we can purify short RNAs. For example, short tRNAs um, can be purified individually and robustly um, sequenced. And you, we can also, we're starting to be able to sequence semi-complex mixtures. So for example, um, mixtures of rRNA partial degradations. And I'm gonna talk about work in both of these um, realms now. So I just wanted to give everybody an idea as to what the sort of nucleoside workflow looks like and the sort of information we can get out of this type of studies. Um, when we're trying to analyze what modifications are present in a sample and how much is there, we take an RNA sample, we digest it down into nucleosides, we then separate those nucleosides out by liquid chromatography and shoot uh, each one of those nucleosides um, onto a mass spec. This allows us to simultaneously monitor all of the signals arising from both modified and unmodified nucleosides at, in a single assay. And the technology that my lab has developed, which really is just a forwarding um, of technology developed by the Limbaugh Lab and others really standing on the shoulder of giants, we are now able to simultaneously quantify 51 ribonucleosides um, with the highest sensitivity for ribonucleosides. Um, and this is done in the absence of mass spec contam contaminating ion pairing reagents. And just in general, the pros of this sort of approach are that they are direct, you're directly looking at the RNA, they're high throughput, they're extremely sensitive, they're quantitative, and there are a number of internal sample quality controls because by looking at 51 nucleosides in parallel, if I'm looking at an mRNA sample, for example, it's very obvious if there are tRNA contaminations, if I start to see big funky tRNA modifications pop up in my sample. The major drawback to this particular technique is there's no sequence context. And I'm not gonna lie, that is a major drawback, but 
I just want to emphasize that right now, this is still the gold standard method for quantifying modified nucleosides in a sample. My lab has also become more interested in trying to directly sequence RNA by, ma by mass spectrometry. And I'm going to tell you two brief stories now about directly sequencing total tRNAs as well as viral RNAs. So the limitation in sequencing RNAs is that um, it's hard to do top-down sequencing because you can't just shoot long RNAs onto a mass spec and expect them to fly and be able to sequence them. However, it's difficult to chop down RNAs into reasonable pieces that can be mapped back to the transcriptome because there are no RNases that are akin to proteases. Proteomics um, researchers have these great tools for being able to chop up proteins into reasonable sized pieces that they can then use for analysis. RNases that are commercially available right now don't do this. They are incredibly promiscuous and they just chew things down into tiny bits. And so this makes it really difficult to chop up um, RNAs in a complex mixture and be able to analyze them in a way that we can get any information out. This has been done once uh, by a previous group that developed uh, orthogonal pro um, nucleases in order to be able to do this. Uh, but these nucleases are not commercially available and they are really good nucleases. So they kill cells uh, when you try, <laughs> trust me, we've tried. Uh, when you try to make them because they just chew up all of the RNA in the cell. And so we wanted to see if we could come up with a more robust way using commercial enzymes to directly sequence total RNAs. And so we did this. This is an example of why having perspectives from multiple areas in um, science can be really useful for pushing things forward. We did this simply by using our RNA knowledge. So normally, when you take uh, the total tRNAs and you digest them down, you get a number of short fragments. And if you go on and you sequence these fragments by mass spec, you can get about 10 to 30% coverage on total tRNAs. However, uh, my analytical graduate student, Josh Jones, has been sitting in on all of these RNA meetings for you know five years now. And he comes into my office one day and he says, you know, We've been trying to make all of these enzymes in order to get larger pieces of RNA, and it, it's just a pain in the butt. Why don't we just fold the RNAs before we chew them up with single-stranded nucleases? That should really give us discrete sizes that the, we could then go on to sequence. This seemed like a really straightforward idea, um, and we tried it, and it, it works quite robustly. So now we get much longer sequences just simply by folding the RNAs before we degrade them. And we can then subject these to mass spectrometry and sequence them directly using CID. And doing this, if we were to compare the coverage we got from the uh, fully digested tRNA and from the digestion of the folded tRNA, you can see we've improved our sequence coverage significantly. And this is true not only for tRNA, um, asparagine and I have shown here, but for tRNAs broadly across the transcriptome, where we can now, using this method, directly sequence total yeast tRNAs um, up to with up to 98% sequencing coverage, and most tRNAs having 60 to 90% sequencing coverage. And if you were just to compare here the standard RNAs A and RNAs T1 digestion on unfolded tRNAs to our current method, which is the bars in blue, you can see we've dramatically increased our ability to directly sequence tRNAs. Additionally, we've been interested in trying to sequence even more complex mixtures. And so we've moved up to start, a, to start directly sequencing viral RNAs. We're working with Professor Blake Wittenheft at Montana State University in order to obtain uh, viral RNA samples. And we're then applying these samples to direct sequencing, not only by mass spectrometry, but also by nanopore sequencing. So we can directly compare the two. When we subject um, MS2 bacteriophage first to nucleoside analysis and then to direct sequencing by both LCMS and nanopore, um, we see by both mesh spectrometry techniques, the inclusion of a single pseudouridine modification. 
This is in great contrast to what our nanopore sequencing suggested, which was over 300 modification sites, many of which were for modifications that our nucleoside analysis indicate don't even exist in our sample. And so this lesson has um, led us to propose that we should be really thinking carefully about integrating the LCMS and nanopore platforms in order to better develop algorithms for directly sequencing RNA modification by nanopore. Specifically, I would suggest that we consider at this venture where we are in terms of the state of technology using mass spec to identify which nucleosides are in a sample that we're analyzing so that we're at least picking the right program, um, nanopore program to, to use. Secondly, um, we should be critically thinking about the data that we get for nanopore, thinking do the number of sites that I can measure by nucleoside analysis correspond to a reasonable number of sites given by um, these algorithms. We can also use nanopore to verify sequence context in well-expressed genes. I think that one of the take-home messages for, for me or from me, I hope you get, is that we should trust but verify um, with all of these RNA sequences. We should be looking at sequences by orthogonal methods and making sure that we know really what's there. Um, and lastly, um, mass spec is still a great tool for providing foundational data sets on short abundant RNAs like tRNAs that can then be used to ultimately enhance the um, algorithms in nanopore technologies, which I think are eventually going to be the way to sequence RNAs. Okay. Now we're going to move on to talk a little bit about the consequences of modifications that it is we're discovering and we're studying. I wanted to focus on the consequences on translation uh, because translation is a cellular process near and dear to my heart. It also is a process that uses a lot of modified RNAs, including modified tRNAs, and we now know um, modified mRNAs. So there have been a number of studies um, by many people, including Hani Zar and Jody Puglisi and many, many others um, that have established sort of two separate classes of modifications in mRNAs and how the ribosome deals with those two classes of modifications. The first class of modifications, I like to think of as modifications that basically cause the ribosome to have a hard stop. When the ribosome encounters these modifications, it can't go on. Um, many of these modifications are incorporated by RNA, um, sorry, by RNA damage processes. When the ribosome stops at one of these modifications, this causes the ribosomes to collide, uh, eventually signaling for the degradation of the nascent polypeptide chain and the aberrant mRNA. The sorts of modifications that I wanna focus on talking about now are a second class of mRNA modifications, which have been uh, shown to not cause the ribosome to form a hard stop, but instead cause the ribosome to simply slow down. These sorts of modifications don't result in ribosome colliding, and they therefore the ribosome makes it all the way through transcripts containing these modifications in cells. Oh, what's going on there? Uh, makes it all the way through these modifications in cells, and is the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. Something is wrong with this slide. I was supposed to say, um, there's supposed to be an image of inosine right there, which somehow didn't translate. So uh, we know that in addition to slowing the ribosome down, which could of course influence uh, protein production, RNA modifications can alter, also alter translational accuracy. There's a large body of literature demonstrating how this can happen with the RNA modification inosine as well as with damaged bases. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about some of our work looking at uridine modifications, particularly focusing uh, for this crowd on the pseudouridine modification. Pseudouridine modification is of particular interest in terms of trying to figure out its biological function because it's one of the two most abundant modifications found in protein coding mRNAs. It's in fact almost nearly as abundant as that N6-methyladenosine or M6A modification we tend to hear so much about. 
Pseudouridine is primarily found in coding regions. This suggests that it is a modification that the ribosome is going to be seeing regularly in cells. It can also be incorporated with quite high occupancy, meaning that many of the pseudo-U sites in mRNAs are in fact conserved. Uh, and they can also be incorporated at high levels, meaning 60 to you know, 98%. Additionally, we know that the insertion of pseudouridine varies across the transcriptome with stress and development. I was particularly interested in pseudouridine because this particular modification has been studied for decades in the context of non-coding RNAs, where Paul Agris, Eric Westhoff, and others have demonstrated that pseudouridine, in addition to base pairing with adenosine, can also base pair with other nucleosides, suggesting the possibility that this might um, allow the ribosome to sometimes uh, prefer to take in and bind a non-cognate tRNA leading to the insertion of alternative amino acids. In order to get at this correct question directly, we used a fully reconstituted in vitro translation system in which we have all of the components for translation purified and we can add them back together in discrete amounts and really control our reaction, adding or subtracting one modification at a time. In this particular reaction, we have an unmodified or modified phenylalanine codon here in the empty ribosome A site, and we've added total charged tRNAs and just looked in an unbiased manner to see if um, the ribosome only makes the expected product or also does some level of alternative amino acid selection. Of course, it did do some level, um, low level of alternative amino acid selection, or I wouldn't be talking to you about this. We went on to characterize some of the alternative amino acids we saw get put in kinetically and to really do transient kinetics and get an idea of how much um, of these amino acids could be inserted and how robustly on modified codons. In this particular scheme, we're reacting ribosomes that contain an unmodified or modified phenylalanine codon with an isoleucine tRNA. So we're looking at misincorporation on the ribosome. When we do this, we see that isoleucine misincorporation can really be either enhanced or limited in a very context dependent manner, depending on where that pseudouridine is located within the mRNA. As a mechanistic enzymologist, when you see funny things happening in your test tube, you always wanna go on and make sure that you actually see the same thing happening in cells. So we worked with Dr. Bajoyta Roy, who was at NEB and is now at Moderna in order to, to do this. Dr. Roy and her team generated um, luciferase pep mRNAs that contained either no modifications or were fully substituted with pseudouridine. They transfected these RNAs into cells, purified out the resulting protein products, and did an unbiased uh, mass spec looking at what amino acid was present at every single position in the peptide. Analysis of the products of these uh, two different mRNAs are shown here. So up here is the luciferase peptide that flew the best and for which they have the best sequencing depth. All of the codons that do not contain a U or all of the amino acids that are generated from codons that don't contain a U are not bolded. Those from codons that contain a U are bolded and those where we actually observe substitutions are shown in red. The take home message from this is that we do see substitutions um, at a higher level on the mRNAs that contain pseudouridine. However, we do not see them at all U sites, suggesting that there is context dependence, just like our in vitro assays demonstrated. And subsequent work has come out the last year um, showing that this occurs not only in our system, but that it can happen in other people's hands as well, which has been very reassuring. As a chemist, I now that we know that there's some sort of context dependence, the next natural question is why? So we worked with Dr. Aaron Frank, who was at the University of Michigan and is now head of chemical biology at Arrakis Therapeutics in order to do some MD simulations to try and understand this. We also uh, concurrently did quite a bit of RNA melting studies. 
Aaron and his team um, modeled an isoleucine tRNA bound to a phenylalanine codon in the context of a crystal structure we'd collected with Dr. Yuri Polinikov containing a pseudouridine uh, mRNA. And Aaron's MD simulations, much to my astonishment, absolutely recapitulated what it was we had seen in vitro, where he demonstrated that by inserting a pseudouridine at the first position in a phenylalanine codon, you have a stronger base pair between the phenylalanine codon and the isoleucine. Uh, he saw the opposite at the second position, where we also saw um, isoleucine being discriminated against, suggesting that it's really fundamental properties of these RNAs that are driving the phenomenon that we're seeing. So this leaves us with a sort of overall summary of what we think pseudouridine might be doing during translation elongation. That is, without pseudouridine there, the ribosome makes a lot of protein, mostly the right thing. When pseudouridine is there, the ribosome can make a little bit less protein uh, sometimes, and it can also make a small number, a low level number of um, different peptide products containing single mutations. We then went on and said, okay, now that we know pseudouridine might be doing something, how is it getting where it's supposed to be? In order to do this, we're studying pseudouridine synthase enzymes or pus enzymes. These enzymes have been linked to intellectual disabilities and cancers. Um, our work, I'm going to summarize here in one slide, basically suggests that these enzymes are much less specific uh, than has been long thought and led us to a model for puses selecting their mRNA targets, which is that under unstressed growth, um, pus Pusses reside mostly in the nucleus where they have access to a limited number of substrates and the substrates they do have access to are bound with RNA binding proteins or with ribosomes. Under stress, uh, we know that pus seven can relocalize at least under heat shock out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where it can now see a much wider variety of substrates and it does in fact modify more substrates under these heat shock conditions. We've gone on to follow up on these studies, identifying a number of different conditions under which PUS7 relocalizes under stress. We've also tagged the PUS7 enzyme, uh, forcing it to be either only in the nucleus or only in the cytoplasm with an NLS or NES tag, and look to see how that impacts cell viability. And we do see that um, having either an NLS or an NES tag under different stress conditions, uh, changes cellular fitness and response to stress. This is really in line with a, a sort of an emerging idea in RNA modifications, both across mRNAs and tRNAs, that many of these RNA modifying enzymes relocalize in response to stress and that this might be doing um, something important in terms of stress response. So again, Welcome to the RNA workshop meeting. Thank you for listening to all I've had to say. And I'm excited to talk to everybody today about trying to figure out which sites do what, when, and where. And thank you so much for your time. That was great, Kristen. Um, I, I'm going to try to uh, start us off Go and... Ahead. Um, it, it relates to your point that we've got extremes of what modifications might do. They might be the key to life. They might not do anything. And I agree, the answer might be intermediate. And, you know, if we're embarking on trying to uh, sequence all RNAs with their modification, you know, we probably want to prioritize in some way. And I'm, uh, I'm, uh, there's no right answer to this, but I'm thinking about your your assays of pseudouridine in message and how it could uh, trigger a different amino acid uh, uh, insertion. Can you envision a screening, uh, something to say, okay, these modifications are the most important. We should focus on these. And, you know, you were putting them in, in uh, not a natural context, yep. but I would be very curious if you have any ideas on that. Yeah, I think this absolutely has to be done. This is the sort of thing that we're thinking about how to do moving forward. It's actually pretty tricky with the proteomics to be able to um, come up with 
how to approach such a problem. I think our approach currently has been more to try to build up some rules. So I didn't show it here, but we've done a bunch of different U modifications where you basically walk the modification around the base and put it in different contexts. And we're trying to figure out what contexts cause the biggest perturbation in rate and the biggest perturbation in um, amino acid addition, and then go back into the transcriptome and look and say, okay, where are sites where it's in this context and start with those? Because I think we need a priority list. But yes, absolutely. Some sort of large scale proteomics study is absolutely warranted. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful talk. So I'm just uh, wondering that uh, quantitatively, how much of the pseudo user that in the coding sequence uh, in terms of the per given site occupancy will lead to a functional impact? And uh, what's your plan to tease apart uh, past uh, MR and TRNA targets in terms of its function? So that is, those are all fantastic questions. Um, I think that we only recently even have an idea of what the stoichiometry is, right? Chuan Ha had a paper, a bid seek paper out earlier this year that measured stoichiometries transcriptome wide. And in that paper, they saw a lot, they saw a translational read through with pseudouridine at stop codon mRNAs. And they were able to actually verify this by, um, by Western blotting. And the stoichiometry of the pseudouridines that were at those sites did not necessarily directly correlate which how, with how much read through they saw. So I think it's going to be a, a tricky question, unfortunately. None of this is easy. <laughs> Um, I, I wish that I can say it was. And then in terms of teasing out the role of mRNA versus tRNA, I don't know. I think in vitro is really going to be the way that has to be done because you really can't just knock out one of these enzymes and look in vivo and say that's what's going on. Yeah. So um, I was thinking back to your, you had the one modification that you saw um, using uh, mass spec versus the 300 positioned by nanopore. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that one was, was determined. Those are the 51 you could look at. Yeah. Okay. So, and then you had, and, and those are the most common ones. Okay. I mean, to be fair, we, we, even those include some weird ones. So I guess my question was, so there's 300 by nanopore. Do you believe that you had 299 just totally erroneous ones by nanopore? Do you think that those are actually modifications that aren't in those 51? No. So you think it's 299? I do. Case? Yeah. Um, and we are working. So I, I want to say, I think, first of all, I, I want to be clear that I think nanopore is going to be the future of this field. I think long term, absolutely, that is where we have to go. But just like Fred was talking about this morning, standards are going to be absolutely necessary for the development of rigorous platforms so that we really know what it is we're looking at. And nanopore is great for looking at um, RNAs where we already know what modifications are there. It can say yes or no, we see something there. But in terms of being able to call modifications de novo, it's not there yet. And that's going to need some, some more implementation. Hi, Christine. Hi, Juan. Great, great talk. So the, um, towards the end of your talk, you alluded to the contribution of intracellular cell uh, transport dynamics to modification set. Oh, I think it's a big deal. Oh, <laughs> well, and, as you, and I know that correctly so, people usually address situations of stress. Mm -hmm. As you know, my lab, we have been pushing the idea that before we, we can understand stress, we need to, to actually reconcile with the fact that even transport dynamics set homeostasis. And it, is, and it is those changes where there are competing rates between rates of transport and the rate of modification by particular modification enzymes that, that we have something to say. So my question is, among all the challenges that, that uh, we have listed, right? How what, can you comment on the challenge of even establishing what homeostasis look like with so many competing rates with current or future technologies? It's a big challenge, would be my comment. <laughs> um, I think we're going to need to do a lot of imaging. And I think it's also going to be end up being this is pretty cell type specific. So it's not a small question in that we could establish this in HEC 293 cells. I imagine if you go into neuronal cells, something's going to look a little bit different and it's it's going to be hard, right? So this is not like sequencing DNA where each cell contains the same DNA. This is a much more complex problem. Oh, sure. 
so we have some questions um, from online um, or the virtual attendance. Do you see any favorite ones there? Sure, I, I just will go through them from top to bottom. Um, Lydia asked, pseudo U has been studied for many years. How can we accelerate studies uncovering the biological function of other mods and that remain uncharacterized? What types of assays and technologies could be helpful? So I would say pseudo U has been studied for many years, but we have not yet had the technology to study pseudo U well until about, I don't know, the last six months uh, or so. And so there's still definitely a lot left uh, in that space to begin with. Types of assays or technologies, um, I think coupling what we're looking at in the RNAs with actual proteomics and with whole RNA direct sequencing by furthering nanopore studies will be most, most useful. Um, Stefan Moss is asking about a fifth grand challenge or suggesting a fifth grand challenge, which is um, looking at the interaction of different types of modifications or crosstalk. This is a great question. Um, I have a story I didn't talk about today where we actually see crosstalk in the installation of tRNA modifications. This is for sure gonna be a thing and it's quite interesting. Um, I'm gonna answer one more question than, I, than, than many has a question. Um, Jeff Keeped wants to know about stoichiometry. So he's asking what percentage of a modification of an RNA species is modified at a given position. I think this is absolutely a key question. Again, as we're trying to weed through thousands upon thousands of sites, knowing the stoichiometry at individual sites is absolutely essential. Um, and so we, again, when we're thinking about mapping modifications, we don't just mean mapping, we really need quantifying those modifications as well. Yes, Jeff, I think it absolutely matters. Um, many. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. Great talk. <laughs> um, so I have two small questions. One is uh, regarding that uh, transcript for luciferase. Were those size uh, exclusive? Like they're everywhere or are they in particular locations? Yeah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Okay. So yeah, for that particular transcript. Okay. And then the second question is, um, I was just wondering about the significance of the, um, the subs uh, that you got for the um, phenylalanine um, tRNA. So you had... Um, before there was still like what 0.5 percent of uh, proteins had 0 0.05 yeah and that's totally normal that that's completely in the realm of when translation makes a mistake and then after it was like one percent one yeah okay yeah I mean that's a significant difference yep yeah. I mean it's still I'm not going to say there's still a ton of it but biology is fantastic at taking whatever is around and available and usurping it for um its needs at specific times. So I imagine that there might be one or two sites at which this happens much more robustly and it's important. Inosine, for example, does this. Thanks. Okay, are there, are there anything we have? Uh, did you go through these? No, I didn't finish. Um, uh, we are gonna about to have a break, is that right? So, um, uh, yeah, I think we should go on for a okay. break. Thank you so Thank much, you Kristen. So much. That was great uh, start. And we're gonna uh, take a break until a uh, quarter of the hour. So it would be about, I don't have any idea. Is it 10, 9.45, 10.45? Yeah, 10.45. And, 1045. and for those of you who are in person, there's a coffee downstairs. There's no more left here, but there's coffee available if you need it. I'm Sarad Janga. I'm an associate professor of uh, bioinformatics and data science at the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering at Indiana University. We recently changed our uh, university name from IUPUI are going to be changing very soon to IUI and also our school uh, had it engineering. Uh, my lab is broadly interested in single molecule methods for mapping RNA modifications, structures and interactions. Uh, that's our uh, major interest. And uh, today I'm going to be uh, moderating this session on uh, direct sequencing technologies. Our first speaker today is uh, Eva, Eva no Nova. Uh, she leads the epitranscriptomics and RNA dynamics lab at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, Spain. Her lab works on the use of uh, use and development of direct se direct RNA sequencing to study RNA modifications. So this session will have four uh, speakers, each uh, 
taking about 15 minutes of presentation and followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Without further, further ado, oh, Eva, she's online. Should we move to the next speaker or while? Okay, so do you suggest, oh, we are good? Perfect, thank you. Now, hello, you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, now, yes, okay, good, good. Sorry, sorry for the issues. Um, okay, let me just now share my presentation. Okay, do you see full screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, my name is Eva and I'm group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation. Um, and then basically our lab is called the Epitranscriptomic and RNA Dynamics Lab uh, because we're basically interested in what RNA modifications do uh, because RNA modifications, as uh, others already know, but very briefly are uh, dynamic features that expand the lexicon. Um, and basically in our laboratory, uh, we have been using different uh, technologies to study them. Uh, a lot of the efforts are related to direct RNA sequencing and it is what I will be basically uh, talking about. Um, but then we also use other technologies also to study them uh, like Illumina or also mass spectrometry. And this is because we're interested in understanding their biological function, both at the molecular level, as well as uh, more uh, at the, uh, during development, as well as their role in disease and in intergenerational inheritance. Um, so just briefly, the epitranscriptome comes in more than 170 different flavors. And here it's already a plot that we made in the lab uh, already now some years ago. There's an updated version that has been just published. Um, but basically what you can see from this plot is that uh, there's a huge variety of uh, modifications. Uh, there's many that have been associated based on the literature uh, with uh, diverse human diseases, the ones labeled in red here. But then like back then, uh, these were the ones that we could actually study. Uh, in a transcriptome-wide fashion, the ones that are circled in green. And this is basically because uh, most methods actually relied either on antibodies or chemicals that had to be selected for the modification of interest. So very briefly, um, so you need a, an antibody or a chemical that will selectively react with the modification of interest. Um, and then, uh, then you can couple this to uh, library preparation and finally uh, to you, you can get the peaks that will tell you where the modification is. You may have single nucleotide resolution using certain techniques, or also you can couple it to reverse transcription that uh, if there's a bulky modification, it will lead to an, a drop off. Or if the chemical affects the, the modification in a way that also causes a drop off, you will see this kind of uh, signature. So in this sense, uh, back already now some years ago, uh, direct RNA sequencing appeared as a promising alternative uh, to actually study RNA modifications in a transcriptome-wide fashion. Uh, so I don't need to uh, introduce the, the technology to the public, but pretty briefly, it's a, it's a technology that allows to sequence native RNA molecules um, 
in, in basically as the molecule goes through the pore, it causes a disruption in the current intensity, which can be converted into the nucleotides. Um, so some major advantages are that it will have no PCR bias, it can detect all modifications. Uh, you don't need to customize your protocols uh, to actually, um, you know, for each modification, which is especially important because then you don't need to pre-bias your decisions of which modification you think is especially important for your biological system of interest. Uh, because you actually do single molecule resolution, you can actually get quantitative uh, results in principle. principle. Yes. Um, and then uh, you can also get uh, isoform specific RNA modification information in principle, as well as study codependencies and so on and so forth. Um, so the advantages in theory are clear, um, but then I would say that there's some major challenges that remain to actually make this a uh, real uh, solution. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, uh, there's actually no base color for RNA modification. So uh, there, Nanopore has released some base color uh, models uh, for, our, for DNA modifications, but it, this is not yet the case for RNA modifications. Um, also, like in general, there's a large input requirements. So the default library preparation requires 500 nanograms of poly A plus uh, material. Um, but it, there's now some protocols that have been released uh, that in principle can start with 50 nanograms, um, but there's other uh, issues with that, which I mean, go beyond the scope of what I would like to talk about today. But yeah, basically, um, in, in any case, it's still a large amount of inputs. Um, in principle, the library prep uh, is uh, actually um, only limited to poly A plus RNA. And of course, you can then maybe consider polyadenylated in vitro, but that also has some consequences and issues. And it's in principle also limited to long RNA. So um, it's not that the technology in theory cannot uh, sequence uh, short molecules, but the truth is that it is capturing them poorly. And when you try to map them, there's issues, there's these calling issues and so on and so forth. So this kind of sets up a series of limitations uh, that need to be overcome to actually make this a, a real alternative to study modifications in a transcript from white fashion. So today, um, uh, due to the scope of this uh, workshop, I will basically just talk about challenge one. We've been working on the four different challenges and I'm happy to answer questions regarding any of the four, uh, but uh, the presentation will be focused only on challenge one, which is detecting modifications. So briefly, um, the, the theory is that whenever you find a modification, you should have a shift in the current intensity at the position where there's a modification of interest. So there's the theory, which is very nice. Um, but then in order to actually get this to work, you first need to align or re-squiggle, uh, which, because basically the nanopore signal, it's not actually, um, a, even though there's like a, it's supposedly translocated at an average speed, uh, this is an, a, like as any biological system, it's not perfect. So there's a, actually like an overstretching uh, in some regions and, and, and understretching, and then you need to kind of do this re-squiggling. Uh, you can do use dynamic time warping or different approaches. Um, but basically this re-squiggling process is also dependent on the base calling accuracy. Uh, so when we were actually doing the very first approaches trying to use uh, you know, these re-squiggling to detect modifications, uh, we were actually using very old base color, so albacore. Uh, which is now deprecated. Uh, and then it basically was a disaster back then. Uh, so this is 2017. Um, so, so then actually what we realized is that modifications also cause these kind of base calling errors. So we could somehow overcome uh, the, the issue of um, detecting modifications uh, of the risk wiggling by looking into these systematic base calling errors. And that's when we actually developed uh, EpiNano where basically we generated some uh, synthetic sequences that had unmodified uh, NTPs. And then we also generated ones uh, that were uh, completely modified. Uh, it is important to know that uh, because initially we wanted to try to train a base color, um, we actually generated the synthetic sequences with covering all the possible fivemers uh, with and without the modifications. Um, that proved to not work and I'm happy to discuss why. Um, but what we also found is that, you know, if we just extract the features, uh, both at the current information and the base calling information and do some machine learning, in this case, we finally ended up using uh, SVMs, you can then classify the cameras on whether they are modified or unmodified. And this was set up for M6A, but then later on we showed that it also works for different modifications. 
So this base calling error signature is, is a simple proxy to actually detect uh, modifications in a simple manner in a transcriptome wide fashion. And it works for many diverse modifications. So here I'm just illustrating some additional examples, uh, pseudouridine here to primomethyl. And importantly here, when you remove this no RNA guiding that specific modification, the error signature is completely lost. Meaning that this is not just some uh, base calling accuracy issue, but actually this signal is driven by the modification because when you remove this no RNA guiding this modification, it is lost in a very selective manner. And the same happens with the other modification uh, types. It is also important noticing that sometimes these uh, errors are not just like a single position, but actually a spread signal across, you know, the FIFMER region that actually contains the modification, which makes uh, a bit um, more complex to detect certain modification types. So, okay, this is nice. So we can detect them at single site, but what about in single read? So uh, can we go quantitative? Um, so then for this, we kind of have to revisit the, the issue of risk wiggling. This problem needs to be solved, but then thanks to the improvements in base calling, uh, um, in, in, in base calling the algorithm that basically, you know, Gupi was actually doing a much better job than Alba Core, this problem became uh, reasonable. And basically we can now, sorry, we can now uh, re-squiggle the reads and then see, for example, shifts in the current intensity and in positions that, um, that basically have the modification. And, and here, this is just a control showing that in other cases, you don't see this shift, even though it also has the modification. <laughs> so basically using this kind of approach, one can envision that um, you can predict the stoichiometry uh, of modification. We propose this uh, software here, but others also have uh, now developed their own. Uh, but basically the idea is that using specific features, you can use signal intensity. Uh, you can also use dwell time, other people. And we have, we actually propose to use a different feature called trace as well. Um, and then you can basically predict the stoichiometry of how many reads are modified relative to those that are modified. And here's the final overall estimates. And in the knockout, you can see that basically we don't predict them to be modified. And in the wild type, they are actually highly modified in agreement with uh, mass spectrometry. Um, so something that is also important worth mentioning here is um, that actually, as I was briefly mentioning before, the features that you use, in my opinion, do matter um, to, you know, to actually how well you predict your estimation. So here we were doing some comparisons of you know, feeding only signal intensity or feeding different combinations. And finally, we went up with the one that was predicting better the stoichiometry based on the mass spec standards that we had built, which were validated uh, by mass spectrometry to actually make sure that they had the amounts that we were expecting in terms of incorporation of pseudouridine. Um, okay, so then if we can detect modification in individual reads, can we look into modification dynamics? So uh, we looked at this uh, some time ago, but then like the long story, and a short answer is yes, that you can use it to detect modification dynamics. You can go from absent to present kind of scenarios where basically, for example, here in this example, heat shock conditions, you can uh, detect the modification and in the normal you can't, but then you can also see scenarios in which basically, uh, you know, you have a low stoichiometry of modification in the normal condition. And then upon heat shock, you increase the modification abundance. And then this is just to also show that not only in these kind of snow RNAs that we were looking here, but also even in uh, mRNAs, this also works. Um, so now there's many tools uh, to predict modifications that are now out there. Um, and basically in general, they rely on either uh, base calling errors as I introduced, or they also rely on the, on the current intensity or raw signal uh, information, right? So if I kind of, uh, but then this is really like not what, uh, you know, what we have for DNA, it's still far from being the standard because uh, this is still not base calling uh, de novo RNA modification, which I think is ultimately the goal that we should aim for. Um, so basically like just to kind of recap of where all this fits, like here we have the sequencing of the RNA strand. Uh, there, there's some, some data acquisition, uh, you know, using the Minno software which basically records the fast fives for each individual read that is sequenced. And then in the base calling process, these fast fives are converted into FASTQ. Here using Guppy, but other softwares could have been used in the old times Alba core. One could also consider using Bonito, although the RNA version is not available. And the important thing is here that you have a base calling model that is being fed to the base calling algorithm. And um, then finally you, you can then map your reads. 
Um, but so then basically at the end, as I was saying, you detect modifications in three different ways. Using base calling errors is one way, using alterations in current intensity is another way that has been proposed. But then if you would use a modification aware base calling model, that would be the third uh, version. So you would need here a, a bit different base calling model that is not just for the canonical basis. So it doesn't just predict four letters, but it would predict more letters. Uh, so then, for example, here from the wild type, you would predict in which individual read you have a modification and in the knockout, you should see a loss or practically a complete loss of your modification. And then you could even have a estimation of modification probability for each base and read and position in your reads. Um, so then the question is, can we base call modifications? Um, so as I was saying for this, what you need is a model that uh, will predict not four letters, but actually, you know, for example, in the case of M6A, at least five letters. And for this, you need to train a modification aware model. And this is actually what we've been working a lot on. And uh, we started again with M6A precisely because we thought it would be the, an, an easy scenario for which we could have some training data. So, so here, the key thing is that for this base calling model, you need to train it and you need a training set. And, and basically this is a bit what we have been trying to do. So here there's just some couple of snapshots of uh, real data where actually we have tried to base call, uh, to train a, an M6A based calling model. And here you can see, you know, that in individual reads, uh, you know, for this position that is a previously described M6A, you have some reads that are predicted to be modified, others that are not predicted to be modified. Um, and then basically you can validate this in vitro and some synthetic sequences where the modification is not predicted or, and then finally you can also even go in vivo and see that in the knockout is less modified and this position in the, in the wild type is more modified. Um, so what we're finding globally is that um, with this model, we can see very strong differences globally in the distribution of uh, wild type and knockout um, when, when we look into this with the base calling model. So we think that there is actually quite some hope for uh, RNA based calling models. Um, but then uh, the, like generating these training sets for other modifications is gonna be a bit more challenging. So uh, basically uh, it's not just about having ways to train the data, um, but actually it's about also having the right data to train the model. And this is also an important limitation that I wanted to highlight. Um, and with this, oops, oops, sorry. I wanna thank the people actually that um, did the work that I've been presenting here today as well as the collaborators and funding and thank you all for your attention. And I hope I wasn't too fast or too slow and everybody followed me. Thank you. Well, we'll take questions towards the end. Our next speaker is, uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Ben Garcia. Ben Garcia is the head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at Washington University in St. Louis where his lab develops mass spec technologies related to chemical modifications of proteins and RNA. Ben? All right, thank you so much for <clears throat> the introduction and opportunity to be here and share a little bit about um, how we're using mass spectrometry to sequence and characterize RNA. Let me go ahead and try to share this. Um, everybody, oh. Everybody see this? Yep. Okay, good. Okay. And so today, what I'm, I'm hoping to uh, discuss with everyone is um, just kind of uh, give a, a crash course update on some of the mass spec based approaches that we've been using to detect modifications, quantify modifications, um, and even sequence RNA uh, using mass spectrometry. And so there's a lot of challenges with uh, um, you know, trying to analyze RNA by mass spectrometry-based approaches, um, but there's a lot to gain here as well. Uh, mass spectrometry is a, is a fairly unbiased approach. Um, and since we're measuring um, the mass of molecules, we have the opportunity to detect many different types of modifications, um, ben, as well as novel modifications. Ben, uh, yeah. you're not in the slideshow mode. Could you? Oh. Well, wow, it's not in slideshow mode. Uh, let me hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Sorry. Sometimes my computer does not like it when I'm I'm hooked up to um, my dual screen. How does that look? Yep. Good. Looks good. 
that looks good. Okay, yeah, sorry. And so, um, let me just get the pointer. Okay, and so um, while there's a lot of challenges by mass, uh, you know, in using mass spectrometry um, uh, to sequence RNA, uh, a lot to gain as well because mass spectrometry is is, a, is an unbiased approach that allows you to detect the masses of molecules, and therefore we can detect, um, you know, theoretically any modification that might be present, including novel modifications. Um, and then we could also kind of do this in a, in a sequence specific manner uh, by sequencing the RNA as well. However, there are issues uh, with this approach in that um, RNA um, is difficult to separate by liquid chromatography, which is often kind of used uh, before coupling to the mass spectrometer. Um, RNA compared to other molecules uh, is quite unstable in um, and out of the mass spectrometer. Um, sequencing larger RNA um, transcripts is, is quite difficult. And uh, most people in the mass spec field, you know, focus on uh, metabolites and uh, proteins. And so there's just not as, um, as many resources, especially computational, uh, for um, characterization of, of RNA by mass spectrometry. But my lab has been very interested in this problem for the last maybe three, four years. And so we've developed a lot of approaches to try to enhance the, um, uh, the analysis of RNA by mass spectrometry. And, you know, starting um, by, you know, just um, looking at mono um, oligonucle uh, um, nucleosides, uh, we've developed a derivatization approach uh, where we derivatize um, RNA that's been chewed down to one um, uh, oligonucleoside uh, or um, mononucleoside unit. Uh, and we derivatize it with iodomethane, which is deuterated, and I'll show you why this is important later. Um, but, you know, this is a, a very st efficient strategy, um, very clean reaction. It's permethylation. It's been used before on many other molecules. But what this does is it really enhance the analysis of, of RNA mononucleosides. And, and typically, if you run RNA on a liquid chromatography column, C18 base, you know, the, the, you know, the, the um, nucleosides all kind of be loop very close together, kind of, um, you know, in a, in a very uh, small area, um, all up in the front of the gradient. However, with the derivatization, you can see that the, the nucleosides now spread out, they're more hydrophobic. And so we get better separations and that's, that's better for quantification. But um, this also helps us um, identify different types of modifications on the RNA as well. <clears throat> and so when you derivatize with the iodomethane, um, um, what this does is it will react with any electron acceptor, such as hydroxyl group or amine groups. And so you can see here, we've derivatized the, the three hydroxyl groups and, the, and um, you know, the two hydrogens on the amine group are replaced as well, if it's just uh, derivatization of adenosine. But the nice thing is when we start derivatizing these different um, isomeric uh, modifications, such as a 6-methyl A um, or 2'-methyl A, you can see that the different positions are actually modified here. And so we have an endogenous modification methylation here. And in this case, we have the endogenous uh, methylation down here in the uh, two prime um, oocyte. And so when we fragment these molecules together or detect them or fragment them together, um, they give us signatures that allow us to differentiate these isobaric modifications that at the MS1 level or just the intact level, they look the same. But here, um, they'll actually uh, give us separation. And, and with this, we've been able to develop this uh, derivation approach to detect somewhere around 60 to 80 modifications uh, for most cell types. This allows us to really analyze you know, difficult to characterize modifications um, such as uh, uridine and, and pseudouridine. And so again, um, when we derivatize, here's uh, uridine, you can see the different derivatizations. And when we fragment, we get this fragment with the um, when nitrogen group on the ring getting the um, derivatization. Um, but when we look at pseudouridine, you can see here that, um, you know, you have uh, two different types of, um, or two uh, sites on the, on the ring that are now derivatized, which we didn't have before. So it has a different mass and when it fragments has a different mass as well. So very easy to uh, separate these or, or, you know, distinguish these, even though by liquid chromatography, they're difficult to separate. And so, um, there's lots of different ways to look at uh, RNA modifications by mass spectrometry. A lot of people use targeted approaches um, where you know the molecule that you want to study and you target it. Usually it's at the, at the MS2 level, so this is at the fragment level. And so the, the 
target is known, you typically do not take an MS1, so you don't have the parent spectrum, but you'll quantify at the, um, the MS2 level by isolation of the fragment and detection and quantification of that fragment. However, if you're not, uh, if you don't know what you're going to, you know, try to detect, you can't detect unknown species. There's another approach called data dependent acquisition, where if something is known, it will trigger an MS, MS or a fragmentation spectra. And so typically you detect everything in, in the parent ions. And so these are all different uh, mononucleosides. Um, and then you would select one of these and isolate it and fragment it and get a fragmentation spectra to identify it. However, the problem here is that something that's low level and maybe an unknown modification or species may not be selected for the second uh, MSMS event that would uh, give you a, a fragmentation spectra. So they go undetected. Um, Lastly, there's a new approach in the mass spec field called data independent acquisition mass spectrometry. And here, um, you know, the, the idea is that we have MS1 detection, so we see everything just like we saw before. But instead of isolating one species to then fragment, we isolate a region of the mass spectrometer and then we fragment these things together. So the MS MS spectra are a mix, a composite of multiple species. And so you can actually create these little windows that you want to fragment everything that's found in these windows together. And we've done this for RNA, developed windows that are specific to certain modifications. And the advantage here is that if something is known, it will be abundant and you'll fragment it and you'll be able to pull it out of that fragmentation spectra. But even the low level species um, that normally would not be triggered uh, for MSMS -MS in this other approach here, the DDA approach, these will be present there in these windows. They might be at very low levels, but we won't miss them. They'll be present. And with uh, Power for Algorithms, you can extract this data and detect and quantify these very low level species. And so we've been able to do this, you know, applying this type of approach, which has been used quite a bit for um, quantitative proteomics and apply it to RNA analysis. And so here's just an example of how here we have a mass of um, this one species, 3NL6 um, adenosine, and um, there's several MS-MS spectra here that confirm that it's real. Um, so we can go back and remind the data, but we can actually go back and remind the data for any potential modification or mass change that we would want to identify. And so um, in the last recent years or so, there's been a, a, in a discovery that RNA can be glycosylated. And so we can go back through our data sets and actually find these peaks that correspond to signature ions of different um, combinations of uh, glycans on the RNA nucleosides. And then we can go back and kind of um, confirm these as well. Um, so we've been actually been able to use this type of approach to detect novel modifications and new, uh, you know, different types of uh, branch forms of, um, you know, different uh, glycan molecules on the RNA as well. But what about RNA sequencing? You know, everything I kind of showed you before was just mononucleoside analysis and mass spectrometers are very good at sequencing peptides and proteins. So can we sequence RNA as well by mass spectrometry? And the answer is yes, but it is very difficult. Part of the difficulty is that RNA doesn't behave well in the mass spectrometer. So we've been kind of, you know, working on that as well. Um, but the other real difficulty is that there are not uh, very many approaches for the computational analysis of kind of this RN, shotgun RNA types of analysis. And so we've developed the first infrastructure to kind of, and um, you know, um, ad adapted um, an open search algorithm that we now call nucleic acid search um, engine um, that will take tandem mass spectra of oligonucleotide spectra and match them to a database. And so this is kind of just a screenshot of what it kind of looks like. So you can see here, here's a small uh, RNA transcript with a modification. Um, very similar composition, but a different oligonucleotide with a modification at a different position. And so the, the program can pick these up quite well. Uh, we've been also, um, you know, adding more and more technology to the RNA toolbox. And so another area of, of interest in the lab is to add ion mobility mass spectrometry. And this is a gas yes. separation. And so we have liquid chromatography separation, but now we want to include even more separation in the gas phase. And so this separates um, molecules in the gas phase based on their cross sections and shape. And so when we turn on this ion mobility, we can get slight selectivity of RNA that are then um, separated from one another, but this time in the mass spectrometer themselves. And so this is what it kind of looks like when we turn on this FAMES, and FAMES stands for Field Asymmetric Ion Mobility uh, Spectrometry. 
And so we have different voltages that we step through. Um, and NF is no fame. So you can see with no fames, everything kind of elutes out in one big peak. And maybe there's a little tiny shoulder here. But when we step through different voltages, we can get selectivity and start separating out different RNA um, species uh, in the mass spectrometer, which more or less corresponds to their size as well, um, and charge state distribution. So we kind of get a charge and a size separation um, in the gas phase with this ion mobility. And because we are able to enrich for species that are, are really low level, if we just throw everything in at the same time, um, what we see is an increase in their fragmentation spectra. So here's a spectrum of, of two RNA oligonucleotides um, with FAMES off, no FAMES, or with the FAMES on, you can see we, much get, we get much more fragments uh, with the FAMES on. So the sensitivity increases. And if we get more fragments for our MSMS spectra, we get more scoring um, uh, uh, species that we can identify. And so here's again, here's our computational program, this NACE nucleic acid search engine scoring. Here's uh, with the no FAMES, um, here's with the FAMES on, we see many more species and with much higher scoring distributions. This allows us to dig deeper into the data and detect many more modifications. I think there's just a tRNA digest um, than we can with no FAMES and then um, you know, just get much better sequence coverage and quantification of these species as well by mass spectrometry. In the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, some new chromatography that we're uh, developing as well. Um, we use a lot of C18-based chromatography, but then we have to derivatize the oligonucleotides. And you know, uh, while that works, uh, we've also, in parallel, been working on a different type of chromatography, um, polygraphite carbon chromatography. And this has been used for a lot of, of hydrophilic species. But what's interesting about this chromatography is that you can apply a charge um, to this chromatography and create kind of electrochemical field that will then retain different molecules, such as RNA. And then with a polarity switch, you can uh, elute the RNA off. And this is actually the basis for a lot of RNA biosensors. Um, they use this kind of principles of adding kind of a, a voltage onto this uh, polygraphite carbon material. So we thought, well, can we add this, uh, do this type of electrochemical elution um, but in an LC, um, you know, liquid chromatography kind of format. And so if we have a trapping column that has the graphite carbon, the idea is, you know, can we load and trap RNA um, and then elude it out with a polarity switch change that we would, you know, put a voltage right here before it gets into the mass spectrometer. And so here's a proof of principle. We've loaded RNA onto um, one of these polygraphite carbons at a specific um, voltage. Um, and when we start uh, the HPLC gradient, we can see that there's very little RNA species that are eluded. But once we have a polarity switch and have the same gradient increase, you see everything kind of elutes out. And this is kind of shown here in the in the heat map. You, you do get some RNA species that elute, but once you have the polarity switch, you really elute them all out. So you can trap and elute RNA species into the mass spectrometer. And the last piece of data I'll show is just kind of a further uh, characterization of this process. So we have kind of our um, electrochemical elution RNA trapping, and then we're going to, you know, increase the voltages. And so we've been playing with just stepwise increase, increasing the voltage. And you can see um, that we have different species that we trap and elute into the mass spectrometer. And it really does trap and elute based on um, the RNA size. So you can, the lower voltages trap some lower RNAs and kind of step through and, and you know, get selectivity of different RNAs um, that are eluded. And so when we kind of combine the stepwise voltage with a, with a continuous HPLC gradient, um, we get very nice separation of a lot of different RNAs, more or less on size as well. Um, it allows us to dig much deeper into the, the data, sequence a lot more oligonucleotides, including many more modifications. And so now we're hoping in the future to kind of combine this with the ion mobility is kind of like the ultimate platform for sequencing and characterization of RNA oligonucleotides. And this just kind of shows that we get, you know, very, very good um, sequencing, uh, you know, through the mass spec data. So, um, yeah, really quickly, I just kind of wanted to share, you know, some of the things that we're working on. Um, there's a lot of challenges for RNA analysis by mass spectrometry, but the upsides are enormous, being able to detect a lot of different modifications, including novel modifications and do it pretty quantitatively as well, but that's going to involve a lot of improvements to liquid chromatography, the fragmentation approaches, um, and even some out-of-the-box thinking, um, you know, potentially, you know, ion mobility spectrometry and, and some other, you know, you know, potential new chromatography, such as this electrochemical elution chromatography, 
to just try to help improve um, the dynamic range um, and the selectivity of the mass spectrometer uh, for sequencing RNA species and, and detecting the different mod post-transcriptional modifications that are present. And we're continuing to build on a lot of these um, um, you know, platforms that we've established um, with the goal of just sequencing longer and longer RNA transcripts. Right now, we're kind of topping out at a, probably like a 30 or 40 mer oligonucleotide, but we'd like to go a lot, a lot longer um, and detect even more modifications, lower level ones as well. So with that, just want to thank um, you know, everyone for the opportunity to present in this workshop and looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for an exciting talk. Uh, we'll move on with the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Shuo Huang. He's a professor at uh, Nanjing University. His research interests are in single molecule sensing applications using engineered biological nanopores. All right, so can you see the slides? Okay, yeah. so I'll just go ahead. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone. Uh, so I'm Shuo Huang, I'm a professor from Nanjing University. Uh, so first, I'm really uh, delighted to have this opportunity to talk uh, with everyone about our recent pro progress in nanopore sensing of rival nucleotides and their epigenetic modifications. So this is actually me, my expertise is only nanopore. And uh, uh, like this is today's outline. So I will just take a very short time to explain what nanopore is and how it can sequence DNA and RNA. And then particularly important, I will talk about this kind of new concept that people are not familiar with. It's called single nanopore single molecule chemistry. And then how it could be helpful to identify different uh, RNA and NMPs. So uh, the nanopore concept is very straightforward. Uh, like you have a pore and then you have a pair of electrodes. You can drive your analyte uh, electrically or, or even by diffusion to, through the pore, you will get uh, its, uh, its characteristic events. So this is the first data that I produced when I was an independent PI. So this is a molecule passing through the pore and this is another. But normally a nanopore uh, sensing scenario that produce this kind of signal doesn't give you too much information. So people are more interested to, to develop like high, uh, more developed uh, nanopores so that it can sequence DNA or RNA so that it can provide more information. So the first uh, nanopore in the world is biological nanopore. And the first biological nanopore is this alpha hemolysin pore. It's very stable and robust, and it could be easily prepared by like uh, prokaryotic expression. And later people develop more, many, many more pores. Uh, and then eventually they form a very big family. So my expertise is with this kind of nanopore called MSPA. Uh, and uh, with MSP, actually, we can do like so many things uh, and has a very high dynamic range from like a small proton to uh, like a tRNA. So you can do like a, a lot of stuff, but today our focus is on RNA. So before I talk about RNA sequencing, uh, I think just now people already talked about our nanopore sequencing. So this is an MSP nanopore. I used MSPA, I did some engineering of it and then I produced a DNA sequencing signal uh, in the beginning. And then this is what a DNA sequencing signal look like from uh, this nanopore. And if you use using like an Oxford nanopore device, you will produce pretty much the same thing. So you might be very surprised if you have only four DNA bases, why do you produce like so many different uh, combinations of signals? And the reason is because this nanopore doesn't have a sufficient spatial resolution to resolve each individual DNA or RNA base. So uh, later, Oxford Nanopore uh, announced this kind of uh, RNA sequence, direct sequencing technology, uh, but still, it's, it's still ex experiencing the same problem. You still can't deconvolute uh, like RNA one base at a time. So uh, the signal you get is still like that. Uh, and if you zoom in into the detail, you will find it's still very complicated and it requires a lot of efforts of bioinformatics to deconvolute its original sequence. So when you have like epigenetic modifications, this situation is getting even worse because your epigenetic modification will contribute to your analytical signal uh, and produce like unpredictable uh, uh, like event features. 
So now that's why we need like a new concept. So uh, back to 1997, my postdoc advisor, Hagen Bailey, uh, started this kind of approach called nanopore single molecule chemistry. So normally people just treat a nanopore like that as a pore, but actually he started a kind of concept to engineer this pore so that it can have a reactive site inside in the middle of the pore. So this demonstration is like chemical binding between a zinc ion and uh, the amino, amino acid side chains like that. So then they will produce like small and tiny amplitude uh, nanopore signals. So corresponding to bonding and dissociation of this kind of uh, metal ions. So at that time, uh, people believe that actually it, because you analyze very small, so your signal is always very small. Uh, and people didn't like, proceed to further develop this technology. But actually, uh, we actually discovered uh, pretty much by accident that a nanopore that can sequence DNA at the same time, it's a perfect nanopore reactor. So this is the MSP nanopore. And if you engineer this site uh, to have like a single amino acid side chain that is reactive, uh, so you can actually observe like chemical reactions uh, in a very precise manner. So for example, this is a methylene. Uh, you can actually uh, like put tetrachloride into your system and then they will bind to the methylene and eventually will oxidize the methylene into sulfoxide. So this kind of reaction actually takes three steps. So you can observe each individual, individual step uh, like in an atomic, uh, atomic resolution manner with no problem. And to my surprise, these events look so big. It's like maybe a few tens picograms or even larger. Uh, considering that your analyte is still very small. Uh, why is that so big? It's because your MSP nanopore is actually focusing a lot of ionic current into like a tiny spot. So you amplify your signal so that you can get more information. So when this paper is published, a lot of people ask me the same question. So what is the significance of this work? So the significance is not to observe this reaction. It's because actually you have observed a pore that can, that can report exceptional atomic resolution. So later, uh, then further, uh, I actually started like a different approach. I want to uh, just uh, detect very difficult to separate stuff like saccharides. You might be surprised, like why are you talking about saccharides in an RNA meeting? Well, later you will figure out why. But actually these saccharides are very similar or are almost identically similar uh, in the molecular weight. So sorbose, fructose, galactose, and mannose, they have exactly the same molecular weight. So I have to use like a special engineering technology to make this ball to behave even better. So we've developed this kind of heterooctima MSBA. So this is a heterooctima. And we can, because it's a heterooctima, so we can actually modify this site with a sole modification site. So this is a phenylboric acid. And then the phenylboric acid will bind with almost any kind of saccharides and produce a unique signal. So this is a phosphorus. Remember that, and then later you see like fructose, they are quite different. And then later galactose. Considering that it's producing like so much different distinct signals, you can actually put all every different kind of uh, monosaccharide through this pool and you can get like extremely high resolution data. So this is actually the first night we got success. My students and I were very happy. So I recorded this moment using my cell phone and you can actually see from the screen, this kind of events. These are based on chemical reaction between your analyte and your pore. And if you do like proper uh, treatment of your data, you can see that even for monosaccharides that have almost identical uh, like molecular weight, they can be 100%, almost 100% separated uh, with no problem. And then later we realized that we can use that to identify different RNA uh, like NMPs. So in 2022, you probably uh, see this kind of journal cover from Nature Nanotechnology. It's from our work. And then you also see this kind of research highlights and news and views. We are also discussing the same thing. So in principle, we were using exactly the same technology that we used to detect different monosaccharides to do like RNA modification detection. So this is the same hetero, uh, heterooctima MSPA. It's modified with uh, phenylboric acid. It's very easy and very efficient. And then later, this phenylboric acid will react with this ribose part of the RNA, uh, like nucleoside monophosphate, in a highly reversible manner. 
So basically you are observing like binding and dissociation of like a nucleoside monophosphate uh, to the pore and dissociation from the pore. So this is the raw data that we produced. So uh, considering that you have like four different bases, uh, G, C, A, and U, they will produce like four different distinct signals and they have no overlap at all. So basically if your analyte is 100% pure and by mixing these four together, you will get almost 100% uh, like uh, accuracy without any problem. And then uh, to demonstrate, like we are definitely using exactly the same pore to do this kind of uh, discrimination job. Uh, we use the same pore and we just keep adding different analytes into your system. Uh, so the first one we did is C, and then later we put U inside and you can see this separation and then A and G. So there's no problem at all for like discrimination of these four diff uh, different RNA bases. Then if we have this kind of resolution, then why not just go ahead and do epigenetic modifications? So these are the epigenetic modifications that we can get uh, either commercially or by synthetic uh, like equivalent. And uh, uh, so altogether we have tried like 14 NMPs and their overall accuracy about 99.6%. So the more you can include, uh, there will be like a slightly drop of your accuracy because some of them might be like slightly overlapping. And the speed uh, for detection, like in minutes, uh, you will get like uh, this kind of accuracy and the efficiency with no problem. So here, uh, I think it's very straightforward to just show you the data that, ex that has excited us a lot. So this is the raw data without any treatment. Uh, based on your naked eye, you can actually see how different they are. And uh, especially for like M1A and M7G, they always behave like a very deep blockage current. Uh, but for like uh, other epigenetic modifications like M6A and M1A, they all can also be easily recognized by even your naked eye or a machine learning algorithm. Uh, so uh, to, to prove that this kind of epigenetic modification can be discriminated from their canonical basis, uh, you can actually do like this kind of side-by-side -side comparison using exactly the same nanopore. So if we mix uh, C and M5C, so you can see this kind of separation and G and M7G and, and many others. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you are convinced that you can use that to recognize different epigenetic NMPs. So when we submit this, uh, this manuscript to Nature Nanotechnology, uh, like our referees are generally very friendly and very supportive, but they give us like a different task that we didn't do before. So they want us to show like how we can deal with natural RNA, like, like the whole stuff has to be completely natural. So, uh, and then we tried like something simple. Uh, this is a yeast tRNA phenylalanine. Uh, according to this uh, map, you can see there are so many different epigenetic modifications. So we can use enzyme to degrade that into different NMPs and put the whole mixture into your nanopore sensor. Then this is the raw data that we have produced. This colored coded uh, dots corresponds to the data that we know or like we have previously recorded before. So these uh, black dots, uh, we mark that as UT1 and UT2, UT3. So we have actually four uh, like clusters of events that we have never seen before. And eventually we realized that it corresponds to the M2G, M22G, T and Y. So there are two that we can't detect because these two has modification on the ribose uh, hydroxide group. So uh, it can also do quantitative. So this is the measured value and uh, the true value comparison. You can see as that is producing like pretty uh, like accurately the, the, the epigenetic modification and space composition uh, in a highly quantitative manner. And it's matching with your true value very well. So, uh, Recently, we also further developed this technology so that actually we can use exactly the same core to measure different NMPs, NDPs, and NTPs, and the, even there are different combinations of epigenetic uh, based, uh, like, uh, 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 like, uh, and like this kind of little ties. So this is the raw data uh, that show this kind of simultaneous discrimination and the statistic in a scatter plot. So to summarize, actually we are developing uh, like a technology that can almost 100% accurately uh, identify different NMPs and their epigenetic modifications. Uh, so um, we are not yet there with sequencing, but uh, I think we are pretty close to that. 
And also eventually I would like to thank uh, my students uh, and my lab members and also the funding bodies uh, for their support. And thank you. Uh, also, if you are interested in, in Nanopores, uh, we can give them to you like on this platform for almost for free. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shu, for another exciting talk. Uh, we'll move forward with our next speaker, okay. the last speaker of the session. Uh, Marcus Teuber is the principal machine learning researcher at Oxford Nanopore Technologies, where he has been leading a team to develop tools and models to investigate and detect modified bases from raw nanopore signal and how we can use, and he has been helping several researchers around with uh, using the technology for understanding disease and genetic disorders. Without further ado, Marcus. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, talk to everybody. Um, um, yeah, I'm really excited about all the, the work that I've been hearing about here and uh, uh, all the work, uh, the emphasis, especially on all these different uh, tasks that everybody's talking about. I, I think my talk will hopefully uh, uh, synergize quite well with all of those, uh, those topics. Um, all right. Wait for this thing to work here. Cool. Um, yeah, so I've spent a lot of time uh, in, in my six years in Nanopore uh, working on DNA modification. So we're going to go over where that's led us uh, and the state of play of how we detect modified bases in Nanopore. Um, and then some some uh, the other recent RNA upgrades that are uh, soon to come um, and where we're going with RNA modified base detection. Um, a quick intro, I think most people know, oh, got a little messed up here. <laughs> um, that uh, you can directly tech, detect modified bases from the ionic current. Um, and so the current state of play is that we, we have really good direct detection of methylated bases and we have really good models for DNA bases of 5MC, 5HMC. Um, and a lot of people in the community are introducing uh, models for lots of other things. Everything you get with Nanopore comes along with this. So unrestricted read length, flexible approaches and real time uh, sequencing. Uh, so the, one of the big work that I've been working on for the past uh, about two years is uh, this Remora algorithm. Uh, so this latches on to so this Remora fish is the fish attached to the, the shark here, so the, how we named it. So the bigger fish is the base caller and the modified bases latch on. Uh, so the Remora algorithm latches on to the base caller and performs a different task of modified base and actually separates it from the base calling task. Uh, goes along with a the big theme that we've heard a lot about is that it separates the samples you can use for uh, training the base caller from training the modified bases, which is really important. Um, and it takes very little time over the regular base callers and feeds off those outputs. Um, so just as a high overview of how Remora works, you can see in the top here is an example signal of a full read. Uh, for our CPG model, we go in and find where we have a CPG call within that, and you pull out that little bit of signal. So that importantly, what goes into the model is what you see right there. Let's see if I can get this. So on the bottom here is the se sequence and the top is the signal. So it's just this little slice of this big read that goes into the model. And that means that that, that little bit of signal is the only thing that we need to match in a training sample. So that's really important for introducing really complex uh, samples into tr training modified bases in the Nanopore base caller. And we get these high accuracies from this. Uh, we also employ uh, scaling to give us a little bit more accuracy here. All right. So one of the big themes that we've heard so far, and this is these are all for our DNA, but I think a lot of this translates to RNA modified base training here, uh, is the data types are super important. Uh, so these are the main five data types that we use. Uh, so we have the synthetically created oligonucleotides that we've talked about here. Um, and we also have synthetic randomers. So here I'll go into this in a bit more, but where you have random stretches of bases either side of a, of a known modified base in a small context. Uh, and then we have the biologically derived, obviously, native, uh, enzymatic modified bases, and second strand doping uh, that have different advantages and disadvantages for training and, and modified base detection. All right, so the, modified, the, the biologically derived, native, that's what we want, right? We want to be able to detect all of this in native samples. That's the, that's the goal. Um, but they contain mixed modified bases and no concrete ground truth. Um, I would even challenge before we said that in DNA, we know the modified base of a cell, even in a cell line, you get a single site in the genome that's 50% modified in a completely homo uh, homogeneous pool of cells. So why is that, right? It, it, the, even the simplest cell lines are still complex, even in DNA. Um, second strand doping, again, so a, a, a little bit complex. We have modified bases in all contexts, but we don't actually know where the individual modified bases are. Um, so it's useful for some tasks of training and not for others. Uh, finally, enzymatic, where we've, so we've used this a lot for uh, 5MC and 5HMC detection 
where you just get every C in a CG converted to 5MC or 5HMC. Uh, so our, our analytics group has done a lot of work to get this reaction really highly accurate there. All right, the synthetically created, these have been really important for us. Um, the synthetically modified oligonucleotides are really important to show that we, what our accuracy is. Um, the, even the ground truths in, in alternative assays are not accurate enough for us to know what our accuracy is. Uh, so we had to use samples like this to show that we have higher accuracy than bisulfite sequencing. Uh, and then finally, this is sort of our holy grail of training samples is this randomer. Uh, the problem with a randomer is that you don't actually know the, the canonical sequence. Um, so we've used our duplex sequencing where you sequence both strands of this molecule you can see up in the top. So you get the random canonical sequence and now you know where your modified base is within that. So this is really an important sample for us for training data sets and really important around the remora that we can take a tiny slice out of this as our base callers are trained off of much larger chunks of three to 500 bases. And you just can't have good solid ground truths for three to 500 base pair chunks. So we can get 50, 60 base pair chunks with these randomers. All right, I'm going to go through the DNA models relatively quickly um, as, as they're, uh, I think, of less interest to this group, but uh, hopefully of some interest. Uh, so the big one that we released in, in December was a 5MC plus 5HMC, so two modified bases at once. This is sort of where we're moving to detect multiple modified bases, and this is obviously incredibly important in, in RNA. But the problem becomes harder, right? It's easier to tell two things apart than it is to tell three things apart. Um, so we do take a little bit of a hit in accuracy, but if you collapse that back down and look at it like you would by sulfite, we still get the same accuracy out of that. Um, and again, you can see in our uh, oligo printed oligonucleotides that we have real, this is how we measure all of our accuracies that we quote are all from printed oligonucleotides. So not from an enzymatic sample and not from our training data. These are completely held out of our training to get these accuracy numbers. Um, and we can also, the, the, we get a slightly lower accuracy, but we get really good when you get these highly modified, you can see in the top is the ground truth printed. So these are sort of, we wanted to show how good we are when we get a more real life sample. Um, when you get HMC and 585MC, the M is, is and I'm in the weeds a bit here, but M is 5MC and H is 5HMC. Um, and you can see that even when they're densely connected to one another and, and the signal is obviously affected across, we, as we've heard from several people, um, you can still detect them with really high accuracy, over 90% accuracy on the single read, single base level, um, not stacking up over read. This is on the single read level that we're still over 90% accuracy in these really complex samples. Um, and, and even beyond that, so you can show the initial one that we released a year ago on the R9 uh, pore, the KIT-10, we were slightly behind by sulfate seeking. Now with the R10 chemistry that we're really moving towards for DNA, um, we're a, a good chunk better than the accuracy we see from bisulfite. So we took these same ground truths and sent them off for sequencing uh, for bisulfite. And we, we're showing that we're better than, than bisulfite. So we're really excited about that. Um, so again, this is sort of where we're looping in a little bit more into the RNA modified bases is, is getting these all context models. So the, the enzymatic samples were used to train where we could modify every C in a CPG to be 5MC. Um, and much harder is getting a fi getting 5MC with a ground truth in every single context. Obviously, it won't be every single, you know, we're never going to get every single 50 mer. There's just the combinatorics gets too big. Um, but you can get a, a sampling of that from these randomers where you print it with random bases and then you can derive the sequence um, and train models. And we've seen really good results from that. We haven't released these models yet, but we're coming very soon with the 5MC um, and the accuracies are looking very good. Uh, same, same idea for 6MA. Um, we're getting really good detection of 6MA on these on the ground truth printed samples. Uh, yeah, sorry, same on 6, that was 5MC, 6MA, we're again seeing really good modified base detection. We've also just shout out to the developers at IGV for these visualizations of modified bases and, and everybody working on the, the file formats behind this has been a huge effort for the last you know, five, five, six years. Um, and finally, uh, getting looking at new modified bases that we can't get uh, models for as easily. So this is a, showing 8-oxo-G up here at each of these sites, and you can see shifts in the signal. The, the red is modified and the black is, is canonical um, of these oligonucleotides. And these, when you start getting into more complex modified bases, you get you could run into issues. So we end up with uh, actually missed base pairing into an 8-oxo-G. So we were wondering why we were getting the wrong base in the middle here. And it was actually because the wrong base was incorporated. And so it was calling the right base. And we had to fix our training data to have the correct base there in, in the randomers. So they, it, gets, it does get quite complex. Um, so we had some upgrades to this Remora software. Um, some of these are, are these are pretty uh, boring for the most part, um, but makes Remora work a bit better. So this was released in December. 
Um, importantly, we have simplified training. So the signal comes from one file, the base calls come from another, and that's how you create and train. It's really two files, and that's really how we create our training data sets is the signal files, the base calls map to the reference, and that produces your training data sets. We've really tried to simplify this down as, as well as we could. Um, we've also, this is just a, a little, I, I, I you know, love little bits of nanopore, and we can actually sequence both strands of the thing and get duplex sequences, so you can actually get the status of modified bases on both sides, so we can actually really detect single molecule uh, hemimethylation. Uh, I just think that's very cool, less applicable to RNA, um, but very cool. Um, yeah, so coming soon, I was hoping to get this uh, upgrade released before coming here. Um, this was, this uh, meeting was a good uh, kick in the butt for me to, to get working on RNA again. Um, but we got we have per read signal of signal visualization, so you can get these plots from the command line with one command. You pass in your pod five and your and your uh, mapped BAM. You get these signal visualizations. Uh, you can highlight different motifs of interest, um, and you can also pull out every single read in here and the levels that you get from this all from this new API. Um, and you can also, so this is allow, allows users to quickly um, produce tests. So this is just a simple t-test on the level means from each read. And you can quickly see that you, the, the, the modified bases at these CG sites quickly pop out from a simple t-test. Um, but for RNA, we're probably going to need a little bit more than that. But this interface will make it much easier for users to um, work on that. Um, so direct RNA sequencing, what everybody else here is really interested in, jump into the, the good parts here. Um, to everybody sort of, I don't think I need to go too much in, but RNA, direct RNA sequencing, uh, we do second strand synthesis and attach adapters that sequence just the RNA from the three prime to the five prime end. Um, and all of, again, the big advantages of, of, of nanopore sequencing come right along with uh, RNA bases, um, and, and we're looking into that. So again, this is the big one coming that I've been working on a lot recently. I'm trying to iron out the bugs. We should have this really soon released is visualization of RNA signal. Um, from from the remora so from the api and from the command line we can get these and you can get start to get your stuff right from the simple pod the signal file and the bam right all of that comes in um from from really simple commands you can get really powerful results and people can build off of this um so here's a couple this is actually from the nanocompore adrian ledgers at ebi and uh you and bernie's lab uh this is work they did uh, that's publicly available um we reanalyzed it recently um, and you can see, again, red is the modified bases with each of these at the different sites here. Um, but you can see the red and the black starting to separate at these particular positions, but there's much more signal in there than just the, the shifts that you're seeing there um, that we're looking to pull out. Um, so this is really just, again, the, the, the new beginning um, of RNA modified base detection. And with that, um, this was presented in December. Um, so nothing particularly new here, but really excited about this new RNA kit that's coming out. Um, I'm not production, I'm in, I'm in the research, so I don't know the exact release date of this or when this is gonna get into users' hands, but really soon we're gonna be getting um, the much, you can get much more data with much less input and much faster and the signal is much cleaner. Um, so we're also from the release kit right now, uh, we're getting much higher accuracies. Um, so really excited for, so 3X improvements in output quantity uh, with 10X reduced input and you get much more accurate bases. Uh, so we're really excited for this reboot of RNA um, and especially excited to hear this crowd and what everybody's going to do with it. Um, yeah, just quick summary of the, the models we have built into Dorado, the new base caller, um, the all context 5MC and 6MA. And I think those have a lot of lessons that we can put towards RNA modified bases um, and the upgrades that we're, that we're looking at in RNA. Um, so real quick, just sort of like my RNA uh, wrap up. So my mom's a real estate agent. So the first rule of real estate is location, location, location. First three rules of, of training modified bases is sample, sample, samples. Um, the algorithms are great, uh, but it's really about robust samples. And I'm really happy that that's a point of emphasis here. Um, robust ground truth samples and then modified base content matching the target. Um, at Nanopore, we're going to release models that are really robust. They have to be robust because they have to work for a ton of different situations. But we also, I think, really importantly, want to enable the community um, to be able to train these models from simpler samples. So if you have a really specific motif, that doesn't make sense for us to release that one because it's so specific. It's hard to communicate that we have 20 models for 20 different specific motifs or, or, or actions, but we want to make it easier for the community to develop those models and have them as high accuracy as we have them when we release them. Um, so looking at things like the modification, modification diversity and proximity, calling three mods right next to each other is different than calling one modification in isolation. You have to be aware of that. Uh, diversity of modified bases, tRNA is probably going to be a, a dedicated solution where you have five mods right next to each other that are all different. That A mod that detects 6MA by itself won't work for that. 
Um, single and multi-read, do you want to look for a particular site? Do you need per read? What accuracy is needed to answer your biological questions? These are all things that I think are really important to flesh out with this group. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the potential algorithm improvements, but sample, sample, samples first. And thank you for everybody. Thank you, Marcus. You can take a seat here. <laughs> We now have time for questions. Uh, I'll be starting with the questions online, but uh, feel free to come over. First question is uh, from a committee member. How can the field be expanded so that there is competition for direct sequencing technology? So the questions being asked are broadly for all the panel members. Uh, anybody can uh, choose to answer. Let's see if somebody online wants to <laughs> jump in first. <laughs> You want to go ahead, please, if you have a question or anybody. Sorry, answer. <laughs> no, can, can you repeat it? Because it, it, it actually um, fainted in the middle. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Question is gone now online. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to try to formulate it. So I believe the question was uh, what kind of competition should be uh, brought out among the other companies so that there is competition for nanopore sequencing so that there is more uh, developments in this broader area? I probably butchered the question a little bit, but the general context is. I, I guess briefly that I would suggest that we're just competing. I mean, at, at nanopore, obviously competing internally, um, that we want to improve things um, and that there is a, a, de a new dedicated focus on RNA and that we are very, I, I've, I coming my background, I worked at mod encode and, and, and worked at RNA, you know, a lot of RNA studies. And I'm very excited that, that we're have a dedicated pushback on RNA. Um, so that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but I think some internal competition from, from us inside nanopore. Uh, to improve the technology. I'm excited that we're, we're, we're doing that now. So this timed up well for that. <laughs> Any other panel members who want to add to this? I don't hear any, uh, so let's move forward. The next question, or there's a, there, yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, I have a question for Eva and another question for Marcus. Uh, for Eva, I, I think uh, your slide show very good uh, performance for detecting the M6A. We see a lot of uh, slides uh, showing that. Uh, how about the others uh, modification? Uh, because we can see a few selected example showing the, uh, the signal change or the error profile change um, with knockout or without knockout. Those looks good. But how about the genome or transcriptome wise evaluation? Uh, what would be the second best or the third best? Um, uh, yeah, that's my questions for Eva. Uh, and the questions for Marcus is the, uh, well, when we consider uh, detecting to detect the uh, RNA modification from the very raw data, that means that we have to keep the raw data in our hard drive. Well, that's a huge size of raw data. I think it's a few hundred gigabytes per RNA seq data. So, uh, so any possible solution your your company are thinking about to to solve this problem yeah probably eva first okay so yeah thank you very much uh, for the question so yeah so uh we did test it transcriptome wide and i mean the igv snapshots of course are always of uh, some selected examples right actually the way of selecting is is because we chose examples that are high stoichiometry, so they are visible, right? Because most of the M6A sites actually are low stoichiometry, so by eye would be hard to even see. But you, that's why I added the densities, which kind of showed that we are finding a, a median of like a 10 percent, let's say, uh, modification stoichiometry across all sites, right? Uh, so some are highly modified, some are lowly modified, and median. But that that was by there was a distribution, right? And then in the knockout, we were seeing like something like one percent, which is probably our false, uh, our, our median false positive error. Uh, or the fact that there's some background in the knockouts, which is also a discussion that Sami Jaffrey was bringing up as well in parallel and in, in, in a different uh, publication, right? So um, because some of these knockouts, uh, we're actually even using publicly available data, right? So um, I, I didn't generate myself actually the knockout that I, I, I showed the data for. I used public data to, to illustrate the example, the usage of the base color. Um, so, so that was with respect to the 
applicability to transcriptome wide. I think it is applicable transcriptome wide. Um, that's one point. And the other is about the applicability to other modifications. It kind of depends on, uh, you know, like a bit on the training sets that you have. So, uh, so this is actually like, I don't know. So we've been testing other things, for example, like we've been testing, for example, S4U as an alternative example, but then there's other modifications that uh, maybe are more tricky to generate ground truth or, or, or even to generate them in, in, into any kind of synthetic con context, right? So I think that, um, that, that basically for the limitation is uh, at the moment in, 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 in the generation of some data set, right? I think that what we have could work for other modifications as long as you had decent training sets. Thank you, Eva. Yeah, real quick for, I mean, nanopore, the storage, it, the, the data is in the raw signal. Um, so if you want to take advantage of improved algorithms, there's not a whole lot we can do. And, and, and there is extra data in the raw signal itself. So even storing just the signal intensity levels for each base, right? It, you're going to lose information because then you can only apply the HMM type approaches. And if, you're if your reference improves and you want to match to a new reference, right, and, and put signal levels on a new reference, you can't do that, right, if, you, if you've thrown away the data. So I, it, the thing I think is mostly the really important samples that you can't reproduce, hold on to the raw signal. For data, that it, that's one of our big, even internally, right? We struggle with our, our data queue and, and our servers. We keep the important samples around and we reproduce the ones that are easier to reproduce. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of questions online as well. So we're going to alternate between online and uh, in person. So the next question is from a committee member. The goal to sequence single molecule transcripts and map modifications will take time and resources. What are the short term opportunities? What milestones can be achieved in a year or two? Is there the market where there to reach these uh, milestones? I don't know if I can answer that one, but to expand on it is what are the, the highest impact things? Um, I, the, the easiest thing to say is, you know, M6A and everything, pseudo in every context, and those are hard. Um, so what are the, what are the uh, defining? I think that's really important here is defining what are the next steps? What, what would be the most useful small step, right? So that, that we don't have to hold on and wait for the, the perfect thing that works everywhere. We can work on what the next small steps. I don't know what those are. Um, I, I work on the algorithms for the most part, have a, have a past in, in working in the, the, the field, but, um, yeah. So knowing what the most high impact for the most people I think is really important. Anybody, anybody else on the panel want to answer that? Uh, here none, so we'll move forward. So, so I'm going to go with the same uh, philosophy and ask questions, one from Marcus and one from, <laughs> from the academic lab. Um, so question for Marcus is there's, there's obviously a high number of RNA mods and the combinatorics of, of you know, detecting that within a context of another, uh, of not only one particular sequence, but also like all the other sequences gets enormously challenging. So what are, um, I guess, it would be nice to to know what what are the most important features signal features that actually contribute to various modifications so um i know you know with the machine learning you can extract those features and it would be nice to kind of uh to uh, to discuss that more i would say and then um i have a question for Huang, for Shua Huang. hi um this is many <laughs> um so my question is uh, regarding the rna modifications that you've detected and i think this is a very clever system with the boronic acid um, so there's, uh, you know, but this lends the, the, you know, kind of, you, you start thinking about exo sequencing where we basically digest, uh, you know, each base and then read it, uh, using the nanopore. And then the, the question then becomes how efficient is that, um, first of all, the capture process of a mononucleotide into a pore. But then the second question that you've kind of introduced here is, um, and, and I don't know what the answer is. That's why I wanted to ask you is what is the efficiency of the chemistry between the boronic acid and the, um, you know, the, the diol. So, uh, let's suppose you had one molecule that definitely went into the pore. What is the chance that it would actually interact with that boronic acid? And, and I, I'm not saying you have the answer or you, you should have the answer, but it's a good thing to consider because if it is very high efficiency, then one can consider, uh, um, exo type sequencing where we basically digest and detect. Uh, kind of like a mass spectrometry uh, with the nanopore. So I don't know. Long question, but <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I can go briefly. Um, I would say we're actually going the opposite direction. Instead of understanding the features, 
is matching the samples um, to what we want to detect, right? Matching the all context models to what we actually want to detect in the sample. Um, so it, it's a bit, it's not so much knowing, we don't need to know what the features are. We just need to know whether it's modified or not. <laughs> um, so letting the machine learning algorithm extract all the information that it possibly can um, and, and not trying to understand it, but matching the mod, the sample, sample, samples, matching the samples to this, the, what we want to detect. That, that To me, that's way more important than understanding it. We don't need to understand the molecular dynamics of what's happening exactly. We just need the most accurate modified base detection algorithms possible. That's my take on it, <laughs> whether that's yeah helpful or not. Yeah, so please, uh, there somebody yeah, on the panel. Sure, okay. sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, so I can answer a uh, question from many. So, you know, your voice is so unique. I can recognize your voice even if <laughs> I don't see you. <laughs> and also, um, so to answer your question, um, I think the uh, the big advantage of our strategy is that you can uh, recognize different RNA modifications almost without any uh, producing any error. I don't know how many uh, NMPs passing through the pool because if I don't detect it, I don't know whether it's passed or has been captured or not. So I don't know this answer, but I know uh, you can actually tune this capture rate by changing the pH. So in our Nature Nano paper uh, in the SI, we actually have uh, like a pH regulation. So if you move to like pH nine or even further, uh, your capture rate will be like a crazy, but your signal will be like more noisy. So that's why we choose like a more neutral pH in this demonstration. But if you're worried about capture rate, uh, well, we can always uh, like modulate this kind of capture rate efficiency by balancing its like signal to noise ratio and your capture rate. And regarding the uh, the exo sequencing uh, question, so I don't have an answer at this moment, but I think uh, if we do have uh, like a solid uh, like setup and a strategy to to match the exo exonuclease activity and this kind of capture rate, uh, I think at least it will be much more accurate and much simpler to detect different modifications than the current strand sequencing approach. But this read length or like sequencing speed, I'm not sure, uh, but we will see. And another advantage is that it can detect, like uh, basically you can do sequencing in a de novo sequencing manner. So even if you have like a, like a, a RNA modification that you have never dealt with, you don't have the database, you can detect a kind of a bizarre uh, signal that you have never seen. So uh, that actually produced like much more information than this current strand sequencing strategy, I think. So I hope this can answer your question, Manny. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank last you. questions. Uh, one question from the committee member. I'll try to make it a two part uh, because I am also interested in some. Are all modifications that have been identified in studies truly accurate? How can we reach better accuracy in our field? Uh, this also, bring, uh, uh, I'm going to make it much broader. Uh, as the number of modifications in a single base color increase, the accuracy of the base color drops. So what is a reasonable number of modifications that you think would be able to uh, be captured in a single base color? And what kind of resources would you need to be still be at a 98 or 19 kind of accuracy? Yeah, I think, I think that answer is probably different for everybody in this room. Um, I think everybody has what they want to use their the RNA modified base color for, um, and it, it, I think it really is about the biological question and answering your biological question with the right model um, and knowing what is your biological question. I think that's one of the problems is a lot of, especially with our DNA modif modified base color, people get it and it's free, and so they want to use it. And that's, we're getting to the point where that works with DNA, where you can just get it for free, go back later and say, oh, now I want to do a modified base study so I can do that. Um, I think for RNA modified bases, there's so many, there's such a wide diversity, that's a much harder task and that there do need to be specific models for everybody's task. Um, if you have tRNA, you have a tRNA specific model. If you have, you know, M6A in all contexts that, you know, maybe that's the first one we target that, that would be my, um, take. <laughs> Any other panel members want to take? Okay. Well, next question. Hi, uh, this question is for Ben, because I thought someone should ask a question about mass spec. <laughs> um, ben, that was an absolutely beautiful talk. And I was really, this is Kristen Kutmo, by the way, I was really um, interested in your IMMS work. In particular, we had at the beginning of this meeting, um, 
thought a little bit or someone asked the question, I actually think it was you asked the question about RNA shape. Um, and IMMS has traditionally, or not traditionally, has been used a lot to look at the 3D shape or overall fold of proteins akin to giving you information like SACs. Is there any thought about trying to use this sort of technology to do that with modified um, RNAs? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, definitely, ion mobility has has been used to, um, you know, on the protein side, other molecule side, um, to look at you know conformations and, and shape and and get very um, low res rough structures of molecules. So I, I think that could be a natural, definitely a natural next step. Um, the type of ion mobility we're using this FAMES is not the most highest resolution for that type of, of work. Um, and so probably couldn't use the type we use because that's really more, more for separation of charge state and, and, um, and size. Um, but there's other ion mobility with different gases and different ways you can do it that I think could definitely um, start picking away at um, rough structures and shapes. And you know if the modification is in the right place that affects the shape or structure, yeah, no, I, I think you can definitely do some um, work on the mass spec side to, you know, see the effect of post-transcriptional modifications on RNA. And is FAMES using a cyclic IMMS system or? A no, no, FAMES is just a front end uh, electrical system. So it has, um, yeah, it's a, it's a different type of ion mobility. And that's why it's lower res because the cyclic allows you to, um, you know, do multiple passes. Yeah, you could separate with forever. Them. Yeah, you can separate for a long time, and the longer you separate, the higher the resolution. And so that's actually where you want to go if you want to use ion mobility to, um, you know, look at shape, structure, small changes. I, I think that is the best bet. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, 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 well past our twelve uh, PM stop. So let's thank all the speakers. Cool. 12.15. Oh, sorry. So I didn't realize we have uh, more time. So <laughs> yes, it was my bad. Yes, okay. please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, also, another mass spec question for Dr. Garcia. Uh, we are also very interested in the work from Ryan Flynn out of the Bertozzi lab uh, on the possible uh, discovery of glycoRNA. And I wonder if you can elaborate more on uh, the source of the material that you, you showed there, the, of the source of the glycoRNA and any information you might have on those linkages um, and, and how is the detection done? I guess the confidence in your, in your results is, would, would be, I'd like to hear about your confidence in those results and um, what, uh, are you just detecting oxonium ions or, or how is that done? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, most of the work that I showed here and, and most for proof of principle, they're either from like HeLa or, or 293 cells. So I don't know exactly um, which of the two, um, the data I showed, I, I think it's probably 293 cells. And um, the linkage is, is a big question um, because um, we haven't solved that one yet. Um, as I kind of showed in the spectra, when we when we tried to kind of go in, we, we can tell it's a oligonucleotide, but it has um, a fairly large linkage on that. Not something small, but something probably you know, a couple hundred Daltons or so. Um, so what that linkage is, we haven't quite narrowed in on it. We're actually, we are working with Ryan right now um, on some things. So we, we're hoping to kind of um, be able to solve that. He's he's come up with some nice ways for in, to enrich these. Um, that data I did not show. This is just kind of data from, from cells. Um, but yeah, that is, that is a, a kind of a really big question is the linkage and one that we're not quite there yet, yeah. In terms of confidence, I mean, we've done a lot of controls and exper experiments, kind of didn't show a lot because we only had a few minutes, but, um, you know, we, we've done a lot to convince ourselves that this isn't some kind of like contaminant coming from like just free sugars or, um, you know, like a glycoprotein, you know, the postdoc I have working on this comes out of a big glycoprotein lab, Carlito Labria's lab. So he really kind of, you know, went through the steps to make sure that there's absolutely no protein contaminations at all in, in this RNA preps and, and other types of contamination. So we're, we're pretty confident um, from our end and what we've done and what I showed that, um, you know, what we're seeing are, um, you know, some type of, of um, glycan modified RNA. And then in separate work with, with Ryan, um, in his lab, um, 
you know, we, we see a lot of this, the same patterns as well. And he's using a completely uh, different approach uh, for enriching those uh, oligonu uh, those modified oligonucleotides. So we're, we're pretty confident that we are seeing uh, glycan-modified RNAs. Thank you, Ben. Uh, next question is from a committee member for Marcus. What's driving Oxford Nanopore uh, interest in sequencing RNA modifications? Um, I think what's driving it is this room. <laughs> um, people being interested in it, obviously. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, what's driving it is especially um, the, the renewed interest because um, we're, we're discontinuing the R9 pore. Um, and so the previous RNA technology was built off of the R9 flow cell. So since we're discontinuing that, it was a natural time um, to switch over and, and really dedicate the effort to do an RNA pour. Um, the RNA pour was built off of the R9 chemist, the R9 flow cell, and we developed an, R, uh, an RNA kit that that obviously was the DNA flow cell, right? It uses the same flow cell, which has a lot of advantages, but one of those isn't the highest accuracy RNA. Um, so the, the, the impetus for doing it now is, is uh, moving to the kit 14, the R10 flow cell for DNA, um, which doesn't perform as well as RNA. So re-engineering and really looking in the, the, the advanced research team has done an amazing work um, to look at the, the getting that accuracy bar up um, is a lot of work from, from a lot of different experiments internally um, to find the right pore for RNA. Um, so really excited for all of these algorithms um, that what we can do with this new lower, lower noise uh, system in RNA. So if I understood correctly, uh, Marcus, you said the speed of uh, sequencing has increased from 70 to 140 base pairs per second, the 10 times decrease in input sample, three times increase in throughput. Uh, what about the cost? <laughs> I am fortunately in research, so I can't answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question for the, for the Nanopore folks on the panel. So it seems like a major challenge going forward for de novo base calling of, of modifications is going to be training data sets. What do you guys think is the best way to address that? And I'm also thinking to our post lunch talks on things like oligos, oligonucleotide synthesis, you know, what would be the ideal way to address this? And maybe also what is the most practical way to address it? <laughs> Um, maybe I, I will maybe already, even though that the question is addressed to the nanopore people, I think that here actually uh, it should be a joint effort between nanopore people and mass spec people and solid phase synthesis or whoever people, right? Because for example, when we get an oligo, even in the case of synthetic oligos, right? Um, you make the assumption that uh, the that this, the oligo is modified 100%. And I personally think that's a wrong assumption. Um, actually, there was this paper by Shraga Svarts in AC4C where he actually took the time in col with collaborators to actually, you know, look into the AC4C modification levels. And what he found was 50%. And when we're actually training our models, we actually don't see 100%. So is it because our models are inaccurate or is it because the oligos actually are not 100% modified? Um, I actually think that it's maybe, I mean, I don't say the models are perfect, but I actually think that the modified sites are, on, you know, are not 100%. And this is actually a very important limitation. That's why the training sets that we use need to be orthogonally validated by mass spectrometry, in my opinion, because um, you know, like it's actually not um, as accurate as we think in terms of uh, stoichiometry. And here, because we get single molecule resolution, you actually want, you know, like if, if you label uh, read as modified and it's unmodified, that really messes up uh, the outcomes of the of the predictions because you, you're driving crazy the algorithm by incorrectly labeling it. Uh, so I think that this is an important thing worth discussing that I think needs to be a joint effort and uh, as a solution. And that's that's something that we're also looking internally is dealing with samples of, of lower like lower quality um, dynamically through training, removing uh, samples that might be incorrect um, to try and not steer the model towards those and, and make the model concentrate on those uh, incorrectly labeled samples. So, so building things like that into training, but no, it really is about the training samples. And I think that's why we've been pushing so hard on the DNA side uh, for these these synthetics, uh, the randomers to, to produce the training data sets for, for modified bases. And, and there are ways that we can sort of shoehorn that in for RNA. It is much more complicated. Um, RNA duplex is a much harder uh, uh, endeavor, um, but not impossible. Um, 
So, so we're looking into ways to, to adapt the randomer approach that, that is working for DNA now to work for RNA, but I definitely agree. Orthogonal validation is absolutely key. Um, and, and like I said, the native samples are generally what we want these things to work on, um, but the ground truths there are tricky, especially with RNA where everything is transient. Um, it, 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 yeah, it makes it much harder to, to get real solid ground truth uh, for RNA. Um, so that, yeah, that is the challenge and the excitement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the last question from a committee member. What are the modifications that we can feasibly sequence on, uh, reliably five years out, 20 years out? <laughs> I mean, all of them. It's just a matter of the effort to put into them, right? It's, all of them are feasible, um, it especially, I mean, for nanopore signal, it's in the signal, and the same is true, it's in, it's in the signal, right? Um, it's a matter of of what effort you want to put into each one, right? And that's why we're pushing to make it easier for the community to do it. Um, that we're going to push to to get the samples that you need for the way we do it, and then the how you would extend it um, for different types of samples, and, and knowing what's it what it's applicable to. But the signal is in there. We just want to make it as easy as possible for the community um, to to try and extend what the work that we're doing. Maybe uh, just elaborating a bit on synthetic standards. So you need a synthetic signal to develop the base colors. So not all modified RNAs are even available at this point as synthetic RNA molecules. So could you uh, elaborate a bit more on your randomer approach? What's the length of your randomers and how many modifications are embedded and how do you justify these are the perfect molecules that would capture the context? Yeah, no, they're per definitely not the perfect molecules. So, I mean, that we're, we're working very closely with uh, synthetic oligo printing companies. And I mean, even DNA, right? The 4MC is very hard to print with the phosphoamidite chemistry. So the, even DNA has lots of limitations. Um, it's not the perfect solution. It's it's the worst, it's the best worst solution we have so far. Um, yeah, that's, it's it's not perfect, um, but it's, it's something that applies to a lot of things. Uh, we just got kind of lucky that enzymatic CG is, Things most humans care about, and <laughs> we had a nice system to to, to springboard off of. Um, but yeah, I, I think there are definitely cha not challenges on on the synth synthesis side, and that's what yeah we're very excited to work with this, all the synthesis companies and and the ones that don't have public products. We're excited to work with everybody on that because it is really important. Yeah. Right. Let's thank all the speakers. Great. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'm going to quickly say that we're about to break for lunch. There has been a small issue with the lunch order. Uh, the company who we ordered from messed up pretty badly. So we think we have enough food, but we are not 100% sure um, if it is not if it is the case that we don't have enough food, um, which is possible. We might do a little rearranging of the schedule and try to get some more food in here after the next session um but we'll we'll do some checking first so we really apologize there was uh some miscommunication um but please grab food if you can <laughs> uh night camp to start our next session uh, yeah, thank you. Um, welcome back. Hope, uh, hope everybody was able to get some food and now we can get started again. Um, so my name is Keith Nykamp. I'm a senior director of genetics and data science with Invite Corporation uh, based in San Francisco. Um, Invite, just for those of you who don't know, is a large scale provider of genomic information, which is used by our customers for improving health uh, care decisions. Um, so I'm very excited to be moderating this next session uh, on the research and development around standards for sequencing and mapping RNA modifications. Um, as we've heard multiple times today already, when thinking about how we progress towards some complete mapping and sequencing of all possible RNA modifications, it's clear uh, the community will need a robust gold standard reference set of modifications with clear and concise quality metrics uh, for confirming the presence of new and existing chemical modifications through these experiments. Um, so with this in mind, we'll first hear from Shanfen Xiao, B. 
VP of R&D with TriLink Biotechnologies. Shanfeng will be discussing successful approaches and limitations of oligonucleotide synthesis with chemical modifications. Hello? Can anyone hear me? We can hear you and we can see you. Welcome. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Hello? Can you hear us? Hello, are you able to hear us? Why don't we start with Gia while we uh, uh, work on getting Champagne up and running? Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, so yeah, you, you, should, you well, should I start? Stop. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well, yeah. So um, we'll then move on to Xia Sheng, uh, associate professor at the RNA Institute in University of Albany. Xia will be sharing with us his work uh, synthesizing N four methylated cytidines and using these modified RNA, RNA oligos for structure function studies. All right. So screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so yeah, I'll start now. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Um, and it's a great honor to be here and share with you some of our work about n 4 methyl c um, so I'll also start from the essential dogma of molecular biology. And to this audience, I don't need to emphasize more about the key roles that RNA can play in gene regulation, environmental interactions, and also uh, in human diseases. Basically, they uh, are um, everywhere. And uh, the new view of RNA as essential actors in cell has also led to the great interest in RNA um, targeted drug di discovery. Um, so nature used two general strategies to diversify RNA structures and functions. One is through uh, chemical modifications and based on this model mix and our uh, RNA modification database um, located in our RNA Institute. Um, uh, there are over 170 or maybe more chemical modifications to decorate RNAs in all the domains of life. And, uh, and many of them play uh, essential roles in almost all the biological processes. And, and it's also believed that these modifications are the most evolutionarily conserved properties and uh, um, uh, relics from the RNA world where they may have enhanced the uh, chemical diversity of RNA prior to protein. And the other strategy is that they can fold themselves into well-defined uh, structures that are mainly stabilized by both Watson Creek and the non other non-clonical pairs, um, and also, also other tertiary interactions. Therefore, uh, studying um, chemical modifications and those base-base interactions in RNA is important for the further studies of their biological functions, the development of new uh, therapeutics and, uh, and the research in the uh, origin of life. So 
with this goal, um, my lab is working on a series of modifications from chemistry point of view. And uh, since I was trained as organic chemist, and uh, uh, those are a few examples of our recent work. We are particularly interested in the synthesis based pairing patterns, structures, and functions of those uh, uh, natural modifications. And we're also interested in developing new molecular tools based on this chemistry. So today I'm going to focus on this N4 methylation work and use this to lay out our working flow. So as you know, uh, methylation is the most abundant modification in RNA. And shown here uh, a variety of methylated residues found in all the regions of uh, tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs, as well as uh, messenger RNAs. And it's not surprising that many methylation work are closely associated with human diseases. For example, those M6A, M5C, and 2 prime methyl um, residue have been identified in SARS-CoV-2, affecting its overall uh, virality. And their unique right protein, such as RBM15, have been proposed as a COVID drug target. And some of them have been uh, used in RNA therapeutics uh, as N1 methyl pseudo U in the messenger in COVID vaccine. Overall, all, um, several methylated residues have been widely studied in terms of their de detections, sequencing, profiling, uh, structures, and the biological functions, but many of them. Uh, remain elusive. Um, so, all right. so, so we are interested in this M4C. Um, it's common in natural DNAs and play key roles in uh, gene regulation. In RNA, this um, M4C mainly exists in ribosomal RNA and has the function to stabilize its folding and protein interactions. The right enzyme RSMH methylate um, like uh, C to M4C and further to M4 to C. Recently, um, uh, metal 15 is found to uh, introduce M4C into human mitochondria 12S ribosomal RNA and is involved in mitochondria protein synthesis, providing a, a potential new drug target for the treatment of mitochondria disorders. In addition, M4-2C um, was uniquely detected in viral RNA from Zika and HZV viral and their infected uh, cells. So we would like to study their base pairing and the structural features in RNA. And since this N4 position directly uh, participate in the Watson Creek pairing, as shown here, um, one direct consequence of this uh, uh, methylated nuclear bases, their effect on base pairing stability and specificity. The single methylation might be uh, able to re either retain or disrupt the hydrogen bonding between C and G, depending on the conformation of the methyl group, while the dimethylated M42C should, be, should disrupt the CG pair with a different base uh, pairing pattern. And other mismatch pairing, like those uh, CT pair, could also um, like uh, uh, take place. In addition, the methyl group could also affect the enzyme interaction and the recognition since they are in the uh, major group. And so we, we started the work by synthesizing the two building blocks. Here is the uh, synthesis of M4C uh, phosphamidite uh, from the cellulated uridine, uh, the activating of the C4 um, position uh, followed by the treatment of methylamine and uh, the isolation provided this key uh, intermediate S3, which was selectively um, like decellulated, triturated, and finally converted to the, the amidite building block for the synthesis, uh, for the solid phase oligosynthesis. And uh, uh, similarly, we started the synthesis of this M42C. Uh, amidite from the dimethylation of cellulated cytidine. The compound was selectively uh, decellulated and converted to the final amidite uh, for the uh, uh, solid phase synthesis. Again, and both of the uh, building blocks are well compatible with the regular solid phase synthesis, uh, DNA synthesizer, and the purification conditions. And here shows a bunch of RNA sequences containing these two modifications. And uh, 
um, confirmed by OS uh, HPOC profile before the purification, showing the coupling yield uh, are very similar to those of the native strand. Then we did uh, base pairing stability and uh, specificity studies. Those uh, TM data showed that M4C remain a regular CG pairing and has a relatively uh, small effect on its pairing stability in RNA duplex. Then uh, the M42C disrupts the uh, the, the, the uh, CG pairing and the significantly decrease the duplex stability. This is also a uh, result in the loss of uh, um, base pairing discrimination of CG with uh, CA, CT, and the CC mismatch, um, as shown in those uh, like difference in the TM curves and also those uh, number here. Um, so, and we are very lucky to to get some good crystals and solve the structures for both modifications and here are the overall comparison of the backbone conformation and the molecular packing of each uh, duplex and i'm not gonna uh, go through the details of those data collection and refine uh, statistics just show you um, the density map and uh, uh, base pairing patterns of these two residues and all the methyl group are placed in the base plane as uh, and as expected, the single methylation has very minor effect on the geometry of the normal uh, CG pair, although the presence of the methyl group disable the M4 um, atom from forming another hydrogen bonding from the side of the major group, which could be important for RNA protein recognition. Uh, introducing a second methyl group caused more severe perturbation as shown here, to accommodate the two methyl group and avoid the steric uh, clash, the CG pair is shifted to a, a wobble-like uh, pattern with only two hydrogen bond. Um, so the shift also led to the big change in the uh, ramped down angles and uh, also slightly decrease of this uh, C1 um, distance, which also changed the overall stack interactions between the base steps. So this pattern indicates that this dimethylated um, like amino group in the structure may actually present as the uh, imenium uh, chitin on this C4 position. Um, as shown here, of course, it's also possible that this charged chitin from uh, form can switch to another pairing pattern, only uh, uh, like one hydrogen bonding under neutral or basic conditions. And then we conducted the MD simulations to study the dynamic properties of those hydrogen bonding patterns in the structure. This figure uh, shows the distribution of the hydrogen bonding numbers uh, between the base pairs, indicating that both C and M4C have normal average three uh, hydrogen bonds, but the double methylated pair has average 1.5 to two hydrogen bond, meaning that M, uh, for 2C exists as a mixture form in this duplex. And this figure just shows the average number of hydrogen bond for the, all the base pair in the duplex. And uh, um, indicating this structural perturbation caused by the dimethylation is mainly local uh, to the modified basis. And this also consists with our crystal structure studies. Um, then next, we studied the uh, impact of these two methylated residues on uh, reverse transcription using uh, this model uh, with uh, both native and modified RNA template using fluorescence gel. And when using AMVRT, which has uh, a relatively higher fidelity was, uh, was used in the system, the reverse transcription um, reaction completed in the presence of all the natural DNTPs with both native and uh, an N4C RNA template forming the same uh, forlance product. Well, uh, the M42C totally inhibit the MVRT activity and uh, shut down the DNA synthesis. When we use the HIV reverse transcript, uh, transcriptase, which has relatively lower fatality than MV, 
um, both M4C and M4C template can give full length product in the presence of all uh, natural DNTPs. That's, uh, um, uh, that's a native one, indicating the modification do not inhibit the HIV RT activity. And interestingly, both uh, methylated residue are able to decrease the, uh, the GTP incorporation, um, but increase the uh, TTP incorporation, especially uh, this uh, uh, M42C case. And so it can induce a potential G2T mutation during the first transcription. And this could also provide a, a potential way uh, to sequence uh, these residues, right? So although a more in-depth sequencing profiling and in vivo studies still needed, we can draw some preliminary conclusion here with our synthesized two building blocks. So M4, C can retain the regular CG pairing pattern, but M42C disrupt both uh, stability and the specificity. Um, both residue co could increase the CT pair and induce a potential G2T mutation during the reverse transcription using HIVRT. Um, when using AMVRT, the methylation could either retain or completely shut down the DNA synthesis. So this result indicating indicate that methylation at N4 position of the cytogen could be a molecular mechanism uh, to fine tune uh, base pairing specificity, affect the codon fidelity and increase the uh, mutation rate during uh, gene replication. And uh, we also did a similar study for a few other modifications like M3C, 5-hydroxomethyl C, 5-formal C and 5-cyanol uh, C and tRNA granulation. So for a long-term goal, I hope we can just make some contributions to this uh, uh, RNA IP structure uh, research area by uncovering RNA functions through synthesis and some structural studies um, of those uh, natural uh, modifications. And currently, one of the major challenges is that many of these building blocks are not commercially or even not synthetically available. So a lot of work, uh, including the uh, nanopore sequencing uh, talked previously are restricted by those materials from uh, nucleoside to nucleotide and to the uh, oligonucleotide level. So, but hopefully in the uh, near future with more synthetic effort going on, the complicated landscape of those residues in life process will be much clearer. And, in the end, I just like to thank my students and uh, my collaborator, and also the Bean Line scientists from APS, and also the uh, funding agent. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jia. Um, so, just as a reminder, we're going to hold questions until the end. Um, and also, if you have questions that come up during the talks, feel free to post them in Slido so we can prioritize them at the end. Um, I think we'll see if we have. Uh, do we have Shan Feng on? Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear us? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you? Uh, Although we don't okay. see you. <laughs> yeah. So. You there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Or share, share awesome. the screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see you. The PowerPoint. Yeah. So. Screen. Yeah. Screen. Okay. Okay, great. Can you can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I think although right yeah. now maybe in yeah, okay, great. presentation mode or outline mode. Outline mode. Is is it okay? Can you see? okay? The display settings. Everything good? Uh, the top display settings, you should be able to put in presentation mode versus outline mode. There we go. Perfect. Okay, great, great. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, thank you, everybody, and good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the, the workshop organizer for the invite. Here's my talk, and uh, I will focus on the oligonucleotide synthesis today. So I will start briefly talk about um, the many applications of oligonucleotides, and then give a brief overview of different oligosynthesis methods. And then I will focus on solid phase synthesis approach, I give some example of the new building RNA building blocks developed in the field. And finally, I touch bases on future oligonucleotide synthesis and um, touch bases about oligonucleotide nucleotide standards. So oligonucleotide, based on application, we can divide them into two categories. The analytical application of oligos can be used for sequencing, proteomics, protein sequencing, or the primers or probes for PCR, you probably, most of you probably know. And there are many also therapeutic applications as well. For example, antisense drugs, oligonucleotide for the anti-cancer drugs, and the guided RNA for gene therapy. So in terms of synthesis method, there are three different methods. Um, solid phase synthesis, chemical synthesis is, uh, is still the choice of method of today. It's basically, it synthesizes oligo on solid support, use classic phosphoamidite approach, and also use organic solvent. Then there's also liquid phase chemical synthesis. So instead of attach oligo on the solid support, is attach oligo most on the PEG linker, for example. It also uses phosphoamidite and organic solvent. And then there's a new method recent, developed in recent years called enzymatic method. It's, it's a non-temperate base. So, so basically, it's in, use engineered enzymes to add one nucleotide at a time. Pretty much like sequencing, next generation sequencing by synthesis, there you read one base at a time. Here, you add, write one base at a time. Usually use three prime modified, three block reverse perturbinator. And the reaction is done in the aqueous media. The major drawback of this approach is that not all the enzymes can take all the modified nucleotides, which is available today. So um, in terms of liquid phase chemical synthesis, enzymatic chemical synthesis, there are, they have their own challenges, but that's different presentation, different day. The overall goal of this approach is to have more environmental friendly process to make pure cheap oligonucleotide fast. So um, I want to brief describe oligonucleotide synthesis process on solid phase. So I'm using a common scheme, you know, RNA oligosynthesis with two prime TBDMS approach. So if if I can show the screen here that we you start with um, nucleoside on the solid support. First step, the deprotection of DMT, you have five prime hydroxyl group, and then you cup a one nucleotide base at a time, and then oxidize the, the P3 to P5, and then, then you, you cap the unreacted hydroxyl group, and uh, this is the cycle of the reaction. If we are making 100 mers, you basically repeat this cycle um, hundred times, and uh, after you're done with synthesis, you cleave the oligo here from uh, solid support, and then you go through deprotection and purification. So as as you can imagine, um, the 
oligosynthesis yield is very much dependent on the synthesis efficiency of each cycle. And uh, the graph on left side, this is published by my colleague at the Trilink. So the X Excel shows the oligo lengths and uh, the, the number on the, this uh, line shows the overall efficiency of each cycle. And the Y axis here is the full length of the oligo yield. So imagine if you do 100 ml and your coupling efficiency of each cycle is only 97%, you pretty much end up not, you don't have much full length oligo at the end of the synthesis. Like I mentioned, because you know each of these cycles have four steps, you really need a high efficiency for each reaction steps. So, for example, if we have DMT not 100% deprotected, you will end up have a minus one product. Or if the oxidation is not 100%, then you will have truncated species. So, if I have not depressed you in terms of the synthesis yield, I won't tell you more. So um, I want to spend a little more time on this slide. So this, the reason I want to do this is I hope for gave you a good sense of what kind of impurity we are dealing with in terms of the oligosynthesis. So the quality of all the reagent has impact on the final yield and the quality. For example, phosphoamidite, the purity of phosphoamidite, for example, if we have non-modified, you know, or modified base impurity in your phosphoamidite, you're likely going to introduce those impurity into your oligos. And the phosphoamidite is also, you know, moisture sensitive, it's not very stable long-term. So they have issues there. And technical aspect of the synthesizer machine, you know, the machine needs to be very reliable. It needs to be able to pump in and the liquid out very efficiently. And it also needs to keep it a dry environment. And then there's a solid phase, whether it's CPG or polystyrene. Both are good for short oligos. However, if you're thinking about making long oligos, you really need to balance in terms of loading and uh, versus the oligo quality. And then there are a lot of side reactions during oligo synthesis. For RNA, for example, you will have two prime, three prime isomerization. And then you have a depurination and uh, as unwanted uh, both modif base modification formed during the synthesis. All this is going to affect the, your quality of the oligos. And then there's availability of modified phosphoamidite, as Jay showed, my previous speaker showed you. You know, because the nature of the two prime hydroxyl function of RNA, not all the amidite chemistry you can scale up. So there's also cost associated with that. And then once you've done all the purification, then all the synthesis, then you have you have to deal with the purification. You know, whether you do DMT on HPLC or even gel purification, you know, today's technique is still very difficult to separate N minus one, N plus one, or other byproducts, for, especially for the lung oligos. And then the characterization. And you can use HPLC for purity, but LC mass for identity or sequence plus mass, but it still remains a challenge for longer oligo characterization. So in general, the synthetic RNA oligonucleotides have lower yield and the lower quality than DNA oligonucleotides. Despite all those challenges, there are a lot of success being made in the last 30 years or so. Many scientists and engineers contribute to this success. For example, today, we are pushing for 200 ml oligonucleotide for DNA, 100 ml for RNA oligos, even 150 ml. So there are also many opportunities you can introduce specific modification for oligos. For example, you can introduce phosphoacyl backbone for the antisense oligos for anti-cancer drugs. 
or you can introduce label biotin fluorescence for better detection of the oligos. And you can introduce specific amplification, amplification for example, clean cap, which I will touch base later. So there are also industrialized high-speed, high-throughput oligosynthesis platform available commercially. And there are many GMP oligo manufacturers around the world. They can make kilogram scale oligos to support many pharmaceutical applications. So I want to show some of our works. And this is um, three phosphoamides was introduced by our sister company, Green Research. I hope you all know Green Research. I think they are absolutely the best uh, in the field for oligo amides. So the first one here is the lipid phosphoamide. You know, as it says, you know, you can introduce the lipid nucleotide, lipid modified oligonucleotides, or there's amino modified phosphoamide. You can introduce amino modified to the oligonucleotides. And uh, this, this example here on the right is the RNA amide. It has fluorescence, so you can make fluorescent oligonucleotides. At the TriLink, uh, we are always working on to improve chemical synthesis method and the QC method for oligonucleotides. Here, I want to share with you a thermal oligonucleotide. We are using this as a model system to evaluate the efficiency of five prime triphosphorylation. So on the left graph here is the HPLC results of the timber oligos made by different synthesis conditions. The green one here is the timber monophosphate. The blue one is timber diphosphate and the purple one, which is our desired product is uh, uh, triphosphate. Because these are thermal oligos, you can see nice HPLC separation. On the table here right, and also shows that you can we can detect the mono di triphosphate oligos use mass back. And the, the graph here in the middle um, shows that the triphosphate oligo yield at with different conditions, synthesis conditions. And based on these optimized conditions, we then used uh, this method, optimized the method, and we made 100 more oligos with triphosphate, 5 prime triphosphate. And uh, you're probably curious what key components was used in mRNA production for COVID vaccine. And uh, I'm very proud to tell you that ClinCap is a part of what's the first mRNA vaccine developed by Pfizer-BioNTech. To date, nearly 2 billion people around the world have received the mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. The graph here on the left is our clean cap trimer structure. And the structure on the right is the n one methyl pseudo u triphosphate. Trilink also make this nucleotide product. So, so for the future, I'm, you know, despite all the challenges, I'm very optimistic in the oligonucleotide field. I think with further development of chemical or enzy enzymatic method or the combination of both, I think one day we can push for synthetic oligos, DNA or RNA for even to up to thousand mers. And the scientists around the world, like Jay showed you earlier, are working tirelessly to find newer, a better modified nucleotides. And I also think there is a great need to build and establish accurate RNA oligo standards. I'm glad that we have this workshop today. And uh, until today, there's still a challenge to really identify and characterize the long oligo, especially with the modifications in addition to the mass spec, I think sequencing can be a great tool as well. So here is uh, my colleague at the TriLink. They are doing oligonucleotide synthesis and the QC method development. 
And also, I'd like to thank you again. Thank, thank you, organizer, to allow us to share our training work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shangfeng. Um, okay, next up, uh, we have um, Jean Yao, uh, Professor of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University uh, in San Diego. He'll be discussing hurdles for implementing large-scale sequencing and mapping studies in the context of data and computing resources. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you cool. and see your slides. Thank you. Great, perfect. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, delighted to be here on this workshop. I'm going to share some of our experiences in, in uh, thinking and, and developing RNA standards uh, for um, our, what we call RNA interactomics. Some sort of disclosures of, of financial interest and then acknowledgement of the funding. Uh, a lot of the work I'll talk about today will be NIH funded um, and code and core related um, research. Okay. So, so uh, in the field, uh, there's been a uh, great, the great resurgence of, of interest in human RNA binding proteins. There are a fair number of these that have been uh, discovered by many different methods um, over the last decade, including mass spec methods and computation methods. And so, so a large fraction of the genome turns out to be in, to be encoded to encode uh, these uh, yeah, RNA uh, interaction or RNA binding proteins. And, and RNA binding proteins obviously modulate every single aspect of RNA regulation, uh, from splicing to localization, decay, degradation, and translation. Including also, you know, RNA granule for formation, uh, uh, small RNA uh, biology uh, processing, and and target recognition. And so, just so specific for this specific workshop, I also want to remind everybody that the the writers, erasers, and, and readers of all RNA modifications are basically RNA binding proteins, right? And, and these, these uh, um, modulators uh, influence um, RNA in many different ways, including, you know, as I mentioned, decay, um, degradation, stability, you know, um, translation, and so on. And so uh, one other slide I want us to remind everybody is that, that there are many methods to uh, obviously identify and detect RNA modifications. Uh, you know, many of them are sequencing-based methods that leverage um, uh, you know, antibodies um, or uh, misincorporation or chemical um, probes, right? And, and many of these are very similar in sort of in, in, um, in our minds, right? It, uh, as the um, uh, RNA mods that we've already evaluated in terms of uh, their data quality and their saturation and, and features of, um, of identifying these mods using computational methods. And of course, I'm not going to speak about uh, the non-sequencing-based methods to quantify these modifications. Of course, you know you have uh, chromatography and 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 uh, mass spec approaches to uh, to quantify these different mods in a in a you know single um, uh, RNA sort of basis, uh, less so transcriptome wide. So so today I'm going to focus primarily on on sort of illustrating and examples from transcriptome Y endogenous RNA substrates that are recognized bound, modified, you know, by, by RNA binding proteins more broadly. Um, uh, but of course, as, as I reminded everybody, I think, you know, all the modulators and, and writers and erasers of RNA mods are essentially RNA binding proteins. And so in the lab and in, in our um, uh, sort of mini consortium, we've been very interested in these protein RNA maps or RNA interactomes. And these maps are actually you know, terribly helpful in, in not only uh, telling us what happens to the RNA as, as they are bound and, and uh, when they're bound and when they're modulated, but also they can be helpful in the design of uh, sequence specific uh, modulators like ASOs or SRNAs. Um, and in fact, in, in more recently in our own papers, um, uh, helps us you know, think about mechanism action of small molecules that interrupt you know, RNA binding proteins, uh, readers, and, and so on, of RNA mods, right? Um, and help us, you know, also predict the function of these RNA binding proteins as novel engineered um, effectors. And so, so in my group, we spend quite a bit of effort in developing technologies that enable systematic studies of RNA binding proteins and RNA, uh, similarly, readers, writers, and erasers, right? And so we've uh, improved on uh, cross-linking IP methods that allow us to IP a given say RNA binding protein 
uh, digest away all the unprotected RNA and then sequence the RNAs that are bound to the RNA binding protein. Uh, and, and, and these methods uh, uh, have uh, enabled us to publish, um, even just within my group, you know, over 200 papers in, in describing the functions of many different RNA binding proteins. We've spent quite a bit of effort in developing other technologies to tell us where RNA binding proteins are um, bound interacting with RNA. And, and these are now getting to single cell isoform specific uh, levels, right? And so it provides us a new layer of, of, um, of regulation and resolution um, uh, and also scalability in, in identifying uh, these uh, protein RNA interaction maps. Uh, and so today I want to sort of share with you the lessons we've learned about standardization of, of a lot of these approaches. Uh, and, and quite a bit of it is encapsulated in um, our initial capstone paper here. Uh, this is a, a large collaboration with multiple labs, uh, including Brent Grafley's lab at, at UConn, Chris Burgess' group at MIT, Eric Lukage in Montreal, and then Sean Dong Fu, formerly at UCSD. And, and so uh, this paper represents an integration of you know, multiple technologies um, that allows us to then uh, you know, integrate the different data sets um, and, and then obviously share uh, the interpretation of this data of biological insights you know, with the community. Um, but of course, you know, this, these sort of large scale projects require a fair bit of um, communication and standardization um, in, in, in reagents, for example, and we can spend a little bit of time on, on, on how, we, how we, you know, we develop these uh, frameworks here. Um, uh, we had to, you know, develop these consistent biological and, and experimental pipelines uh, that were then uh, port of, you know, ported to different groups, I think, in the world at this point. In, in fact, even to companies that we have um, started. Uh, we've developed a fairly consistent data processing pipelines here. Also, I shared uh, with community data quality standards. And then we spend quite a fair bit of time internally worrying and, and trying to address batch effects. And I, and I think some of these lessons may be helpful uh, in, you know, in many, many aspects. Um, in the RNA modification space. Um, and so just, just you know, for this, this you know, to illustrate from this paper that we had, um, a research paper that we had published, uh, we focus our attention mainly on two cell lines. Of course, now within the lab, we work on many different cell lines. Uh, but we just want one lesson to share here is that, that when these lines were, were generated, we spent a fair amount of time karyotyping the lines and making sure that we batch the lines Every single experiment that we publish, you know, we will keep track of the exact batch number, who grew the lines, who uh, split the lines, um, and, and what free stall conditions, you know. And so, so some of these information helps us to um, control for uh, erroneous data and and uh, ensure data quality. Um, but these are the lines that we focus most of our assays on. And then in our specific uh, publication here, we had uh, multiple assays, so you can see. Uh, that you know, we had obviously the ECLIP assay that allows us to identify protein RNA interactions, in vitro recombinant protein uh, 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 you know, RNA interaction assays like RBNS um, that Chris Burgess lab had developed. Uh, a lot of uh, our antibodies uh, were subjected to a fair amount of validation um, uh, before they were then leveraged by Eric Lucas lab in Montreal to do IFs for about 300, 400 RNA binding proteins. Um, and then a brand grief this lab uh, had validated a lot of the SHRNAs that we had uh, you know, uh, sent him right to knock down RBPs and, and do uh, large scale RNA seq experiments. And of course, we also had some of these antibodies that were leveraged to do a chromatin IP, uh, followed by sequencing that the food lab uh, had uh, performed. And, and this large scale integration required a fair amount, again, a fair amount of uh, standardization and quality control before we release data sets to the, uh, to the public. <clears throat> And to date, uh, uh, at least in the publication, we have uh, generated over a thousand over uh, replicated data set <laughs> representing about a 350 something RNA binding protein. And, and here we sort of tells you that, you know, shows you a bit of the diversity of the RBPs in terms of function, localization, uh, what domains they have and what experiments that they were subjected to. And then just a quick sort of slide thinking about how we integrated data, right? And so once data sets are, are released uh, with specific release criteria that I'll go over, uh, then, they, then they are subjected to integration across multiple modalities. <laughs> Here we have an example where we have 
uh, RNA binding proteins uh, that are bound to this specific RNA, uh, PDBP1, TO1, uh, in the two different cell lines. We will integrate this with uh, knockdown data from, again, the same cell lines where we knock down this RNA binding protein, PDBP1, and then TO1, and then we subjected the, uh, obviously, the RNA to RNA seq analyses. And here you can see below here that we have RNA binding sites uh, for these RBPs that were flanking uh, uh, exons that were alternately spliced, right? And we can overlap that also with the IDR, which I'll mention in the next slide, peaks that were uh, extracted from the um, uh, Eclipse data sets, and also motifs uh, from the in vitro recombinant, uh, where's my mouse, RBNS uh, data sets, right? And here's another example on the bottom right. And so getting back to standardizations, right? Um, uh, you know, we had acquired, uh, you know, actually at this point, more than 1,500 antibodies for these RNA binding proteins and uh, a fair number of SRNAs. And every single reagent here uh, prior to, uh, gen you know, the use of these reagents generate data was subjected to quite rigorous um, uh, Western blot analyses. Um, uh, in some, in many cases, also mass spec analyses to show that you have single bands, the correct molecular weight, right? The antibody recognizes the, the primary target um, uh, uh, as the most abundant substrate. Uh, we obviously can also knock down the, um, the, the uh, proteins and then, you know, the loss of obviously the, the bands um, on, on Western blots tells us this, you know, specificity of both the sHRNAs and the, and the antibodies. And so these are all, you know, these, criteria for antibody validations were um, uh, in terms of a, a you know socialization of this were uh, rigorously uh, discussed in several working groups uh, in the ENCODE consortium and and the working groups uh, together developed white papers to um, you know present what is a fully validated or sort of release antibodies right for this specific project. Uh, many of these release criteria were actually published uh, in our molecular cell paper, I think, in 2016, and, and has been um, used as, as models for labs that are validating new antibodies for RNA binding proteins or, um, that uh, we had not validated, for example, and, but they're using all the same cr criteria. And so you can see we have primary validations where the specific band had to be some fraction of the total band signal. Uh, and that you would do, you know, secondary validation, knocking down the, the RBP and, 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 you know, how would you show that antibody actually validated with a knockdown and so on. So, so these were uh, part of our release criteria for these antibodies. Um, for the Eclip uh, protocol, we had uh, several different um, standards here. We had a analysis standards um, uh, using a pipeline that we had developed in the lab. And then the entire pipeline was then ported to uh, the data coordination um, uh, committee um, group at, at Stanford as part of the ENCO consortium. And then the pipeline was then, uh, you know, hardened uh, in some sense there for release to the public. Uh, and so there were, you know, at least a, a a uh, entire you know uh, workflow reproducibility step there that enable us to be pretty sure that the pipeline actually works at scale. And so again, won't go into details, but uh, for each part of the pipeline, there were uh, specific um, output you know here. For example, differentially bound regions in green. You know what are the number of usable reads? Uh, what are the clusters and input normalized clusters? Um, and then there were very specific uh, thresholds in which we would then uh, require data sets to be at. For example, what are the minimum read cutoffs that we um, uh, rationalize with a fair amount of uh, preliminary data from our group and other groups? Uh, what would we consider a inform informative peak? Uh, and so we computed these uh, with, with information theoretical uh, metrics. We, what was the IDR or... or, or um, irreproducibility discovery rate um, cutoffs that we that we develop and then release. And all of these were released as part of the Eclipse methods paper, as well as the nature paper describing the generation of the data, data set, right? So, so we, we feel like a lot of these methods, uh, again, were uh, discussed heavily with um, the community in a community sort of informed method uh, way. Um, and, and then we had, you know, many of these different sort of criteria for the release, but also internal and internal and external uh, release criteria. And then the last 
slide here, you know, uh, again, was the uh, RNA seq data set releases. I want to sort of go over all the different, you know, obviously the different modalities. But uh, these were again, uh, uh, you know, data sets that were released with spike in information with uh, at, the, at, at you know at read length criteria, a number of aligned reads, and and and, and the data sets were only released when they had um, a correlation between uh, replicates of uh, one and point nine. So, so these were again um, initially developed by the groups, but then subjected to a fair amount of discussion, uh, uh, you know, by working groups and ANCO consortium. Uh, and in the community um, with key opinion leaders, and then we release all of these um, as soon as they were generated, actually, not, not just in the publication form. And so just in, in general, uh, what was helpful for us is we developed our own, you know, lab QC met metrics. Uh, we then shared these metrics with, um, with the community, uh, which were then evaluated by the uh, data coordination uh, uh, committee. Um, uh, there were expert committee reviews for many of our uh, metrics and results, and then there was this iterative cycle for whether or not something would pass QC, and before they were then uh, released to the uh, public. And this was release of, of data sets were generated even prior to our publication of the data sets, right? Um, and just uh, the last couple of slides, you know, just to point out, uh, this has been going on now for, I don't know, six, eight, maybe more, uh, you know, maybe more, eight, more than eight years now. And we continue to generate data sets um, in these different cell lines, and now including obviously, you know, as, as more and more antibodies get available, and as and we're starting to you know sort of saturate antibody space, so uh, we're starting to move into tagging all the RBPs, and so we've generated um, you know at least open reading frames now for uh, a couple of thousand RNA binding proteins, and and in, and this now includes uh, a you know majority of the <clears throat> readers. Um, um, of RNA mods and and hopefully uh you know more writers and erasers as well. Um, all the data sets are available on the Encode portal and 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 individual labs uh, like our lab are starting to develop um, uh, new more um, interactive data portals for people to utilize the data sets in a in an integrative manner, not just you know one data type at a time, but integrating with different modalities and then. Of course, uh, there's a fair bit of effort and also storing all the imaging data, not the sequencing data. And so this has been done uh, with uh, by Eric Lucas lab and and these images are now being heavily annotated again uh, by Eric Lucas, but also the community uh, for which RBPs are in the mitochondria and ER and so on. So so this uh, effort is is sort of iterative and it re also requires a lot of community um, um, uh, in you know. Uh, um, insight, right? This is a slide that Brent uh, gravely generated, you know, trying to sort of summarize where we're trying to get to is for every RVP, you know, where these things are localized, what they might do, uh, developing a, a really comprehensive map of these protein RNA interactions. And, and just to summarize here, um, uh, in our experience, uh, I think data standards uh, and computational, uh, data standards for both the experimental and computational workflows are, are really, really important. I think they they are have now actually been adopted by not only academic labs but also companies, commercial companies that provide some of these assays uh, for the community. Uh, and so, when biotech and pharma companies utilize these data sets generated by us or or companies that provide them as services, they basically basically copy and paste a lot of our standards, right? And 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 these release standards are then uh, used as like you know criteria for what what could be published. Uh, in in uh, fairly strong journals, right, and and uh, these are all predetermined release criteria, but they're iterative as well, right? So they they go, you know, as technologies improve, uh, the community uh, work with us to to re you know to sort of inform us, right, what are criteria that can be improved, can be um, changed, uh, and many of these are shared again, and as I mentioned already in publication in the white papers, um, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, again criteria adoption. In, in at least hundreds of these follow-up papers now in the community. So, so with that, I'm gonna uh, stop and, and thank you for your, for your time. Thank you. Okay, and uh, finally we have, uh, we'll hear from Mark Lowenthal from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, he is uh, in person, and so he will be discussing the quality, uh, quality and measurement considerations for developing RNA gold standards. 
Okay, thank you. Um, first, thank you for uh, the organizers and the opportunity to speak here today. This is uh, very grateful for that. Uh, here's the clear. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a different talk. This is gonna be uh, less of a data intensive talk. I'm gonna talk about uh, what uh, a metrology institute thinks of when we, when we use the term standards uh, or reference materials, reference standards. Um, so I'm from the National Institute of Standards and Technology just up the road in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, and we are actually a, a federal institute in the Department of Commerce. So our mission is to support industry. Um, and primarily the division that, I'm, that I work in uh, works to support biomanufacturing initiatives and works to support clinical chemistry applications and, and, and health and disease. Um, and so of course, pandemic sparked uh, a big interest in RNA standards. Um, so there's uh, the word standard can, can mean a lot of different things. And we think of it in different, different buckets. Um, when we think of different types of standards, we can think of a, a quantitative standard which is, I think, how most people tend to think of a, of a reference standard. Um, that is a specific uh, identified measure and uh, identified with a, an exact uh, mass fraction or, or molar concentration with an expressed uncertainty budget um, with a, a description of the purity um, and impurities and uh, what else might be in that reference standard. Um, also, we can think of a standard as an identity standard. This is more when we talk about um, reference materials rather than standard reference materials at NIST, we talk about identity standards. These are materials that we have great confidence in the identity of what's in there. We don't necessarily know um, the degree of what else is in there or uh, an exact uh, quantitative uh, budget for that, that measure and of interest. Um, we also develop data standards. And when we think about data standards, we think about things like uh, the NIST Mass Spectral Data Library, um, where they produce uh, libraries of tandem mass spectral uh, data. Um, and you can buy these libraries. And uh, if you're looking at uh, proteomics or metabolomics or, or whatever omics you're interested in, there's a library available where you can uh, have MSMS fragmentation data, and you can match your fragmentation data to these libraries to get um, confident identification in uh, what you're measuring. Um, and another major bucket are activity standards. We don't typically work in activity standards. These are typically done by organizations like the WHO. Um, activity standards are um, not traceable to this international system of units. So they, there's some uh, limitations there. Um, so when we think about attributes of reference standards, um, the most important parts of a reference standard is for that material to be homogeneous and stable. <clears throat> so we spend uh, a lot of time in demonstrating homogeneity and stability. Um, for homogeneity, um, uh, there has to be something that you're determining homogeneity of. So um, at some degree, there is a quantitative aspect to, uh, to even uh, identity standards. Uh, for demonstrating homogeneity. Um, stability needs to be fit for purpose. So um, if we're going to ship you a reference standard and it's gonna sit on your loading dock over the weekend on dry ice, we need to demonstrate stability at those conditions. If you need something that's stable for uh, 10 years in your minus 80 freezer, we need to demonstrate that as well. Um, so all reference materials need to be demonstrated to be homogeneous and stable. Um, commutability is uh, another um, mandatory aspect of a reference material. So uh, this group uh, seems to be heavily focused on um, mass spectrometry approaches and the nanopore approaches. And of course, there are many other sequencing approaches. Um, but uh, commutability is a property of a material. And we need to demonstrate that our materials are fit for purpose, that they're commutable with the different um, metrological analytical approaches that are being used. Um, and of course, traceability. So a uh, reference material, in, in order for it to be something that's useful throughout the community, we need to know um, what that linkage is back to uh, uh, an international unit, for example, a kilogram. 
Um, so traceability chain needs to be demonstrated for a reference standard to be uh, useful. Um, of course, we also need to consider reference standard. Is it going to be a primary standard just in an in a aqueous solution of some sort, uh, like a synthetic standard? Or are we talking about a, a reference standard that's gonna be in a matrix? And then if you're talking about a matrix, um, that gets very tricky very fast. Um, and pools versus individual specimens is, is more on the clinical end of things. But um, when we're talking about cell lines, as people have been discussing earlier, um, that also needs to be considered. I'm having trouble moving forward. There we go, thank you. Um, so uh, the first thing we need to consider when we're developing uh, a reference material is the application of that standard. What is the fit for purpose uh, of that material? Um, is it an identity standard? For instance, we need to identify M6A. Well, in what uh, matrix, in what uh, material is that, is that going to be for? Are we developing an, an, an absolute quantity standard or is this going to be used like it might be in biomanufacturing as a, uh, to assess batch to batch comparability as a quality control? Um, making a reference material as, as a quality control material is uh, difficult because um, highly characterized reference materials have a, a higher cost than what you might typically use for a quality control material. Um, reference materials are very useful for, for method, method transfer as well. So being able to define what is the application of a reference standard is an essential first step. So this is a, a, an example of what a traceability chain might look like. Um, we typically start with uh, the definition of the international systems, uh, the unit, for example, a kilogram, um, and that can be uh, the traceability chain goes from the, the, the bottom level, which may be in a clinical uh, sense, maybe a patient sample, um, and we can define that traceability chain back through primary and secondary reference materials, primary and secondary reference measurement procedures. Um, and we need to be able to clearly define this traceability chain um, in, in order to, 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 to demonstrate uh, the, the utility of the reference material. So there are a number of challenges that people have already brought up with um, establishing what an RNA reference standard might look like. Um, it's a big community with lots of different applications. So how do we, how do we determine where to start um, because everybody needs something different for their unique work. And uh, some of the challenges are cost and time. Um, the first step is always gonna be defining the measure and. Um, so a measure and isn't, is not an analyte, it is an analyte in its matrix um, with a defined measurable quantity. So if you're talking about RNA in a cell line or RNA in a buffer or RNA Every different RNA is going to be different. Um, you need to define, define, first be able to define what that measure and is. You need to establish when the characterization is complete. Um, these are large complex biomolecules in very complex matrices. So you can go on forever characterizing these materials. Um, so you need to understand up front what it is that you need out of the material, what's fit for purpose, what is it, when, when is it going to be sufficiently characterized? Um, stability, I, I already mentioned, um, and impurity analysis. We need to be able to estimate short MERS and long MERS for some of these therapeutic products. Um, we need to know how much uh, residual protein or DN uh, or, or other nucleic acids are, are in these materials, single str or double stranded RNA or double stranded DNA in our products. Um, those things can be part of a reference material, um, but we just need to know what they are and how much are there in order for them to be useful. Um, and of course, cost is going to be a big concern. Um, typically, at, at NIST, for example, uh, the reference standards that we produce are, are not going to be anywhere near as cheap as what people would need for um, that, that you could buy from, from Sigma Aldrich or, or something to that effect. Um, because they have uh, a lot of this characterization 
um, in, involved in, in their manufacture. So is the consumer going to be able to spend the cost it takes to, to use these reference materials for what they need it for? Um, where do we get the materials? Um, you know, can, can we get enough of the material to make uh, enough reference, reference material to last, um, you know, five to 10 years? We typically aim for five to 10 years um, at a minimum of, of what we need to manufacture um, to have a useful reference material. If you, if you make something and it's, and it's gone in three months, it's, it's not much use because typically these biomanufacturing companies um, need to use the same standard for decades. Um, so we will make, for example, we have a, a, a BSA reference material that's been used for decades by, man, by manufacturing, and we're on, I think, 927G at this point. So we have a traceability chain from G to F to E all the way back up to the original material. Um, and time, is, especially in this community, is, is, is a big concern because the science moves so fast. Um, and I'm sure some people here are also government employees and they know how slowly things work uh, in the government. And by the time we come up, say, for example, we're gonna make an mRNA reference material. Well, has the field already moved on to, um, to circular mRNA at that point or to some other um, new technology? And uh, so we need to be forward thinking in, in what we're making so that uh, it's going to be applicable for, for a longer period of time. Uh, we've already talked about this quite a bit, um, but in addition to modifications to, to uh, the bases, when we're talking about therapeutic products, we need to also think about modifications to the uh, phosphodiester backbone, be able to characterize and, and quantify these modifications as well. Um, so I'll just quickly talk about some of the work that, that we're doing in, in this area. Uh, we are um, in the process of, of developing methods for oligonucleotide quantification and, and qualitative analysis. So some of the approaches that I'm using for quantitative analysis um, mirror what we've done in the past for uh, proteins and metabolites. Um, so for absolute quantitative approaches, what we can do is start with a, a, an RNA or a DNA sample and we can use stable isotope labeled internal standards of nucleobases, and we can hydrolyze our sample into individual nucleobases. Um, and this works for any covalent modification to a nucleobase as well. Um, and we can do uh, liquid, chromatography, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry to separate and detect the analytes, which are the nucleobases themselves. And then we can calibrate the, the measurement to um, to uh, highly well-characterized uh, higher-order uh, nucleobase standards, pure standards. Um, and uh, so we have an internal control and an external control. Um, and then we can, from the uh, concentration of the nucleobases that we determine, we can infer the concentration of the intact oligomer, um, knowing the sequence of that oligomer that we start with. And so this approach has been used for RNA and for DNA for mRNA encapsulated in lip, lipid nanoparticles. Um, it's, a, it's a robust approach. A lot of people are using enzymatic approaches for this, but we found that um, a, a chemical approach um, works very well and very cheaply. Um, we're also doing qualitative analysis of RNA, uh, not just mRNA, but some of the smaller therapeutics, the ASOs and, and the siRNA and those, uh, those guys. The, um, so we can approach this as a bottom-up sequencing approach um, where we do an ion pairing reverse phase LCMS approach. Um, but for some of the, even the smaller guys, even up to uh, guide RNA, uh, we can do this in an intact analysis um, using high-resolution mass spectrometry. And uh, some of the things that we consider are critical quality attributes of these um, RNA therapeutics. So for example, we're interested in being able to use mass spectrometry to um, develop assays for the uh, determining the identity and the occupancy of the five prime cap, um, the length and the distribution of the poly A tail. Um, LCUV or LCMS are great techniques for the stability and the degradation assays. 
And of course, mass spec allows you that direct um, measurement of these modified bases, whereas um, uh, other approaches uh, may, may not do that. Um, and of course, LCMS is gonna be great for those product related impurities. And just real quickly, I'll, I'll show you that uh, we can sequence mRNA. Uh, we digest them with enzymes like RNAs T1. These need to be timed digestion reactions to um, result in larger uh, oligonucleotide fragments that are amenable to sequencing that have some unique identity um, rather than chewing them down to dreamers and formers that um, do not have have any diagnostic um, utility. Um, so uh, what does a reference material in, in the RNA world look like? We're, we're still trying to figure that out. One thing that we're proposing is an mRNA, like a platform mRNA uh, drug substance. And uh, some colleagues are working on mRNA drug products, uh, which would be lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA. Um, those have modifications, but of course, this, this uh, group is looking uh, at, at other things. But for example, there are modifications to these uh, drug substances, like the caps and the tails and the phosphorothioates and um, methyl one pseudouridine or whatever your, your base modification is. Um, there's, I, I, I basically wanted to share the slide to show you that when we're making these large um, reference materials, there, there are a number of different things that go into characterizing them. Um, and it's, it's levels of confidence that we're, we're concerned with. Um, and yeah, so, so that's basically it. Um, just wanted to give some background on, on uh, how, how a metrology institute approaches this and uh, hopefully I can answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so it looks like we have about 15 minutes uh, for questions. Um, uh, feel free to, if you're in uh, in person, to get behind the microphone. Um, I'll call on people. Um, I, I also we also have a number of questions in Slido, so I'll work through those as well. And I guess I'll use the previous approach of alternating as we go through these. Um, so maybe we can start in person. Hi, uh, Jamie Williamson at Scripps. Um, yeah, I was really interested in the allusion that you made to the mRNA vaccine world. Uh, this is for Mark, by the way. And and um, and so I, I wonder if you or anybody knows what is actually the QC that people do on the RNA that goes into an mRNA vaccine and what would be the impact of actually making people do everything on your last slide before a vaccine was allowed to be uh, put on the, in people. Okay, yeah, great question. Um, so that slide is uh, inclusive of what I borrowed from a, a USP uh, monograph. Um, there were a couple lines in there that I found in other um, prominent publications, but for the most part that was, that, you know, so at this point, as you know, there's no FDA guidance on specifically on all of the things that needed to be done. Um, we are not a regulatory agency. So we work with the FDA and we work with our stakeholders, the, the biomanufacturing community, as well as the FDA and all the other stakeholders. And we try to work together to establish what what that list should look like. And then we try to make materials or reference measurement procedures and encourage um, someone to use those when they go through the FDA approval process. And once they are used in that manner, then the FDA has some foothold to say, they did it this way. Let's encourage other people to do it that way. But we don't, yeah. Okay, um, moving on, uh, we'll, we'll take a question from Slido. This one uh, is from Robert Ross and uh, is for Sean Feng from uh, Trilink. Uh, 
and I'll just read it. The Helm Group has recently shown the applicability of ligating oligonucleotides into full-length mRNA. Can you comment on this approach for the creation of longer oligonucleotides in therapeutics? Yes, um, you know, yes, there are publications out there. You can uh, ligate the, you know, oligos, whether DNA oligo, RNA oligos together. Um, the, the key issue is the efficiency, you know, and uh, how can you purify afterwards? And uh, yes, at the trilink, we also look at those approaches as well. Um, but yeah, it can be done. Um, that need more work. Okay, um, and I guess maybe an extension. So do you, yeah, I guess that is obviously going to allow for faster um, extension of these. Do you, do you think that is going to be the case? Um, so, so it's a two pieces, right? So you have, you know, one piece oligo, one piece, you link them together. So, you know, many things involved the ligation enzyme, if you do it enzymatically, you know, if you do the clinical camps, you know, people also publish that approach. I think um, um, in terms of the app, you know, for chemistry, you know, that the method wise, you need to figure out what's efficient, but also you need to make sure that you know, that uh, if it's RNA, for example, if you, you know, people thinking about click the, the oligo tail for, to the mRNA, and then you really need to figure out that, you know, that uh, mRNA in terms of protein transcription, translation, you know, so a lot of research still need to be done there. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's possible, I think, but needs a more work. Uh, I think uh, quite a few groups are working on that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we'll take the next question in-house. Uh, it's actually a question for Chen Feng as well. So uh, my question is uh, regarding the, the cost of uh, synthesized oligos for RNA mm -hmm. oligos. Um, they're substantially more expensive than DNA oligos. And the question is, what does it take to bring down the, that cost? And is it, is, it a, is it a question of, you know, making a combinatorial approach to making multiple oligos at once? Or like, how can we get down that cost to more or less like DNA oligo costs? Right, yes, it's a very good question. You know, the oligo, RNA oligo, you know, unfortunately by nature of chemistry is less, you know, stable and the, the yield and the quality are you know generally lower than the dna oligos and uh, in terms of amidite you know that uh, there are enough you know standard amidite for rna as at least as about today they're about comparable price compared with dna amidite um but i think it's the purity right dependent application you know especially for M for the rna oligos i think uh, you know you need to really for, for example guide the rna so you need a really full length purity, you know, people are pushing for, you know, guide RNA 100 base and, uh, you know, instead of 50, 60 percent purity, people are asking for 90 percent purity because the five prime and the full length is very important. So it's really application dependent and, uh, um, and uh, you know, high support method that you can push down to, you know, make many, many RNAs. I think that is the calculation and uh, you know purity, purity, you know purification, calculation are the you know more, more expensive for this. I think for the oligosynthesis. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so next online, um, this is probably a question for any of the panelists. Um, in the context of RNA standards, it's been reported that only 10 or so modifications can be synthesized. So what are the barriers to, and, and maybe uh, possible solutions to synthesizing the rest of the 150 plus modifications um, into phosphoamidite or onto oligos, nucleotides by enzymes? Okay, for me question, okay. Yes, so you know, <laughs> you, you think about the sequencing bit, right? So the Illumina sequencing, you know, they have this enzyme can take three prime azido methyl group. So you know, unfortunately, you know that the enzyme is, you know, en enzyme engineer process. You know, it's a very 
the key is that the answer need to be very specific and accurate, right? So, and also fast. So, you know, I think it's a more involved enzyme engineer. I think, you know, you probably need to start with high throughput enzyme screening because, you know, amidite nucleotides available. However, the enzyme, you know, can only take, you know, few um, modified nucleotides, especially for the you know, oligosynthesis, synthetic genomics, for example, the, the nucleotide is three prime blocked so because you introduce one base at a time, you know, that uh, engineer the enzyme, you know, has issue in terms of the speed and the specificity. So it, it takes, it's going to, but few days, you know, moving forward, but takes some time really to have good enzyme, you know, maybe multiple enzymes, maybe some enzyme can take a standard nucleotides, maybe more engine, other engineered enzyme can start, take some modifier. So. It's, it's, I think it's an evolving process. And uh, yes, it's the uh, it's direction the field is going, but uh, unfortunately not today yet. Okay, thank you. So some more uh, improved enzymes and the ability to generate more enzymes. Anybody else have? If I can add one point. So for the uh, phosphoromidite building block, those, um, the rest of 150s, it, it's actually not, that difficult to synthesize from the uh, organic chemistry point of view. But the problem is uh, we don't have the big driving force or the biological significance uh, to make those building blocks. A lot of time those, those residues are being just detected and sitting there and nobody knows what's going on. And if we uh, just synthesize that, we don't have a good story to, to, to uh, to report that, or when we write a grant, it has no biological significance. So um, I think that we need to have more like uh, um, like functional study, and then this can be like largely driving forward. That's my thing. Yeah, great, great point. You know, for faster amidite, I can also come. Uh, you know, so it's the scale up. You know, it's a balance, right? You want the low cost. You want also availability. So, so, you know, some of the chemistry, you know, if you make one gram, is it going to be very costly? You know, if you do kilogram, the cost can go down. But if you make kilogram, you said for 10 years, you know, the company is going to make that. So it's just really balanced. Yeah, exactly. For, for example, a lot of um, nucleoside, you can, you can request the customer synthesis with like five milligram, it easily go up to $2,000. Um, but it's good for the, maybe for the mass spec, but for the oligosynthesis, five milligrams is nothing. So just those are like causes also a huge issue here. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I guess we can move on to the next question. Um, we have someone uh, in house. Okay. Yeah, I have a question for Eugene and one more general to the audience. Uh, is the uh, ENCODE data, the database of uh, RNA binding proteins, searchable by interatomic search engines? I'm thinking about Cytoscape or, or something similar. And for the general audience, uh, do, we, do we have a searchable database of uh, hotspots of modifications? I'm, I'm mentioning M6A, but there are many others that I'm sure that the community is interested in. Do we have a central repository where we can go in and look for where is a high frequency spot where M6A happens? Yeah, so uh, the ENCODE data uh, are all available on the ENCODE portal, right? But I think, I think you know, we, are we and others are developing more interactive searchable um, uh, portals there. I just pasted one that, that's from my lab that just came online actually just live yesterday. And so, so we're trying to get better and better at getting people to be able to search for a specific RNA and gene, and then be able to search for all the RBPs that bind there, including, including readers and writers of different mods, right? And then we have not integrated RNA mod, you know, um, data there yet, but that's that's not hard for us to integrate once we know which data sets are actually good and and useful for for integration. Uh, if, if hopefully that's helpful, and then yeah, and I think you know the, the goal is also to build cross-platform interoperability. And so, for example, you know, we can start putting things up on other websites uh, like Cytoscape, for example, and 
just come up with different metrics for how you compare distances between indirect indirect uh, dome profiles, for example. So, so I, I think there's a there's a big push, but I but I think it's still needed, right? Uh, to to sort of generate this one stop shop sort of portals for you know RNA mod and indirect dome information, yeah. And, and, and M6A is the only one. There are no yeah, others. They're not integrated. Yes, that's true. Good thing to do. Uh, Jean, this, this is a question for you. This is Brenda Bass. So how did you choose your cell lines? Hey, Brenda. <laughs> Good to see you. Ah, uh, here you. Um, uh, these cell lines were uh, chosen, you know, as part of the ENCODE um, consortium, right? So these were... You know, practically speaking, I think Stephanie is, is there. Can she can maybe uh, so address this? But practically speaking, I think these are the lines where there were a lot of previous uh, encode data already generated from the you know decades of of work in the epigenomics and and DNA binding field, and so we you know we were really asked to populate the the same lines with our RBP data sets. Of course, I think these are not the only lines that are interesting. Obviously, there are many many lines that are much more interesting. I think. Uh, and so part of the effort, you know, that we, I think the community needs to do is to, to port uh, assays and, and protocols and generate more data in other lines. Yeah. yeah. Brenda, is that, is that the question? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's exactly the question. And then uh, one more that you did a great job of uh, talking about quality control and uh, uh, points at which you needed multiple validation. And I'm just uh, wondering if you have any take home lessons, you know, you certainly, uh, there are steps that have to be really carefully controlled, but you also have to think about time and cost. Yeah. Do you yeah. have sort of a, a take home for uh, yeah. things that require a lot of attention and those that don't? I think I think one of the big take home messages, I think as you really as you really pointed out, it point, point out is like the balance between, you know, generating data in a in a manner that's helpful for the community now versus, you know, the best and and highest you know quality data sets. For example, uh, we had to compromise on the number of replicates, right? So, so uh, for the Eclip experiment, so we in in the encode data releases, we did two replicates. Of IP and one of the size match input. I mean, in my own lab for our own papers, where we have time, you know, we generate three replicates and more. But each one has one input control, right? But for the encode data, we couldn't do that and also meet the timelines for generating a large data set for release. So I think part of this discussion is an iter you know the iterative um, message has to be there, right? I think I think it's important to also do both, right? You generate. You know enough data at some level of quality that people become interested in it they use it and 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 when they want more of maybe the same data sets we can then go back and generate more maybe you know more replicates you know with, with more controls across more cell types and cell lines right and so that was like a, a big take home like we we, we had to compromise on, on some things keep the, the quality there but but not do as many replicates or or cell lines as as we would have wanted right yep thank you Thank you, Brenda. I think we can take one last question, Stephen. Sure. Hi. Oh, All right. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. So both uh, Jia and Chen Feng mentioned that it is possible, in fact, to synthesize all of these ol oligonucleotide standards, but the lack of drive is related to disease, like disease relevance, which I think is a really interesting point, and I want to push on it a little bit. I'm sort of wondering uh, if there are other reasons why you would want to synthesize these and what those are. And then if there is another way that you could convince a group, whether it be a federal group or another group, to actually go through the process of making these standards so that they're available to the public. Uh, is there a mechanism that you could think of that would be worthwhile? Is there a group that you could think of that would be worth implementing that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I was thinking of that actually. So if some like uh, uh, funding agents like NIH, they can find a um, like platform um, to have a lot of participating labs. And some people have the need 
um, put the overlay on and we can take the task and synthesize the uh, develop the synthetic uh, root and make it all legal and deliver to you. So um, in this case, everyone can can be beneficial. I think this this is definitely doable platform. I really um, uh, I think it's possible. Yeah. Yes, I can also speak for Trilink too. You know, we are unique. We make nucleotides. We make oligos, RNA oligos. We also make mRNAs. So you know, we have a strong group analytical service in house as well. Yes, we definitely you know would like to contribute. Um, yeah, whichever ways. Um, yeah, I think uh, definitely. Yeah, be happy to help. Okay. Well, I guess we can thank all the uh, participants for their talks and answering the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and I think we'll wrap up this session and move on to the next. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Majumder from the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm delighted to be here to moderate a panel session on lessons from large-scale collaborative research endeavors. Um, in the course of this session, uh, we should have opportunities to discuss major scientific initiatives in the US and abroad, both past and current, to understand the successes and also the major challenges of such initiatives and to apply lessons learned to the possibility of a large scale effort related to RNA. Uh, we have two panelists and each will give approximately 20 minutes of opening remarks and then we'll have the remaining time for joint Q&A. And I will begin by introducing our first panelist. Bob Cook Deegan is a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and with the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes at Arizona State University. He previously directed Duke Center for Genome Ethics, Law and Policy, and he's the author of The Gene Wars, Science, Politics and the Human Genome and over 350 other publications. Dr. Cook Deegan. Thank you, Mary. And uh, it's uh, like coming back home here. I've spent two years working in this building up on the second floor. Um, so thank you for uh, having us. And I'll just dig right into uh, what two of us have been asked to do is think about analogies and disanalogies to a proposed major initiative. And so we're gonna be going over some history. Part of it's political history and part of it is technical history. So, um, I'm gonna start with the history of the Human Genome Project, and then I'll mention some other projects. Um, and this slide shows, uh, there were three origins of the Human Genome Project, three people that had the idea. Um, Robert Sinsheimer is the guy in the middle with, uh, with the blue shirt. Um, and up to his left is Nobel laureate, Renato Dolbeco. And just below uh, Bob Sinsheimer and below Jim Watson is Charles DeLisi. And Charles DeLisi is actually the guy who started the Human Genome Project. Um, he was reading a report from the Office of Technology Assessment about techniques for measuring heritable mutations in human beings. And the technical question was, is the technology up to doing that? Can you tell whether people have inherited mutations from their parents? And the uh, um, the, the real focus here was actually the studies of Japanese citizens who had been exposed to the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and uh, the Office of Technology Assessment that we'll loop back to in a minute had written a report on the technical prospects for measuring heritable mutations in human beings. 
Charles DeLisi was at the Department of Energy, but his background was really interesting. He was a whiz at math. He had worked at the National Cancer Institute and he had worked at the Los, Los Alamos National Lab out in New Mexico, the, the home base for the scientists that were involved in the Manhattan Project. And um, the physicists and mathematicians who hung around after the war doing a high-tech whiz bang science that eventually became the home to the first US-based nucleotide sequence database, GenBank, that was later moved to NIH. So Delisi had this background in what would now be called computational biology. Um, and he thought it would be a good idea to have, take the new technologies of DNA sequencing and create a reference sequence as a tool for doing all sorts of wonderful things for human health and all sorts of other applications. Um, and more importantly, he was working in Germantown at the Department of Energy Science Office's headquarters. And so he had a budget. So he could deploy some money to do uh, to get this thing started. Um, and so the, the origin of the Human Genome Project, as we came to know it, <clears throat> actually came out of the Department of Energy, not the National Institutes of Health. Um, and it kicked off a bit of a, of a struggle that I'll allude to later. Um, the other two origins were Renato Del Becco, uh, after doing his uh, pioneering work in cell biology had become the head of the, um, the Salk Institute out in California, but he was doing cancer research. And his argument was, we need a reference sequence of the human so that we can detect what mutations are being passed through cells that are causing cancer. He wanted a reference sequence against which cancer genomes could be comparison, compared because you can't do breeding in humans. So he actually, proposed that actually at a, at a talk here in Washington at the Italian embassy in 1985. That idea didn't went nowhere, but he published an article in Science Magazine in March um, and proposed this idea. Um, and uh, the, the third origin is completely different. Uh, Bob Sinsheimer had been a biologist at Caltech and had been working on Phi X174, one of the early origins of, of uh, molecular biology and had realized the incredible power of having a sequence that was one of the first organ, organisms ever sequenced at, at, uh, at Cambridge in Fred Sanger and Bart Barrell's group. Um, and it became an incredibly powerful tool for understanding the biology of this virus. And um, he had this incredibly painful experience of having gotten a $36 million check to build a telescope uh, in Hawaii that he had to give back because the Keck Foundation stepped forward and paid for this telescope and he had to give back the money to the donors. Um, and he actually decided, oh, well, you know what? We're used to asking for big money for telescopes. Why don't we do that in biology? And he went back to the family having given their check back and said, hey, would you guys be interested in sponsoring an institute here at the University of California, Santa Cruz that would create a reference sequence of the human genome? Um, that went nowhere. He wrote some letters to NIH and they said, yeah, put it through peer review. Um, and you can imagine how a $36 million uh, proposal in 1985 for a human genome institute would, would fly at NIH. It's a little, it's a kind of a big R01, right? Um, so that went nowhere, but the seeds had been planted. And actually when Delisi came up with the idea, um, he could do something about it um, NIH got involved uh, by a kind of a circuitous route. Jim Weingarten, who was then the head of the National Institutes of Health, um, was at a cocktail party in London, and somebody came up to him and said, what do you think about this DOE idea of the Human Genome Project, doing a reference sequence for the human genome? And Weingarten said, basically, I thought that was like asking the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, to build the B-1 bomber. So uh, this, what that set up, um, and I'll go into that in a minute, what this set up though, was a kind of a healthy competition between the Department of Energy and the National Institute, Institutes of Health for leading this sexy high-tech whiz-bang project in human biology. Um, the other folks on this slide are folks who came in a little bit later you see Jim Watson in the upper right. He was the 
original um, director of an office, then a center, and then finally, uh, after he left, it became an institute at the National Institutes of Health, one of the sponsors for this project, in the National Human Genome Research Institute. The bottom left is actually the guy who's who's who we all uh, bow in obeisance to. It's Fred Sanger, who got two Nobel laureates, one for sequencing proteins and one for sequencing DNA. An amazingly uh, humble and um, and sweet guy um, who completely transformed the field and believed fervently in open science. That ethos spilled over into the Human Genome Project in a way that I'll come back to in a minute. And then finally, at the bottom right, you see one of the culmination moments. There have been probably three dozen of these, but there have been the, the Human Genome Project has come to uh, an end several times. Once the very first one was the uh, 2000 um, announcement, June 2000 announcement in the White House with Bill Clinton in the middle there, standing safely between Francis Collins and uh, Craig Venter, who had called a temporary truce between Solera Genomics and the publicly funded Human Genome Project. So what, are we, what, what can we summarize, summarize about the history? Well, the original impetus for the Human Genome Project grew out of what was happening in two miraculous technologies. And it was the convergence of those two technologies. One was DNA sequencing, and actually also recombinant DNA and physical mapping and genetic linkage mapping that were progressing in tandem. So the mapping of DNA, but the other essential technology was actually information technology and com computation, because these sequences are completely useless and you have, unless you have a computer helping you think through what, what, what you're actually looking at. So the Human Genome Project was the convergence of, so remember, the Macintosh came out in 1984. The idea for the Human Genome Project came out in 1985. DNA sequencing had been invented in 1975 to 1977 um, by Fred Sanger at Cambridge and Alan Maxim and, uh, and Wally Gilbert at the other Cambridge in the United States. What happened when this idea was in the air was that um, NIH began to kind of maneuver to get itself in position to support the science. And they did a, a, an analysis of what grants they were supporting. It turned out they were already supporting about $300 million of grants that were related to human genome mapping and sequencing um, compared to the DOE budget that was about $5 million that year. Um, and <clears throat> it started a series of, of meetings for for two and a half years, we were going to at least one meeting a month about should there be a human genome project. Um, and I've picked this, the coverage from science uh, that started with Roger Lewin and then shifted over to, to Leslie Roberts because they did a marvelous job of capturing it. The point of showing that though, is you can see that this was not a conflict-free idea. Um, first of all, within the technical community, there was a lot of disagreement about whether the technology was up to the task, whether it made any sense to spend all this money on a reference sequence anyway. And by the way, if you're going to do it that way, that's not how we do biology. Uh, we do biology through R01 investigator-initiated grants, let a thousand flowers bloom, and they will eventually produce a reference genome. And the argument against that was, okay, yeah, right. Um, show us when NIH has ever done anything that systematic um, or anybody else in biology. So this was going back and forth. And of course, the Department of Energy in that argument had a bit of a head start because they had been home to the Manhattan Project, um, the largest technical, uh, socio-technical effort that had ever been mounted um, and culminated in the atomic bombs. So look, <laughs> really interesting history, right? We start with the atomic bomb and we loop back to the Human Genome Project um, and it comes back to Los Alamos, Livermore and the other national labs as well as the National Institutes of Health. By 1990, it finally got launched. Um, but there was a process in that window between 1985 when Charles DeLisi uh, and David Smith at DOE had this initial idea and 1990 when it officially started that five-year interlude, there were a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, procedures that went into it. These two reports came out in um, first February and then April of 1987. 
The one on the left is, I think, probably the reason for the name of this committee, um, which is the, the mapping and sequencing of the human genome. And the history there is that uh, Bruce Alberts had written an editorial in Cell saying, uh, we don't want big biology. Biology is inherently small science. Um, and he was picked to be the chair of the committee that was supposed to decide whether there should be a human genome project. It was a very, very sagacious political move on whoever made that decision in this, in this institution. Um, because they basically were appointing an opponent. And, and Jim Watson was on that committee, David Botstein was on that committee, Charles Cantor, a whole bunch of high-flying molecular biologists, mappers, and sequencers were on the committee. Um, and that committee is actually mainly responsible for why the Human Genome Project turned in, turned from being a point of vigorous contention with biology into a point of consensus, you know, maybe this is worth doing as long as we don't just focus on humans, but we include other model organisms and construct their genomes. And if we don't put all of the weight on a reference sequence, but in fact, we think about building tools along the way, like a genetic linkage map, like the sequencing technologies, like the databases that are needed to support the infrastructure for making sense of this stuff, um, and the physical maps laying out the segments of DNA to be sequenced. So the National Academy of Sciences, I think, can take the lion's share of credit for turning this uh, idea that was inchoate, rather nebulous, in 1985 into a program that could actually be implemented by scientific agencies in Washington, D.C. That left, there's one issue, two issues, actually, that the National Academy didn't do a great job of handling. Um, and one of those was the debate between NIH and DOE. You have these two agencies, both of which have uh, legitimate claims on the prize, the, the, the Human Genome Project, and no real way of resolving the differences. So there was actually a bill that was passed uh, by, I think the vote was 88 to three in the US Senate that would have formalized a commitment to have the Human Genome Project co-administered by the Department of Energy and the National Institutes of Health. When it came to the House, fortunately, Senator or, uh, Representative John Dingell said, he called up NIH and DOE and said, you know what, we could pass this law because they passed it in the Senate, we could pass it in the House, but I'm not sure that's a good idea. And his staffer, um, Leslie Russell, called up the heads of the agencies and said, couldn't you guys just come to an agreement yourselves? Because if we put this in statute, it's going to be inflexible. It's going to be there for all time. It's going to be really hard to change. Why don't you guys just get together? So that resulted in a memorandum of understanding between the NIH and the DOE, um, which was a very logical conclusion. It was probably better than either agency running it alone. Um, and it culminated in money flowing from both agencies. It was about two thirds NIH, one third at DOE at the beginning. And now the DOE component has drifted down and the NIH uh, now has its own institute. The other issue that I'm alluding to that may be more important now than it was then, but it was pretty controversial even then was intellectual property and patenting. And I will say that in both of these reports, we fumbled our handling of that issue. I won't say a whole lot more about that unless it comes up in the discussion, because I don't know whether that's going to be an issue for the area that you're talking about. I don't know the area well enough. But uh, intellectual property and patenting, the Bayh-Dole Act was new, um, and it was just being implemented. And the Department of Energy and NIH had very different attitudes towards intellectual property and how it should be handled in uh, public-private partnerships uh, between academe and, uh, and industry. So here are some features. Clearly, the sum here is this is an idea that caught hold, was really sexy, was really obviously related to human health, and could be taken out to the general public, and people would get excited about it. The general public includes the US Congress and the agencies. And um, so, it became the most prominent science policy decision that was in discussion for a good two years and culminated in the budgets flowing to both agencies. 
a couple other things to observe about it. Um, unlike, I think, most of the science we've heard here today, there's actually one central goal. And that was a reference sequence of the human genome. And then there were subordinate goals, which was to sequence other organisms and develop the physical maps and genetic linkage maps and databases needed to get there. But it was a relatively focused objective. Um, moreover, there was only one technology that was really available to the job. Remember, I said that the idea happened in 1985. In 1985, the way you did DNA sequencing in the United States was generally P32 gels that you'd put in a freezer for three days, and you would be able to read out, if you were lucky, 100 base pairs. Um, was that going to generate a genome of, 30, of, of 3 billion base pairs? No way. Um, but by 1987, the uh, Caltech sequen sequenator that was then picked up by Applied Biosystems had become the dominant instrument. And um, it became to seem like, oh, maybe if we automate this stuff, we actually can generate enough sequence to create a reference sequence of the human being. Um, so that began in 1987. Um, and also the, the mapping and sequencing technologies, the, the way of handling large fragments through uh, cloning in bacteria and in yeast, handling uh, hundreds of thousands of bases instead of uh, the the lambda size sequences that we can handle with cloning technologies up until then. Uh, we're all developing in parallel. And really important, the United States and Europe had already reached an agreement on how to store DNA sequence in databases. The EMBL actually started it, and then NIH picked up on it very quickly in the late 1970s. They already had an agreement, and then later the DNA database of Japan joined what is still the International Sequencing Database Consortium, where the data are mirrored across, well, they aren't exactly mirrored, but they're shared across the three major databases for the whole globe. That agreement was already in place storing the data when the human genome was, pro was started. Uh, during the genome project, the transition was made from Los Alamos National Lab to the DNA, uh, the, the, to, to, uh, to NIH, basically, to the National Library of Medicine, uh, for, to the National Center for Biotechnology and uh, in Information at NLM. Another feature that I think is probably different is there were really only four, five countries involved in the Human Genome Project in the transition to full-scale sequencing. And that was the US and the UK, which paid for 91% of the sequencing. And then uh, Germany, Japan, and France. And then China joined in 1999 and did about 1% of the final sequence. The drivers were the National Institutes of Health and uh, the Wellcome Trust in the UK. And uh, at DOE, they created a new Joint Genome Institute in Walnut Creek, California, um, that kind of harnessed the talents of both Livermore, uh, Los Alamos, and the other national labs. Another feature that I hope you will be thinking about in connection with RNA work is the open science ethos that pervaded the Human Genome Project. Just, just to notice, though, if this project had emerged from human genetics, which was actually my field when I was in medical school and um, internship residency, everybody hoarded their data. You would create a pedigree. Um, you would do work with it, but you would hoard your data. You would not share it. Um, and uh, you would mine it for your whole career. Um, that was almost completely the opposite of what was happening in uh, nematode genetics. And it happened that uh, these two guys that you see lounging at, at Marco Island in Florida for one of the genome meetings years later, uh, it's Bob Waterston on the left and John Sulston on the right. Um, they, as the Human Genome Project was making its transition to full-scale sequencing in early 1996, the grants had been, the notices of awards had gone out, the money hadn't started to flow. And there was a meeting held in Bermuda. It was held in Bermuda precisely because it was halfway between Europe and the United States. And it was in February, so the weather was miserable and the hotels were cheap. Um, and they got representatives from all of the major labs. 
that we're going to be doing the high throughput sequencing for the Human Genome Project in one room, in one hotel, and hashed out a whole bunch of policies. One of those was, if you're getting the money from the government or from the Wellcome Trust, you're gonna share your DNA sequence data at the end of every day. It was a really radical pre-publication proposal that in fact was vigorously opposed by several of the people involved in the project, including Maynard Olson and Craig Venter. Um, but they managed to get it through. And what you see on the right there is uh, John Sulston scribbling on the whiteboard. Uh, it was a picture taken at Bermuda in the 1996 meeting that basically said, you're gonna release your sequence every, every day. Why did they do that? Well, one was the ethos of open science. Another was the politics of the Human Genome Project. This was big money going to a few institutions. And those institutions didn't want pushback. They wanted to make their data available to many, many other labs so that those labs wouldn't see the money going to them as being direct competition with the small lab work. Uh, it was, a, it was a, partly a political decision, but it was also a very practical decision. How are you, all these groups were saying, I'm going to do this part of chromosome 7 or chromosome 9 or chromosome 19. How do you know they're doing it? And how do you know whether the quality of the data is any good? Are you going to wait for a publication five years later, 10 years later? No way. They needed a way to give feedback to their own management decisions about who's going to sequence what and at what quality. So if you're going to make promises, we're going to be able to hold you accountable for those promises by looking at your data. Um, but it turned into kind of a spiritual, uh, as uh, Ari Petrinos from DOE uh, phrased it, a, a spiritual commitment to open science in this hub and spoke mechanism for doing science. Um, there was also a patent provision in here that actually got dropped before the, uh, as it made its way through NIH and the other institutions. One thing to note, however, is this was a commitment to sharing data every day, and the NIH the DOE and the Wellcome Trust all agreed to it relatively quickly, but it took two years and it required changes in policy in Germany, Japan, and France to abide by these rules. And in fact, they had to send some nasty letters. Francis Collins, Ari Petrinos, and Michael Morgan sent nasty letters to Japan and to Germany saying, if you wanna say you're part of the Human Genome Project, you gotta play by our rules and that's deposit your data every day. What was the sticking point? The sticking point was all three of those countries had agreements with industrial partners in that country to get privileged early access to the data. And daily deposit of the data was going to violate that agreement. So they had to get that tweaked and changed, create an exception for sharing data uh, for Germany, Japan, and France. That took two years. That may or may not be relevant to some of the con con considerations uh, you think of. Um, so Bermuda principles are in place by 1998, but another thing happens in 1998, which is uh, Applied Biosystems has developed a new instrument that is no longer dependent on slab gels, but switches to um, capillary gel electrophoresis much faster, uh, a lot higher throughput sequencing from these machines, just as accurate. Um, and as they were floating that machine, they said, hey, why don't we do our own human genome project? They went to Craig Venter, who was one of the pioneers of using the ABI machines at a time when they were not so popular. Um, he had left NIH and he had gone to the Institute for uh, Genomic Research up here in Maryland. Um, and they brought him on to head up a company that a few months later was named Solera. That then made the Human Genome Project, once again, the most prominent science policy um, uh, topic of discussion for years and uh, for the same reason of intense rivalry. Uh, in fact, this time it was really nasty between Solera and the, the publicly funded genome projects. Um, but it turned out there was a hearing uh, in the House of Representatives and um, the open science ethos of the Bermuda Principles was absolutely essential to keeping federal funding, U.S. federal funding for DOE and NIH going because they could say, hey, we've got these open science rules. Solera is saying they're going to make their data public, but will they really? It's a company and they're going to, they're going to behave according to the best interests of their stockholders, not necessarily the best interests of the country. That was really crucial. So the Bermuda 
principles that were adopted for practical reasons and then became spiritual reasons became very practical in 1998 with the emergence of Solera. The techniques were very different um, and we don't need to get into that, but basically the Human Genome Project broke the genome down into clone sized sequenceable segments of DNA whereas the Solera sequencing technique was to just take hold, the whole genome and sort it together, uh, assemble it in the computer. Ever since the Human Genome Project, there have been any number of proposals to do ideas, to, to pursue ideas in biology that try to capture the excitement and the political will of the Human Genome Project. Uh, a couple of them have worked really well and a couple of them have worked not so well. Uh, the Human Genome Diversity Project was cooked up by uh, Luca Cavalli Sforza. He wanted to sample human diversity all over the planet. He and Alan Wilson didn't agree on how to go about that. And moreover, they really didn't anticipate how the world would react to trying to do DNA sequencing and high throughput sequencing centers in Europe and North America when the samples were gonna be coming from all over the world. It became known in some circles as the Vampire Project. And um, it has continued at one level or, or another, but never under the flagship of the Human Genome Diversity Project. We can get into that. The Decade of the Brain came, the Brain Initiative came, uh, some other current projects, the Human Pan Genome Reference, uh, the consortium and the Earth Biogenome Project are doing, trying to do much better reference sequences in the case of HPRC, the human pan genome, to do uh, a much more thorough human reference sequence, kind of in the lineage of the Human Genome Project. And Earth Biogenome Project is trying to do for all nucleated organisms what has been done for the human genome, which is have a very high quality reference genome for. Uh, all the critters that have nuclei in their cells. Um, then uh, at the political level, we had the cancer, uh, the precision medicine initiative that President Obama announced and the cancer moonshot, which uh, has gotten reinfused with the Biden presidency. And, and now I guess this project. Um, here are some analogies. Everybody wants money and resources and infrastructure, coordination um, and Usually if you're flying the banner of the Human Genome Project, you want the excitement and the political will to sustain your project for a long period of time. But times have changed. Um, genomics is no longer the new kid on the block, it's now everywhere. And um, there is no one dominant technology. I think I've counted at least a dozen technologies that are essential to what you've been talking about today. You don't have one company making one instrument that everybody is using. Um, and um, I think the world of government, industry, academic relationships have gotten a whole lot more complicated, and I suspect that will influence the, the conduct of this project. Moreover, I mentioned that the U.S. and the U.K. accounted for 90 percent of the original reference sequence. I don't think that's likely to happen in any broader biological field these days. And, oh my gosh, think of all the stuff you're going to do with RNA. Um, it's a much, much broader set of goals than one reference sequence sitting in a database. So I wanted to end with some questions that you, those of you, especially on the committee, in your writing of a, of a policy report, um, I think these are some questions you want to address, which is why do we want to do this now? Um, and some combination, not only of the technical prospects, which are clearly going to be really important, but also Jane, you're, think of your grandmother at Thanksgiving. Why should she care about what you're doing? So why is it important and why are you planning to do it now? Is it gonna be global or national? Um, and specify what you're promising to do uh, with as much precision as you can. Um, and identify the communities from which it's emerging and the other communities that are gonna be affected by it. And those are equally important. There's a natural tendency in thinking about science policy to focus on the emerging technology from the stakeholders who generated it without thinking too carefully about the other constituencies that are gonna be affected by it. Um, and that's a, that's a thorny political problem. And then who's gonna care? What's gonna be different if this happens versus if it doesn't? And how are you gonna know?
So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, our second panelist is Mark Helm, who will be with us on video. Can we pull that up? Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce him. So Mark Helm is an associate professor of pharmaceutical chemistry at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany, and leads the Helm Group at the Institute of Molecular Biology. The Helm Group integrates disciplines from chemistry to biology, physics, bioinformatics, and pharmacy to advance research on nucleic acids, in particular on RNA. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. We can hear you. Then, all right. Um, so I have been asked to uh, report on a German research consortia. Uh, you will find they are several orders of magnitude smaller, of course, than the ones that Bob was referring to. Um, I think that's a given. And um, the slide shows the, the icons of those two. Um, and maybe in between, I'll um, show you some of the struggle and what went forward and backwards. So we're looking at two fundamentally different funding schemes. Uh, the first one is uh, SPP1784 entitled, or the title is Chemical Biology of um, Native Nucleic Acid Modifications. Uh, it ran two funding periods from 2015 to 18, and then from 18 to 21, where it then ended. And uh, this was uh, smack in the middle of the corona pandemic. And uh, because of that, and the lockdowns, the uh, DFG, or uh, principal funding body for such things in Germany actually gave us an extension of a couple of months. Um, and then at about the same time started our map, which is uh, by its structure completely different. And it is now in its first funding period of four years, uh, but our map can um, run as long as 12 years, um, of course, pending positive evaluation for subsequent funding periods. Um, so these two programs are from um, their intention fundamentally different. The uh, SPP could be roughly translated as a priority program and its goal by at least by the DFG are to support emerging fields, something like hot topics or something, but something which is um, not yet established. And uh, in contrast, the CRCs, Collaborative Research Centers in Germany, also abbreviated as SFB, they are meant to induce a local focus in uh, certain universities and their scientific environment. So with the uh, priority program, the hope or the ideas that you incite, PIs, that maybe do not work in exactly this field since, since it is emerging, but get them interested in joining and maybe um, dedicate some of their own house resources. Uh, the funding system in Germany is a bit different. There's um, a little more um, house money available, if you will, which is sometimes uh, seen as an endowment. It's not quite the same. But most PIs have a little bit of that available and can choose to invest it in a given research direction. And that's the intention here. Also to obviously former, uh, to foster corporations and maybe follow up consortia. In uh, a little bit of contrast, the CRCs want uh, local support, not nationwide because the SPPs are nationwide. Um, the rest of it is kind of the same, but you want to really induce a, a local focus. The SPPs have a separate pot. There's two rounds each year where an idea um, is written up to apply for such a pot. And if you win the pot, the money is dedicated to your particular topic. Um, one such pot is 10 to 11 million, so it's not um, like I said, outrageously much, but uh, 
to start up a topic, it's exceedingly helpful. Um, the, as you saw before, the uh, program ran a total of six years divided into two funding periods. And um, once the pot was dedicated, and that's um, a crucial difference to the CRCs, there is a nationwide call for, or was, uh, for single proposals. So any PI uh, in Germany could submit a project as long as it was roughly uh, geared towards the title. And then there was something like a player versus player uh, decision where um, everything was evaluated, uh, everybody against everybody else, and the top projects were uh, funded. So it was a yeah, player versus player competition, if you will. In uh, the SFB, there's also an extra pot, but there you um, uh, have different funding periods. So as I said, possibly up to 12 years. It is uh, in the overall 30 to 50 M euros. It can be one or two, maybe three cities as a focus. And here, um, the slogan that um, I think of is, uh, you live together or you die together. That is, you apply as a group and the entire group succeeds or nobody does. So this is uh, fundamentally different from the player versus player in the special priority program. So at a close, closer look at the uh, SPP, um, we turned in the principal application. So that was the quest to dedicate a pot of money to nucleic acid modifications. And that was mostly RNA in 2013. And that was under the impression of two um, defining papers of uh, mapping M6A by what we now know as MIRIP, um, about a year earlier than that. The application was approved and then there was a call for single projects in 2014. Uh, subsequent to this ran those two funding periods that I already mentioned. And then there was a Corona-based extension until about a year ago. The lead questions that we asked were, uh, with respect to nucleic acid modifications um, to be seen in atomic detail. That was meant to get everybody used to the idea that these uh, things that we look at aren't letters or nucleobases, but very specific chemical alterations, which was uh, sometimes overlooked um, by part of the community at the time. And um, along these lines, the principal questions were where do we find modifications? So there was a definite uh, identification and mapping compound in there. How do they get there? That is, which enzymes do deposit the modifications? And then why is the obviously the question for biological function? The uh, outcome was that over the six years, there were 38 PIs to receive funding, typically um, a PhD student and consumables for three years or something like this. Um, the focus as was defined in the title was on chemical biology, um, hence the um, notion of atomic detail. Uh, specifically requested was, or, or encouraged let's say, was uh, application of mass spec of sequencing, but also of chemical organic synthesis, say phosphamidides or some such structural biology, um, because it would provide insight at atomic detail resolution. And um, it also had a um, significant component on biochemistry and molecular biology, typically enzymology, and then moving all the way into cell biology. Uh, in the latter case, we encouraged uh, PIs to apply in uh, tandem projects where one PI would cover the atomic detail aspect and the other one would go into um, biology, say knockouts or, or imaging or some such. Altogether, what came out were uh, 250 papers, which I think is uh, quite honorable. Uh, 100 of them were impact factor better than 10. 
and uh, five and what you would, um, I guess, call the big five. So um, nature, science, cell, and so on. Um, so um, from that point of view, I think the uh, the turnout is terrific, but it was also very much based on uh, what I mentioned before, that people were investing their in-house resources into the topic in um, what you would probably call a synergy. Um, 14 job offers resulted to people who had received funding. Um, and I flatter myself by thinking that it was also in large part because of this funding. And that included um, five junior PIs. And then there were follow-up SFBs or CRCs, um, where the notion is it cannot be on the same topic, um, but the field had by then, six years later, advanced quite a bit. So the, the details of, of those new research initiatives um, were not really on the same topic and had moved um, with the field. So there is our map, TR319, which um, is two-centered. Part, half of it is in Mainz and the other um, half is in Heidelberg. Um, I will um, give some more details in a minute or so. And then there is an SFP in Munich led by uh, Thomas Karel, Chemical Biology of Epigenetic Modifications, where maybe um, a third or so is on RNA modifications and the remainder on protein and DNA modifications. Um, so um, here are the people who participated. Um, I'm obviously not going to cite all the names, but um, people in the field probably know at least half of these people, maybe more. Um, and like I said, um, this was all of these people are still uh, up and running in the field and in science. So then um, RMAP started officially in uh, July 21. And we're now in somewhere in the middle of the first funding period. Um, the process involved a uh, pre-proposal, couple of pages submission in uh, fall of uh, 2019, which was then evaluated in Bonn at the DFG. So we had we were five or six people to go there and answer questions. Um, we were then encouraged to submit a full proposal in November 2020 and were evaluated uh, by video conference. Normally, it would have been on site and in person, but due to um, Corona, this was all done by, um, well, like you see me now, right, by video, video conference. And then the funding started in July. Um, uh, intermittently, uh, we had uh, a larger meeting. The uh, German Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology has this flagship meeting in Moosbach. And uh, in uh, about this time last year was the handover. Uh, so um, the SPP kind of left and our map um, kicked off. You can see um, we had quite a few uh, speakers from the field here to the left on the list. And uh, these are now the people that are uh, part of our map. Um, uh, again, homies know uh, many of those. Um, a lot of us will be meeting in Ventura in a couple of days, I guess. So um, these are on two sites at, in Mainz at the Johannes Gutenberg University, and then in Heidelberg at obviously Heidelberg University. And then there's the German Cancer research center, which also hosts some of the participants. Um, we have um, a steering or advisory um, board. Uh, Eva Novoa is, I think, also engaged in this workshop. Um, the uh, technologies you will find represented also here in the board um, reflect to a degree the, the uh, intentions and philosophy in, in our map. So we put a lot of stock in technology, also in, in quality control to um, establish foundations, which uh, I think are very important in terms of uh, analytics to support biological research. 
So um, here is a um, structure. Uh, what you see in green are projects of people who know their modification and think um, these modifications will to some level influence RNA modification, uh, excuse me, processing. So that's why the area is called uh, modifications look for processing. And then um, the B area here in blue is uh, the other way around. In the middle, you find some projects which are already homing in on specific details of how modifications and processing influence each other. And in the end, this is what defines the uh, epitranscriptome that we're all looking to, right? It's not the modification alone. It's not the transcriptome and then the length of the RNA. It's, it's the combination of both. And then on the bottom is our technical or technology uh, foundations, if you will, with uh, three pillars, I would say. There is a substantial portion dedicated to mass spec, that is to the right, CO3. Mass spec in both proteomics in uh, nucleosides and in oligonucleotides. Then we have in the middle a uh, uh, data management and data science project. And we have uh, significant efforts in developing new sequencing methods. And um, there is abundant experience in all of these three fields. And that is why we are very um, conscious of uh, the topic under discussion here, I think. Um, how can we get a handle on, well, storing it all, supervised quality, and make it accessible to everybody at the same level. Um, uh, I apologize for this, but um, I just uh, cannot help myself. <laughs> this is a, a result from a paper, an early paper from my lab mapping a modification M1A. And you can see some quality results to the left sensitivity, sensitivity, specificity, and so on and so forth, which all were at like 95% perfect. Um, under normal circumstances, 95% is really good. Um, at the time, we said, well, that's okay if you want to look in tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs, um, but no further. Actually, uh, the reviewers, or one of the reviewers said, so now you take this uh, mapping method and you apply this to, do apply it to a transcriptome, uh, the full scale. And we said, um, absolutely not. And uh, this is something that I've been showing uh, yeah, now eight years ago on several conferences. I'm still not sure if it struck home with everybody that if you have 95% perfection in your mapping parameters and you're looking at a transcriptome of maybe 10 to the power of seven nucleotides, um, you expect 10 to the power of four to 10 to the power of five false positives. And if you look at the various mapping papers, strangely, that is just about the number that many of them come up with. Um, I do make an exception for M6A because we know there is uh, a lot of M6A in messenger RNA, um, but uh, the colored stuff on the bottom right is where we need to get if we are serious about this. And that will take a lot more effort than um, single groups are currently prepared to invest to make a mapping method really, really solid and reproducible to everybody. And that is something that we try to address in our map as well. Um, here's something from the mass spec department. These are structures of modifications that have not been published yet. Oh, there's one exception, but um, these are not in your book, at least probably not. Um, these occur in everyday RNA, mostly in uh, E. coli, but they will mess up your mapping method if you don't get a hold of them. So uh, some of these will give signals in nanopores, some of them will give signals in Illumina sequencing or in reverse transcription um, until we have found all of them and know at least how much of these there is, there will still be quality issues. Um, fortunately, you can see them by mass spec, at least we can find them, but we cannot, it is hard to position them. That's a really a challenge. And then finally, our map um, is also heavily interested in uh, nanopores. So we um, 
are just issuing uh, a challenge and we hope we can collect a large part of the community because there are really many people who um, try to make Nanopore work for mapping RNA modifications. But if the previous history of what I just told you is any indication, um, there it'll be some time to come before this is uh, so solid um, and standardized that we can all use it um, without being afraid of artifacts, if I may say so. And with that, I'm at the end and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, that was terrific. Um, this was a big topic, so unsurprisingly, our, our speakers took some time and I'm glad they did. Um, can we borrow a little bit from the break? Yeah, so uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So please feel free to come up to the microphone or use Slido. And while that's happening, I will read the first question from Slido. So this is about four questions and um, three of them are directed to Bob, um, but the last one I'd like to direct to you both. So I'll, I'll read them all. Um, first, a, a statement that get, getting industry engaged in sequencing RNA modifications is key. What do you think motivated Craig Venter when he created Solera, profits from Pratt, excuse me, profits from patenting sequences, that's almost a tongue twister, something else. And then the final question that I'd like to direct to you both is what can we do to get industry engaged in RNA beyond, I guess, the current level of involvement? So do I need to press something yes. here? Okay. So um, in answer to the question about um, what motivated um, Craig Venter? I would put the, the the first answer that comes to mind is ego, but um, the second answer that comes to mind is the incredible possibility of taking the technology that he favored, which was shotgun sequencing, and demonstrating that it would work. And actually, the idea for Solera didn't come from him; it came from Mike Concapiller and the folks at ABI, who then went out and got Craig Venter interested in doing it. But it was a great big adventure. Um, and actually, you know, he kind of shook the cage at uh, DOE and NIH and the Wellcome Trust and inadvertently probably got the fractious forces of the Public Genome Project to actually start cooperating and really accelerating their, their efforts. So um, competition between NIH was really important and with um, between Solera and, and uh, the Public Genome Project was also really important and I think probably healthy for all of us in the long run. Um, the question about what was it that ABI was expecting, and that was they were going to sell their instruments to the Public Genome Project, but they were also going to be able to demonstrate incredible power from using their uh, instrument to all sorts of users. And this is at a moment when it was becoming obvious that DNA sequencing was the new technology, was the hot kid on the block, and it was going to be directly relevant for um biotechnology and uh, drug discovery at the very least, and all sorts of other applications. So um, I think they wanted to expand their market, and um, they were thinking that uh, this was a good way to do it. And you know what? It was pretty high floating. I mean, one of the things that motivates the CEOs of companies to see their name in the, in the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, the public media, and this was a really, really good way to get out there. And then the, the final piece is, is considering the possibility of this RNA modifications focus pro project, um, any lessons in terms of getting industry engaged? You know, I, did, I didn't even mention it. So this gives me an opportunity to mention it. I think um, you need to have a strategy. Um, and I don't know enough about the field to say anything really very concrete about it, except the following. Um, the open science ethos has always operated in parallel with proprietary science. That was true in the Human Genome Project, and it's going to be true for almost every area, particularly in, in biotechnology. And they are not incompatible. But one thing that you might look of, th those of you on staff who are thinking about writing this stuff up, one of the models for doing really fundamental work that really matters for industry is the Structural Genomics Consortium that maybe you have already talked to, uh, which has a completely open science ethos, 
but is also very, very tightly associated with industry users of the products. So their rules are no patents on the stuff that comes into the reference sequence and the reference resources that we create. And we don't want patents because we start squabbling with each other as soon as we have them. But you know what? We are really happy if you take our stuff and turn it into something useful. And the vetting process for deciding what targets to do, uh, what probes to make and stuff like that is heavily influenced by industry going to the structural genomics consortium and saying, hey, this is what would be really, really helpful for us. So all of pharmaceutical and biotech companies can put their list together, but it doesn't become public. And then they assemble the list and say, here's what, how we're going to allocate the science. But if you do that science, it's going to be published and completely openly available to everybody. So uh, that's one way that you can have open science and at the same time, push advanced science and, and new technologies, but at the same time, really enable all sorts of industrial applications. It's a really sophisticated uh, model. Thank you. And, and Mark, any comments on the role of industry in, in Germany? I would say that um, as we see an increasing number of RNA medications being admitted by EMA and FDA, um, we will see that the standards for analytics will come up. Um, they're not there yet, but they will. That is the normal uh, way that things go. And at that point, the demand for these analytics will increase and the companies will cater to it. And, um, you know, the, the, um, it's not just messenger RNA, the, all the new SI RNAs that have come, come up lately. Um, that would be an incredible market, I'm sure. So from that, from that direction, there will be a lot. And then obviously if the companies perceive that the life sciences, uh, research sector, uh, has enough purchasing power for this, you know, what, what you're about to negotiate, they will also cater to that. I'm quite convinced. Thank you. Um, Brenda, would you like to ask a question? Yes. Uh, so um, first, just thank you both to, to Bob and Mark for uh, great talks. And, and this question is actually to you, Mark, because um, Bob introduced this concept of um, sharing freely the, the data. And I'm wondering in your uh, groups uh, and consortiums, do you have agreements, uh, you know, and can you tell us anything about databases that uh, have resulted or are ongoing with your groups? Yes, the DFG uh, stipulates uh, a, a code of conduct for research that involves data management uh, and that you have to uh, keep it and to make it accessible on a similar way that many journals nowadays do in open repositories. And because of that, um, we actually have one of our essential um, projects, which is a database and that will make the data available to like everybody. Thank you. So one final question from Slido from a committee member, how often do or did unexpected challenges arise? Um, give examples and how were the challenges resolved? And in the interest of time, maybe just one example, either of you. Mark, go ahead. I wanna think on that one for a minute. Unexpected challenges. Well, I mean, it's research. <laughs> everything is that hopefully everything is unexpected. If if you could plan the experiments, it would be development. <laughs> um, I I think the um, I, I when we started say with the uh, priority program, um, I had actually hoped that um, the mapping technology would be a lot less noisy or would have been developed into something a lot less noisy than it is these days. And I think that's really uh, something that for us is a problem and to the to the field in general. So and in the case of the the genome project, i'll I'll think about that specifically that I think the biggest shock was uh, the emergence of Solera. Um, about six years into the project. I don't think um, anybody at the beginning was thinking there was gonna be a privately funded genome project 
And just to flag it a little bit, um, there was actually an editorial run as soon as Solera was created by uh, Bill Hazeltine in the New York Times saying, why do we need a public genome project when Solera is going to go ahead and do it? Um, and that actually became quite a political, technical, and sociological challenge for the folks engaged in the public genome project, both to keep it alive, but also to accelerate it and reconfigure how they were going to go about it. And it also led to the earlier um, release, public release and assembly of the sequence that was published in back-to-back uh, -back in February of uh, 2001 by both Solera and the public genome project. Um, so I, th I think that was probably the biggest thing out, out of the blue. Thank you. Um, one more round of applause and you're due for a break. So um, that's next. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> yes, there's coffee and snacks outside. We'll still try to reconnect. All right. All right, welcome back everyone. I apologize for the exceptionally short break. Um, we have folks who are joining us virtually who are on schedules, but I'm going to pass it over to Juan to get us started on the last session of the day. Well, the last session of the day is on the on major concerns and possible pitfalls related to sequencing and mapping of RNA modifications, or what I call the friendly critics, and I underline friendly. <laughs> so the, my name is Juan Alfonso. I'm a microbiology professor and director of the Center for RNA Biology at The Ohio State University. And uh, the goals of this session, and I'll be brief, is to really raise any concerns. And they gave me a lot of things to post possible goals. I summarize them as what does success looks like and what does failure looks like and why are we so worried? And is this going to be impactful? A very simple thing to address, I think. And the, I introduce the panelists. But before I do that, I remind the panelists that uh, on their side, they will have about five minutes to make their remarks. And we try our best to keep to five minutes. Todd Law better pay attention. And, um, and the panelists are indeed Todd Law, who is a professor in the Department of Biomolecular Engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's an adenomics guy. In, uh, there is, of course, Shraga Schwartz, who is a principal investigator in the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Weizmann Institute, and his lab works on mRNA modification and how it regulate, uh, regulates gene expression. Then there is Wendy Gilbert, who is an associate professor of molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University. And uh, again, she's on the mRNA side, also addressing the issue of, of, cellular, of, of gene expression and, and regulation via modifications. And lastly, but not leastly, <laughs> it is uh, Rachel Green, who is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. And of course, Rachel, everybody knows this translation, translation, translation. <laughs> and uh, with that, Todd, are you on? I'm on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Yes. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I have to say I am a, a friendly critic. Uh, I'm uh, quite hardened with uh, all the expertise that we've heard uh, today. I, I'm a lot less worried than I was before today in hearing um, all the different aspects uh, that are really being carefully considered here. So um, I just have a few bullet points that I want to go over. Um, uh, I think one of the things, of course, that has been seen with um, with other uh, functional um, um, characterization programs is you can't do everything everywhere all at once. And so I think the sample selection is going to be really critical. And um, I think uh, as the German group RMAP showed, you know, doing multiple rounds where you can see, um, and you can see where you're filling in the, the holes and where things have to be done in the future. We won't, we won't be able to, to get all the samples right, um, but there are gonna be some um, conditions and, and, um, and tissue systems that are more similar than others. And so I think, um, I think there should be multiple stages at which um, 
um, sort of uh, there's a there's a full reevaluation. Again, it sounds like the, the German program did a really good job of having multiple rounds of that. I also think that the the multiomics approach that Gene talked about and others talked about is really critical and that that should be framed at the beginning, not in the middle or at the end, exactly how all the data is going to be uh, integrated. Um, and uh, so uh, I think also I'm glad to see that all the different technologies that are being considered. I haven't heard a lot about uh, the, the um, Illumina sort of primer extension based technologies, but those those are those have the advantages of being very fast and being very good at finding certain modifications fairly cheaply. So uh, I hope that there's a really integrated approach between mass spec, um, the nanopore, and then um, primer extension, you know, Illumina. Uh, based approaches. Um, I think, um, let's see, um, I, I second the, the need to do model organisms. I think looking at the evolution of modifications and the evolution of regulation of modifications, at the end, we don't want just sort of, you know, a set of modifications. We want to model where and when modifications are occurring. And so I think, again, that should be part of the framework at the beginning. And so I think the computational models that include multiomics, expression levels of, uh, of the different modification enzymes. And then I think the goal should be, um, you know, it's a big goal to be able to predict, just like we annotate genomes that no one ever uh, touches. We annotate all the genes and we, we predict functions. I think we should be trying to, to collect enough data that we have models for all the modification enzymes and when they're on. And that, of course, uses epi epigenomic data as well as um, uh, mRNA data and, and all the other different omics datas. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it'd be cool to sort of have kind of a CASP competition at the end where, where you have groups who are already, you know, thinking about integrating all the different kinds of data with all these different kinds of technologies. And being able to predict, you know, uh, modifications for um, well-known RNAs and less well-known RNAs based on the motifs, the um, the state of other uh, of, of all the other molecules that you can measure uh, in chromatin state. So, um, so I guess my my take home is um, I, I really hope that it's um, it's we we start from the beginning of thinking we want to train. Uh, a model that we, we can understand when and where modifications are being made so that we can, and if we're good at that, we can predict a lot of them. And even though we won't be 100% yes or no, I think we can put a probability on how sure we are. And so since I work on tRNAs, um, I think you know we're working on trying to, to annotate all the modifications and all the tRNAs based on the, t the, the enzymes that are available on each genome. And if you do massive comparative genomics, as well as um, um, train it with all the data that's going to be collected in this project, I think it's a it's a real goal that should be um, attainable. So, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that and um, pass it on. Our next speaker is Sharagi Shorts. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Okay, so I'll also start by saying that um, I feel like we just had a somewhat adversarial kind of uh, goal here. This is concerns of the vetted from the people. As I said, I can start highlighting as well. But actually, you're, yes, breaking down, you're breaking down. You're breaking down a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, or breaking up, sorry. <laughs> breaking down. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> I'm breaking. Uh, <laughs> um, is this in better? You can you can switch the video off, and that would maybe we will hear you. Is this any better? Is this better? No, <laughs> try again. <laughs> no, you're still breaking down. Um, Break, breaking up, sorry. So you know what? Why don't I'll plug up? Somebody else should talk, and I'll join later. Okay, so we'll move to Wendy then, if Wendy's ready. I'm here. Do I sound clear? Perfect. Great. So I'm 
pleased and a little surprised to be included among the friendly skeptics. I don't think of myself as an RNA modification skeptic. I'm an enthusiast. Um, I want to make just two points about the program. The first is the title, which emphasizes mapping. Where are the mods? and says nothing about their function. And I think that this focus is representative of the mRNA modifications field over the last decade. And I think that we need to consider the emphasis. From my perspective, there are a small number of compelling examples where a single modified nucleoside in a messenger RNA has an ascribable molecular function for the activity of that mRNA. And it's those examples that convince me that it's worth mapping the mods. But I think if our efforts are too focused on cataloging and don't do enough rigorous functional study that the value of the catalog is not clear. The second point I want to make is about why we're cataloging and what is most important to find. To me, one of the really exciting aspects of studying RNA modifying enzymes comes from genetic evidence that they are critical for human health. And that means if you have an RNA modifying enzyme that is important for healthy development, you want to know which RNA targets are important for healthy development. And there is really no guarantee what class of RNA will be the relevant target or how highly expressed the relevant target will be. And so one of my concerns about the roadmap for how we go about identifying all the mods is to make sure that we're thinking about lowly expressed transcripts potentially being the most biologically significant ones. Those are the only two points I wanted to make right now. Except for TRNAs, sorry. Okay, next we go to Rachel in case Shrag is not ready. Okay, so I just would echo a number of things Wendy said. I don't know why I've been invited as a critic. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here and learning about an exciting project and how you're thinking about it. And I guess I'd make a few points. I should say I'm not a particular expert in the area. Unlike Wendy, I don't study modifications. What's that? No, I know. Wendy does study modifications, whereas I don't per se. I also don't tend to be a big science person, so I tend to think on a smaller scale. And my joke would be, I didn't even think Moderna was a very good idea. So, you know, you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. As a biologist, I'm really interested for sure in what all the RNAs look like. I am interested in what they look like from head to toe, and that would include modifications. But I, I guess I would uh, again echo Wendy, which is in terms of the title of the project, to me, it's a title instead of I, her focus was a little different. For me, it's a title that's focused on RNA modifications. What I want to know is head to toe, I want to know the five prime UTR, the three prime UTR, and all the splicing isoforms, where we for sure know there's huge biology there. And so for me, the title, by limiting it to epitranscriptome, is a focus on modifications rather than those other features, which are the really safe place to be from my perspective as an outsider. So I guess that would be my thought on the title. I thought there were all sorts of great comments today from, from Bob and from Gene and Obviously, the issue here is these projects take money, and if money goes into this, it comes away from something else, and so that's why we're all being thoughtful about how to focus this. If Elon Musk were paying, we we should definitely look for all the we should look for all the modifications. 
So, but the, you know, that's the balance and certainly always on the, on the, on the one side, all these projects lead to increases in technology and discoveries that we don't anticipate. And obviously that's, that's a huge positive. And on the negative, it takes away from other sort of, I guess, the flowers you referred to, the thousand flowers. And that's, that's the challenge. I guess I would close by just, if I were a skeptic, I would say what I, I loved Kristen's talk. I loved the way she focused on quantifying with mass spec and then going to look at it through sequencing. I like the questions that she posed about what would one would want to know if one were going to map a particular modification. And I guess if I were to give a little bit of pushback, I would say she has these beautiful data that she showed us today where you have a 100% modification at a given site and the ribosome makes an error of about 1%. And I think many of the modifications of interest here are nowhere near 100%. And if the consequence of a 100% modification of SUDU is a 1% fidelity phenotype, possibly in an inconsistent way, I guess one should then step back and say, how much biology are we chasing there? If it's easy to map the SUDUs, that's great, then we should do it. If it's super hard, and that, you know, that, that, that to me is the struggle. And so I, I think it was a beautiful example of, you know, what it, we, we we don't know everything it might result in. That's one assay. That's an in vitro assay. It's not the whole story. But I guess that's where I would pause and think, which are the modifications that likely have biological function? And that's, I think, where Wendy's coming from as well. So that's those are my main points, I guess. Shiragi? Yes. Is this better now? Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. There is a storm here in California, so I think the Wi-Fi is a bit off. But I'm going to do my best. Um, so first of all, I feel I was given somewhat of an adversarial role here in joining a panel, um, you know, that has to do with, with skepticism and criticism. And I also want to point out that there's actually a lot of enthusiasm on my end for this. And I think this is an opportunity both for community building and also for establishing of standards. So both in the, um, on the experimental side and on the computational side, I think there are a lot of things we need, we need to work through and it's an, an opportunity to form consensus in the field, um, that, that really needs a lot more of that. Now, putting this on the side, I was thinking kind of of three main directions um, in which I kind of had thoughts. And I think the first thing is I'm seeing dozens of people here. And I think, I think a fundamental question here is when we're talking about the epitranscriptome, what are we even talking about? And I think if we were to ask everyone here in the panel, we'd get a very different set of answers. And I think that the, the reason is that epitranscriptome was never a scientifically rigorously defined kind of term. It was, I, I think it's more of a buzzword, something that kind of was aimed to putting a community together around a new concept, but, but, but I don't think we really, any of us really know what it means. So when we talk about the epitranscriptome, are we talking about mRNA or are we talking also about tRNAs and are we talking about ribosomal RNAs? Um, are we talking only about internal modifications or are we also talking about modifications at extremities? Are we talking about cap modifications? Are we talking about poly A tailing? Are we only talking about ones that are introduced by enzymes or perhaps also ones introduced by damage? I, I, I think to me at least, it's not a very well-defined term. And depending on how we define it, there would be very different approaches for how to pursue a project in, 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 in this context. I think another major kind of question is how abundant must the modification be to even be included here? I think many of the modifications that people often like to include when, when discussing the epitranscriptome in exciting reviews, many of these modifications are barely there, if, if, if at all. So again, I feel there's a real question there about what do we actually want to include? Another thing I want to highlight, and it's already been highlighted perhaps by others, but just kind of to make a clear point is that in contrast to studies like um, ENCODE and so forth, where, where one could apply a single kind of technique and apply it widely for, for example, for profiling of different histone marks or so forth, where basically all of it was using ChIP-seq, Every modification is a world of its own, and it has a set of techniques of its own, and all of it is still a lot, to a large extent, work under progress, um, or at least for some modifications. So, so I feel really talking about all of the modifications as, as if there, there's some single batch which we can interrogate using a single way. It's just, it's, 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 it's not the way to think about it. I think for some modifications, we're at a very mature state. I'm sorry. For others, we're at a very immature state from a methodological standpoint. And part of what makes this difficult is 
that we even lack gold standards here. So in many cases, we develop a technique, we use it to map modifications for the first time, but we have nothing to calibrate it against. So, so, so really depending on the modification, also from a methodological point where they're very different, um, uh, uh, there are different aspects. And finally, again, the heterogeneity of modifications, to me at least, also raises the question of what are the most interesting dimensions to profile if we're talking about sequencing the EPI transcriptome. And again, I would argue that for different modifications, the answers will be completely different. For some modifications where we, some modifications, the key question is, do they even exist? And I would say that, you know, there's no point in kind of profiling it widely and so forth if there are severe doubts about its, even, about its existence. In other contexts, it might be differences between individuals if we have reason to suspect that that might be of interest. In other cases, it could have to do between, uh, with cellular dynamics or changes or stress responses and so forth. But in other cases, it might also be subcellular dynamics. So how it transitions across different compartments within the cells. Um, uh, in other contexts, it might be reversibility. If we have reason to suspect that it might be reversible. So I, I, I think we really need to consider that while we tr we're trying to lump a lot of things into this notion of an epitranscriptome, it's highly diverse and non-uniform and it can be, and depending on how we define it, I think it will define a completely different outline for how we go about dissecting it and what questions we choose to ask. So I'll end here and happy to discuss further. Okay, with that, we'll open it for questions. So we have several questions from committee members <clears throat> while, while you guys warm up your engines. And then um, one of the questions is, what can we do with current technologies? What are the hurdles and what will hold us back? What are the workforce challenges, specifically in training? It's a big question. It's for all of you. <laughs> it's four questions. It's not one. I'll answer the last question about workforce training, which is that, can you hear me? Yes. That we need training in computational biology to be a core part of our undergraduate training in modern biology. So that when students arrive to start a PhD, they are not already excluded from the cutting edge of many fields, including RNA modifications. Thanks, Kate. Um, so since Elon Musk has his money tied up in other things, you know, I get the sense too from what money on the panel just said that we're gonna need to somehow prioritize what we wanna go after, right? So I'm curious what all of your thoughts are as to how to do that. You know, how do we choose which modifications or which species of RNA? Um, and I, I imagine I would get four different answers if you were to all chime in on this one, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of how we can prioritize what, what, is, what are the first important things that we should be focusing on? I'm happy to take, I mean, I, I'm happy to take a first shot, which is, I mean, I, that was the other thing I was muddling, which is clearly some things we can do immediately. You guys are ready to go on the splicing isoforms and the five prime and three prime, like that's ready to go. And so I guess that I, I don't have the answer, but the question is how many other ones do you need to figure out? How many do you want to wait for before you launch? Which is, I think, sort of what Gene said. How do you how many controls do you do? How, when do you decide to go ahead that you, you're, you're good enough to go? M6A is the most abundant, probably, almost certainly. And there's dedicated enzymes that don't also modify tRNA. That one seems very safe. And you're getting good at that. So then to me, all the other ones from the outside look hard and there's less strong evidence for function. And so, but that's my, I didn't believe in Moderna. Um, I, I, I'm also happy to, um, to respond. And actually, I agree quite a bit with uh, what Rachel was just saying. I think there are aspects that are relatively easy to prioritize on, which have to do with the abundance of the modification, with an established function for the modification. Um, and I really think that, that in the, at the intersection of these two, there's only a single modification, which, uh, you know, which were for 
which is there, which is basically M6A. I think if it comes to pure abundance, then pseudouridine is another abundant one, and it's kind of it has been tied also to some additional aspects. So if I had to prioritize a second one, it would probably be that one. But as soon as you go down from there, you go down massively in terms of abundance. And you're also dealing with a lot of enzymes whose prime targets are with tRNA modifications and so forth. And then you always have to worry about is what we're seeing simply some spillover effect from modifications that were initially geared and evolved to modify completely different targets. Um, so, you know, so if, I, I think depending on how much money there is, you know, if, if, if we say we, we have a finite amount of money and you want to prioritize one, then I go for MC. If, say if it's two, I go for pseudouridine. And depending on the money, one can use the same kind of criteria to prioritize additional modifications. So, yeah, so I agree with those as well. I think um, from the, the non-mRNA perspective, I think modifications that uh, interrupt base pairing, so alter structure, um, I think that's one of the things that's pretty easy. It happens to be easy also because it in interferes with the reverse transcriptase. And so considering the speed and how quickly we can profile a lot of samples, uh, even for tRNAs with these new enzymes that are highly processive, I think in terms of tRNAs, you know, they're a bonanza of learning what, um, what the signal looks like when you pass things through. Nanopores are a little more difficult because the, the window that you have to sort of train all different kinds of modifications that can be close together. But I'd say um, the ones that, that you can get easy, easily and um, and you know, I think people are going to be pretty shocked at how much how many how much dynamics there are in tRNAs themselves, and that's that's really altering uh, the picture a lot more because people haven't been defining the mix of tRNAs and the different isodecoder families. So from our perspective, I would say uh, each each sub -commun community is going to have their their priorities and the easiest ones they can go after. Let those subgroups define those. Um, and, um, and, and then take a first pass that because just like all these other projects, the first pass is, all, the day is always gonna be crappy compared to the second and third pass. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get at least a first pass at, at the ones that you can get. So I, I think getting a draft, uh, at least a, a, a low resolution draft of lots of things and then figure out where you wanna put your money after that. So I think in answering this question, I can fully inhabit my role as a skeptic. I am a skeptic of central planning. <laughs> so I suppose at some level that makes me a skeptic of this project. Um, I'm not disparaging the value of data that has been generated by coordinated large scale projects. The completion of the human genome sequence is probably the best example. Um, but I think you would get different answers from each of us about what would be the most interesting project related to RNA modifications. And I think that's the strength of the community. But, so but for example, to me, what is a compelling motivation are disease connections of RNA modifying enzymes where there's not an obvious molecular explanation. And so for example, there's a pseudouridine synthase that's not known to have tRNA targets that appears to be a host factor for replication of an RNA virus. I find that interesting. And if I were asking NIAID for funding for the project, the motivation for the project would be the importance of that virus for human health and the evidence that this host factor is important for that virus's life cycle. But I would certainly not make a case to this large community that that should make it into the top 10 list of priorities. But I'll just throw in, it really is useful though to have at least some basic set of samples that everybody looks at, because then you really get a deep um, complex look at those. And I really like the, uh, the epigenomic roadmap um, that, um, that, that I've been using for years and years afterwards because they didn't discriminate against non-coding RNAs. Uh, but it, it was, it's really deep data. It's got lots of different kinds of data in there and they have all these mature tissues and as well as cell lines. And that's something else that I think um, if we can get a, a nice pass for, with lots of different perspectives, I, I, think, I think that's the one advantage. 
but absolutely there, there are going to be subgroups and, and subclasses where you don't need need everybody to, to analyze the same samples and it won't be practical. So, so when, the, when this point is a perfect segue for one of the committee members' questions, what is the cost of doing nothing? <laughs> Any of you? <laughs> well, I, there will still be grants awarded on this. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, I don't have any. Go on, Wendy, you please. I think there is a missed opportunity for synergy. I agree that there's good scientists who are excited about relevant RNA modifying enzymes who will keep studying them, but that if we miss this moment of hurting cats like me to get in line and say, okay, even if my pet project is not on the priority list, I recognize that if I design my experiments and communicate my results and relate them to standards that are agreed upon throughout the field, that the opportunities for springboarding the whole field um, are great and would be lost. So now we have, we think- Maybe I'll just add that other thing, which is the other thing I, you have technology that's raring to go and with any big project will come huge improvements in that. And so that'll drive new things. Yeah. So that's an obvious benefit. So, so with that, we move to one of the committee that was going to ask committee members to ask a question. And um, Sarah, I ask you to please address it to someone in particular in the panel, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try to pose the question and then I'll try to find a, a member who would be able to answer. Uh, so, um, I mean, the idea is that uh, if there is an abundant modification, it's more valuable, but most of our knowledge and abundant modifications are for model systems. And there is this discussion on what would happen in non model or other species. What if, hypothetically speaking, there are modifications which are abundant in the systems that we have not explored? And if you go that, down the road of picking up, cherry picking up, right? Few, few of these modifications and start focusing on it. So that was my question. And a uh, segue, a comment to that is some of the beautiful technologies, I'm a, a supporter of Nanopore or likewise technologies which can enable generation of data once and reuse of data multiple times. And for instance, you could generate data, build models for modification A today, build models for a modification two, 10 years down the line, you can still use the data, right? So there are possibilities of generating data end-to-end uh, -end, and then worrying about building models, uh, standards, uh, specific standards for modifications at a later point. So that was a comment more of a, but I'm, I'm interested in knowing the answer for the question first. Uh, this question is for, I would say, everyone. Nice. Well, I think Todd might be a person to speak to distribution of RNA modifying enzymes in biology because of his interest in evolution and conservation. To me, it's very compelling that dihydrouridine synthases are conserved across all domains of life. So clearly biology has thought they were important, even though it seems that you can delete all of them from the model you carry at budding yeast and the cells are a little bit sick, but very much alive. Yeah, no, I, I, I think um, a careful look at the protein families and the evolution of the RNA modifying enzymes in, in, a, in a sort of a theoretical evolutionary framework should guide where we do our sample collection. We don't wanna do a whole bunch of gamma proteobacteria, for example, again. We want to do. We want to spread it out, and I think I think there should be a you know one fund that says sort of orphan disease or hey this organism is really weird but boy it has some odd I mean trypanosomes are pretty weird too right and look at all the neat biology we have from them so I, I would say um, absolutely the the planning shouldn't just be okay well we're going to do the standard tissues and and the the five model organisms and stuff like that. I think there should be a, a competition or, or so, you know, a, even a, a meeting that talks about how to get the best diversity. Um, uh, Jonathan Eisen did a fantastic job of, of, of sampling um, uh, bacterial genomes um, and, and getting DOE to, to, to sequence across lots of, lots of different clades that had never been sampled. 
I, I, it'd be fantastic if we can do that because I think if you match the targets that vary, for example, with tRNAs, it's easy to see the tRNA ones and you can see the tRNA sequences change and then you can see a, a slightly different version of that enzyme. You have a lot of information already right there and that will help prioritize sort of the, new, the newest stuff that you wanna get at that then could be used as tools as well as understanding biology. Thank you. Julius, um, question from, from a committee member now. <laughs> um, thanks to the panel. This is a fascinating conversation. My question is about defining success of this project. Um, we heard about the human genome earlier where that project is almost defined by putting in order the 3 billion nucleotides of the genome, which is kind of a static, relatively speaking, piece of information. But RNA modifications are very dynamic. So how do we define success with that regard? I think um, Todd had a really uh, comment on this through his, you know, essentially defining success as being able to predict, but does the committee have other concepts of success in this regard? I mean, uh, I, I'd like to point out that um, in order to define success, I think it needs to be clear what the goals are. and and. I think there are so many different ways to which we could take this that it's just to me it's complete at the moment it's quite a vague and unclear concept what we're even hoping to do here so i mean going after a cross evolutionary kind of profiling i think is fascinating but it's one way of doing it and looking within compartments across cells it's a different way and going after disease related after disease related enzymes and being able to actually figure out where the disease is coming from and what the precise residues are that's the third thing. And for each of them, I think we can clearly define, we can define success criteria, right? We found the residue that's responsible for the disease and we can complement it. That would be one way of doing it. But it would be completely distinct from, you know, looking, surveying the epitranscriptomes across all species, you know, across a hundred different clades of archaea and defining them and exploring the variability. So, so honestly, I think there needs to be a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the goals here. For me, a main goal, as I said up front, would even be just to getting a clear picture, even of what's just what's happening in human, for example. I mean, going back to the question of what would be the cost of not having this? I, I've engaged in so many conversations and people in the field who are kind of trying to get an overview of the field and are getting lost in the literature, which points at so many different ways. So one goal would even just be having an agreed upon consensus of what actually is out there and what defines the rules and what are the rules that govern it? I think that would also be a goal, but would be very distinct. So, so, so I think before success, we need to think of goals. Well, I, I think it's, um, as was saluted by everybody, it shouldn't just be getting the map, but once we have the map, can we do something with it? Do we have the end RNA modifying enzymes or reader or writers or erasers to then go change the things that aren't right um, uh, for biotechnology or for health purposes? And so I think I think that's got to be um, up there too. But yeah, the the plan has to change depending on what the end goal is. I have a technical answer for success, what it would look like to me. To make examination, quality examination of RNA modifications be as routine as gene expression analysis by RNA sequencing. Because then the diversity of the research community could be studying this question as it relates to their problems. Currently, the investigation of RNA modifications is a pretty specialized undertaking done in a small, relatively small number of expert labs. And that limits the biological significance of discoveries we could make. Thanks, Judith. The next question is like Marcus, right? Yeah, Marcus Stoyer from uh, Nanopore. I was sort of, uh, one of the things I was hearkening to what Wendy was talking about with uh, how important the, the computational methods, and I would add statistical methods and hearken back to uh, in the last session, Mark was talking about how a 95% model was super amazing, but why would we apply it to the whole transcriptome when we need, a, I don't know how many nines he had in there, something like a Q60 model is the only thing that would make that useful, right? 
and we have, I think to those points is that one of the main goals could be that education of there's something you can do with a 60% accurate model. Like there are useful biological things that you can do with that model, but that doesn't mean you can go apply a 60% accuracy model to the whole genome and get something, right? The whole transcriptome and, and get something out of it. So I think one of the goals could be, uh, like you're saying, I, I think part of what Wendy was just saying, that there's, there's a, a training of what these, what methods and, and comparing them on a, a, a nanopore modification model to an enzymatic method and having a way that those can be comparable in some meaningful way, um, I think would be a super useful, I guess, sort of directed to Wendy seemed to be on that, on this train of thought, um, what your thoughts were along this line of, of having training be part of something that could be really important that could come out of this in a, in a systematic broad way. Sorry, you pitched me a question, but I don't know what the question is. It was more of a like, how can we make the training and the the systematic you know what is it, what what makes a model sixty percent accurate versus ninety nine percent accurate versus you know and how can that be a, a goal? How can we formalize that as a goal? Um. <laughs> I I have a a side comment on that. Nanopores are fantastic for training and getting undergrads excited about sequencing and especially with, and now with nanopore stuff, uh, DNA modifications as well as RNA modifications. And so I think the process of running through those experiments with nanopores, which are not perfect because nothing's perfect, um, I think that can be a really good uh, training module. And I know at UC Santa Cruz, there are a ton of undergrads that are doing nanopore work and they've really, uh, it's really driven a lot of learning in terms of how to handle that kind of complex data. So, so I, I, I think uh, your your question about what what's I think it'll depend on it, on on the situation, and maybe you know defining these standards. But um, but I think uh, having something that you can plug into your laptop and then do a sequencing run, I think that democratizes, and then that gets a lot of excitement about learning the math and the software that's necessary to get, you know, um, information, real information out of it. Thanks. I just wanna go back to that previous thing, which is, I mean, I think success has to at some point connect to function, which, you know, echoes what Wendy said in the beginning. And I don't have any idea how to set that up. How do you, how do you get huge deep data sets? And then you have to find something fun in there that, that, you, can, that you can poke at. But I think that should somehow be, you know, do you get a whole, you know, you get the whole thing and then you're like, well, now we have to do a time course and now we have to do a different organism. And now we have to do like, when do you stop and say, we have to assess whether we're learning enough? Yes, I had a question, I guess it's to Todd, but it's kind of to Wendy, because you both kind of, to me, touched on this and, and it, talking about viral sequences, right? So a lot of this is on the, we're going to look at the human epitranscriptome, don't use that term, right? Or, or Todd, you know, talking about comparative genomics, you know, with the human genome, we started with the genomic projects, we started sequencing viruses, and then bacteria, and then we then we went big, right? So is this really to the point where we're going to look epitranscriptome wide in the human? Or should we ratchet more down and focus, you know, on smaller organisms, viruses? Maybe. Viruses and RNA viruses are, are way, way complex. The way they fold, it's crazy. Um, and, and all the little bits of regulation that they evolve very rapidly, um, I think uh, they, they are hard. But I think for microbes, absolutely. Um, we're um, looking at the evolution of these enzymes. You learn so much about specificity. Um, and then when you see a new enzyme pop up, you're like, why? Is this due to placental development? We, we have a lot of new tRNA genes that popped up in vertebrates. And with that new modification patterns, why do we have two different versions of this uh, isoleucine tRNA? And, and so that's, I, I think that's where um, you, wanna, you wanna look where there's, there, there are big sort of jumps in, and you can say, well, um, what, what's changed about their biology or their environments or their, their needs. So, so I, I think connecting it constantly to the biology is, is a requirement. And, and that, sh that should be an assessment made after every survey of raw data. What does this tell us? Is this a, now a regulated mo modification or is it not really, really regulated? It just sort of comes and goes 
Um, and so that's, I, so I would say that that's the job from the beginning to connect it as much as possible. We have run out of time, but many can have the last question. Okay, so uh, just uh, to tie things up with what Wendy said, Wendy one said something and then Wendy two said something else. Wendy one said uh, about function, uh, <laughs> I, I'm referring to the same Wendy, but uh, <laughs> uh, initially the 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 point that you made, Wendy, was about uh, you know linking the RNA mods to function, and I think that that is a much bigger problem than your second point, which was to define a very quantitative technical milestone of success, which is can we actually map these damn things, right? Like, can we actually get all RNA modifications mapped and and have it be as easy as you know a sequencing experiment? And I like I like that definition because it's a lot more manageable, I think, to to have that technical milestone, to have the technical uh, goal, because, because when you talk about function, you're also talking about the proteome, you're also talking about you know, modifications on the protein, you're talking about the chemical environment, metabolites, you're talking about so many other things that are, you know, just, it's an endless uh, pit, I think. Uh, so that's, so that kind of um, also touches upon your point. So that was kind of my question slash comment. And with that, thank you so much to everyone for participating and keeping awake and all that jazz. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye, everybody. See ya. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, I guess I can do the honors of uh, passing it off to Nicole for some final remarks uh, before we end the day. All right, so now I have the very difficult task of somehow synthesizing all of this information and providing a little bit of a summary of what we discussed today. Um, we started with a review of the NIH workshop that was interested in some of the same aspects that we've discussed today. What are the technological uh, challenges that we need to overcome? Samples and standards that we would need to achieve a project to sequence uh, RNA, RNA isoforms and RNA transcripts end to end with modifications the workforce and infrastructure needs that we will need, such as computational pipelines, experimental pipelines, uh, standardized procedures and quality control. One thing that I saw emerging is what aspects of modifications should we focus on? And we heard from Kristen about why we should care, why are we interested in RNA modifications? And one reason, which is I think why a lot of us are interested in this, is because these modifications have the potential to impact any stage of the mRNA life cycle to impact uh, function in cells. But we have to think about how we are going to convince uh, people outside this room, like the public and funding agencies, about the significance and what we might learn from this project. And this includes connecting these writers, readers, erasers to human disease. Uh, we also talked about different organisms and what we might learn from modification in different contexts and regulation of these modifications in different conditions and how that might control gene regulation. So these are all possible focuses of a project on mapping RNA modifications. Uh, sorry. Okay. We talked about technologies, um, and two that we heard about today were mass spec and nanopore sequencing, both of which can tell you about direct uh, levels of RNA modifications. And we heard how mass spec can tell you about quantification and stoichiometry, composition, or even the existence of RNA modifications, while nanopore methods can tell you about the locations of RNA modifications. And we, a theme that we saw is that really the use of these orthogonal approaches 
is the likely path forward where you can get both validation by different methods, as well as complementary information from these approaches. And, uh, you know, there's hope for improved development, for example, getting mass specs so that we can do sequencing of RNAs by mass spec. We heard in terms of nanopore technology, how engineering the nanopores could lead us to better detection of modified bases and how development of the computational and analysis pipelines such as machine learning and algorithms to interpret the data and learn how to call modified bases will be a challenge and a path forward. And in order to do that, we really need the standards that we can use to validate these different uh, modifications and establish benchmarks for all of the methods that we've been hearing about today. So how do we get these standards with known amounts of RNA modifications in a variety of sequence contexts? And how do we distribute that so that the community can use these to benchmark and validate different approaches? Um, and we heard about some of the challenges related to making those standards, including the costs, motivation to make new modified nucleotides, um, of whether there is a biological uh, interest in, in, in doing that and pushing that forward, as well in the cost in characterizing such standards. Uh, we learned about the need to standardize approaches and standardize experimental and computational pipelines. And we learned some of these lessons from the ENCODE project, as well as quality control for the data that is generated from a project that involves mapping the, the, the full uh, spectrum of RNA modifications and full length RNAs. And um, you know that this is a project that will likely involve partnership between academia, industry to help develop the technology, as well as funding and governmental agencies to support the development of these projects. And we can learn some lessons from the Human Genome Project that had a lot of parallels to this project and many successes. And But we have to think that this is a more uh, complex problem in the sense that it won't be one sequence, it'll be many sequences in many different contexts. And we will likely need a variety of different approaches to, to achieve a project like this. And then finally, I'll touch on a little bit of the few last points that were brought up. And that is, you know, one establishing short-term versus long-term go goals. How are we gonna pick what to prioritize? You know, which modifications should we focus on ones that are more abundant? Should we focus on ones that have more likely functional impact in biology or ones that we have better tools to understand now? Uh, we should be thinking about biology and the function in terms of this project. And again, we can think about regulation, we can think about different model organisms, we can think about um, you know, a, a whole number of contexts that would be interesting to study, but we need to pick one moving forward to make most progress on and perhaps think about ways to expanding to other ones. Um, and, and finally, I'll say that the, the last thing is to define what success will look like and decide on goals and milestones that we can uh, be achieving and looking out for whether the project is being successful. Uh, okay, so with that, I think I touched on what I found to be the most major themes, and we're really excited to continue the discussion on, on what the future looks like for this project.